Section 62 of The Man Who Loves by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maxim Babich from Desnogorsk. The Man Who Loves by Victor Hugo. Part 2. Book the Third. The Beginning of the Fisher. Chapter 4. Contraries Fraternize in Hate Success is hateful, especially to those whom it overthrows. It is rare that the eaten adore the eaters. The laughing man had decidedly made a hit. The mountebanks around were indignant. A theatrical success is a siphon. It pumps in the crowd and creates emptiness all round. The shop opposite is done for. The increased receipts of the green box cause the corresponding decrease in the receipts of the surrounding shows. Those entertainments, popular up to that time, suddenly collapsed. It was like a low water mark, showing inversely but in perfect concordance the rise here, the fall there. Theatres experience the effect of tides. They rise in one only on condition of falling in another. The swarming foreigners who exhibited their talents and their trumpetings on the neighboring platforms, seeing themselves ruined by the laughing men, were despairing, yet dazzled. All the grimacers, all the clowns, all the merry andrews envied Gwynplaine. How happy he must be! with the snout of a wild beast. The buffoon mothers and dancers on the tight rope with pretty children looked at them in anger and pointing out Gwynplaine would say, oh, What a pity you have not a face like that! Some beat their babes savagely for being pretty. More than one, had she known the secret, would have fashioned her son's face in the Gwynplaine style. The head of an angel which brings no money in is not as good as that of a lucrative devil. One day the mother of a little child who was a marvel of beauty, and who acted a cupid, exclaimed, Our children are failures! They only succeeded with Gwynplaine! And shaking her fists at her son, she added, If I only knew your father, wouldn't he catch it? Gwynplaine was the goose with the golden eggs. What a marvelous phenomenon! There was an uproar through all the caravans. The mountebanks, enthusiastic and exasperated, looked at Gwynplaine and gnashed their teeth. Admiring anger is called envy. Then it howls. They tried to disturb chaos vanquished, made a cabal, hissed, scolded, shouted. This was an excuse for Ursus to make out-of-door harangues to the populace and for his friend Tom Jim Jack, to use his fists to re-establish order. His pugilistic marks of friendship brought him still more under the notice and regard of Ursus and Gwynplaine. At a distance, however, for the group in the green box sufficed to themselves, and held aloof from the rest of the world, and because Tom Jim Jack, this leader of the mob, seemed a sort of supreme bully, without a tie, without a friend, a smasher of windows, a manager of men, now here, now gone, hail fellow well met with every one, companion of none. This raging envy against Gwynplaine did not give in for a few friendly hits from Tom Jim Jack. The outcries having miscarried, the mountebanks of Tarinzo Field fell back on a petition. They addressed to the authorities, this is the usual course. Against an unpleasant success, we first try to stir up the crowd, and then we petition the magistrate. With the Merry Andrews, the reverends allied themselves. The laughing men had inflicted a blow on the preachers. There were empty places not only in the caravans, but in the churches. The congregations in the churches of the five parishes in Southwark had dwindled away. People left before the sermon to go to Gwynplaine. Chaos vanquished, the green box, the laughing man, all the abominations of Baal, 
eclipsed the eloquence of the pulpit. The voice crying in the desert, Vox clamantis in deserto, is discontented, and is prone to call for the aid of the authorities. The clergy of the five parishes complained to the Bishop of London, who complained to Her Majesty. The complaint of the Mary Andrews was based on religion. They declared it to be insulted. They described Gwynplaine as a sorcerer, and Ursus as an atheist. The reverend gentleman invoked social order. Setting orthodoxy aside, they took action on the fact that acts of parliament were violated. It was clever, because it was the period of Mr. Locke, who had died but six months previously, 28th October, 1704, and when skepticism, which Bolingbroke had imbibed from Voltaire, was taking root. Later on, Wesley came and restored the Bible as Loyola restored the papacy. Thus the green box was battered on both sides, by the Mary Andrews, in the name of the Pentateuch, and by chaplains, in the name of the police, in the name of heaven, and of the inspectors of nuisances. The green box was denounced by the priests as an obstruction, and by the jugglers as sacrilegious. Had they any pretext? Was there any excuse? Yes. What was the crime? This. There was the wolf. A dog was allowable. A wolf forbidden. In England the wolf is an outlaw. England admits the dog which barks, but not the dog which howls. A shade of difference between the yard and the woods. The rectors and vicars of the five parishes of Southwark called attention in their petitions to numerous parliamentary and royal statutes, putting the wolf beyond the protection of the law. They moved for something like the imprisonment of Gwynplaine and the execution of the wolf, or, at any rate, for their banishment. The question was one of public importance, the danger to persons passing, etc. And on this point they appealed to the faculty. They cited the opinion of the eighty physicians of London, a learned body, which dates from Henry the Eighth, which has a seal like that of the state, which can raise sick people to the dignity of being amenable to their jurisdiction, which has the right to imprison those who infringe its law and contravene its ordinances, and which, amongst other useful regulations for the health of the citizens, put beyond doubt this fact acquired by science, that if a wolf sees a man first, the man becomes hoarse for life. Besides, he may be beaten. Homo, then, was a pretext. Ursus heard of these designs through the innkeeper. He was uneasy. He was afraid of two clothes, the police and the justices. To be afraid of the magistracy, it is sufficient to be afraid. There is no need to be guilty. Ursus had no desire for contact with sheriffs, provosts, bailiffs, and coroners. His eagerness to make their acquaintance amounted to nil. His curiosity to see the magistrates was about as great as the hares to see the greyhound. He began to regret that he had come to London. Better is the enemy of good, murmured he apart. I thought the proverb was ill-considered. I was wrong. Stupid truths are true truths. Against the coalition of powers, Mary Andrews taking in hand the cause of religion, and chaplains indignant in the name of medicine, the poor green box suspected of sorcery in Gwynplaine and of hydrophobia in Homo had only one thing in its favor, but a thing of great power in England, municipal inactivity. It is to the local authorities letting things take their own course that Englishmen owe their liberty. Liberty in England behaves very much as the sea around England. It is a tide. Little by little, manners surmount the law. A cruel system of legislation drowned under the wave of custom. A savage code of laws still visible through the transparency of universal liberty. Such is England. The laughing man, chaos vanquished and homo, 
might have mountebanks, preachers, bishops, the House of Commons, the House of Lords, Her Majesty, London, and the whole of England against them, and remain undisturbed so long as Southwark permitted. The green box was the favorite amusement of the suburb, and the local authorities seemed disinclined to interfere. In England, indifference is protection, so long as the sheriff of the county of Surrey, to the jurisdiction of which Southwark belongs, did not move in the matter. Ursus breathed freely, and Homo could sleep on his wolf's ears. So long as the hatred which it excited did not occasion acts of violence, it increased success. The green box was none the worse for it, for the time. On the contrary, hints were scattered that it contained something mysterious. Hence the laughing man became more and more popular. The public follow with gusto the scent of anything contraband. To be suspected is a recommendation. The people adopt by instinct that at which the finger is pointed. The thing which is denounced is like the savor of forbidden fruit. We rush to eat it. Besides, applause, which irritates someone, especially if that someone is in authority, is sweet. To perform, whilst passing a pleasant evening, both an act of kindness to the oppressed and of opposition to the oppressor, is agreeable. You are protecting at the same time that you are being amused. So the theatrical caravans on the bowling green continued to howl and took a ball against the laughing man. Nothing could be better calculated to enhance his success. The shouts of one's enemies are useful and give point and vitality to one's triumph. A friend wearies sooner in praise than an enemy in abuse. To abuse does not hurt. Enemies are ignorant of this fact. They cannot help insulting us. And this constitutes their use. They cannot hold their tongues and thus keep the public awake. The crowds which flocked to Chaos Vanquished increased daily. Ursus kept what Master Nichols had said of intriguers and complaints in high places to himself, and did not tell Gwynplaine, lest it should trouble the ease of his acting, by creating anxiety. If evil was to come, he would be sure to know it soon enough. End of section 62《Section 63 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo》Part 2 Book the Third, Chapter 5 The Weapon Take Once, however, he thought it his duty to derogate from this prudence, for prudence' sake, thinking that it might be well to make Gwynplaine uneasy. It is true that this idea arose from a circumstance much graver in the opinion of Ursus than the cabals of the fair or of the church. Gwynplaine, as he picked up a farthing which had fallen when counting the receipts, had, in the presence of the innkeeper, drawn a contrast between the farthing representing the misery of the people and the die representing under the figure of Anne the parasitical magnificence of the throne, an ill-sounding speech. This observation was repeated by Master Nicholas, and had such a run that it reached to Ursus through Phoebe and Venus. It put Ursus into a fever, seditious words, les majesty. He took Gwynplaine severely to task. Watch over your abominable jaws, there is a rule for the great to do nothing, and a rule for the small to say nothing. The poor man has but one friend, silence. He should only pronounce one syllable, yes. To confess and to consent is all the right he has. Yes to the judge, yes to the king. Great people, if it pleases them to do so, beat us. I have received blows from them, it is their prerogative, and they lose nothing of their greatness by breaking our bones. The ossifrage is a species of eagle. Let us venerate the sceptre, which is the first of staves. Respect is prudence, and mediocrity is safety. 
To insult the king is to put oneself in the same danger as a girl rashly paring the nails of a lion. They tell me that you have been prattling about the farthing, which is the same thing as the liard, and that you have found fault with the august medallion, for which they sell us at market the eighth part of a salt herring. Take care. Let us be serious. Consider the existence of pains and penalties. Suck in these legislative truths. You are in a country in which the man who cuts down a tree three years old is quietly taken off to the gallows. As to swearers, their feet are put into the stocks. The drunkard is shut up in a barrel with the bottom out, so that he can walk with a hole in the top through which his head is passed, and with two in the bung for his hands, so that he cannot lie down. He who strikes another one in Westminster Hall is imprisoned for life and has his goods confiscated. Whoever strikes any one in the king's palace has his hands struck off. A fillip on the nose chances to bleed, and behold, you are maimed for life. He who is convicted of heresy in the bishop's court is burnt alive. It was for no great matter that Cuthbert Simpson was quartered on a turnstile. Three years since, in 1702, which is not long ago, you see, they placed in the pillory a scoundrel called Daniel Defoe, who had had the audacity to print the names of the members of Parliament who had spoken on the previous evening. He who commits high treason is disemboweled alive, and they tear out his heart and buffet his cheeks with it. Impress on yourself notions of right and justice. Never allow yourself to speak a word and at the first cause of anxiety run for it. Such is the bravery which I counsel and which I practice. In the way of temerity, imitate the birds. In the way of talking, imitate the fishes. England has one admirable point in her favour, that her legislation is very mild. His admonition over, Ursus remained uneasy for some time. Gwynplaine not at all. The intrepidity of youth arises from want of experience. However, it seemed that Gwynplaine had good reason for his easy mind, for the weeks flowed on peacefully, and no bad consequences seemed to have resulted from his observations about the Queen. Ursus, we know, lacked apathy, and, like a roebuck on the watch, kept a lookout in every direction. One day, a short time after his sermon to Gwynplaine, as he was looking out from the window in the wall which commanded the field, he became suddenly pale. Gwynplaine! What? Look! Where? In the field. Well? Do you see that passer-by? The man in black? Yes. Who has a kind of mace in his hand? Yes. Well? Well, Gwynplaine, that man is a weapon-take. What is a weapon take? He is the bailiff of the hundred. What is the bailiff of the hundred? He is the proposito sandredi. And what is the proposito sandredi? He is a terrible officer. What has he got in his hand? The iron weapon. What is the iron weapon? A thing made of iron. What does he do with that? First of all, he swears upon it. It is for that reason that he is called the weapon-take. And then? And then he touches you with it. With what? With the iron weapon. The weapon-take touches you with the iron weapon? Yes. What does that mean? That means follow me. And must you follow? Yes. Whither? How should I know? But he tells you where he is going to take you. No. How is that? He says nothing, and you say nothing. But he touches you with the iron weapon. All is over, then. You must go. But where? After him. But where? Wherever he likes, Gwynplaine. And if you resist, you are hanged. Ursus looked out of the window again, and drawing a long breath, said, Thank God he has passed. He was not coming here. Ursus was perhaps unreasonably alarmed about the indiscreet remark, and the consequences likely to result from the unconsidered words of Gwynplaine. 
Master Nicholas, who had heard them, had no interest in compromising the poor inhabitants of the green box. He was amassing at the same time as the laughing man a nice little fortune. Chaos vanquished had succeeded in two ways. While it made art triumph on the stage, it made drunkenness prosper in the tavern. End of section 63 Recording by John Trevethick Section 64 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Part 2. Book the Third. Chapter 6. The Mouse Examined by the Cats. Ursus was soon afterwards startled by another alarming circumstance. This time it was he himself who was concerned. He was summoned to Bishopsgate before a commission composed of three disagreeable countenances. They belonged to three doctors, called overseers. One was a doctor of theology, delegated by the Dean of Westminster. Another, a doctor of medicine, delegated by the College of Surgeons. The third, a doctor in history and civil law, delegated by Gresham College. These three experts, in omni re scibili, had the censorship of everything said in public throughout the bounds of the hundred and thirty parishes of London, the seventy-three of Middlesex, and by extension, the five of Southwick. Such theological jurisdictions still subsist in England, and do good service. In December 1868, by sentence of the Court of Arches, confirmed by the decision of the Privy Council, the Reverend McConachy was censured, besides being condemned in costs, for having placed lighted candles on a table. The liturgy allows no jokes. Ursus, then, one fine day, received from the delegated doctors an order to appear before them, which was, luckily, given into his own hands, and which he was therefore enabled to keep secret. Without saying a word, he obeyed the citation, shuddering at the thought that he might be considered culpable to the extent of having the appearance of being suspected of a certain amount of rashness. He who had so recommended silence to others had here a rough lesson. Garule sana te ipsum. The three doctors, delegated and appointed overseers, sat at Bishopsgate, at the end of a room on the ground floor, in three armchairs covered with black leather, with three busts of Minos, Aeacus, and Radamanthus in the wall above their heads, a table before them, and at their feet a form for the accused. Ursus, introduced by a tip-staff of placid but severe expression, entered, perceived the doctors, and immediately in his own mind gave to each of them the name of the judge of the infernal regions represented by the bust placed above his head. Minos, the president, the representative of theology, made him a sign to sit down on the form. Ursus made a proper bow, that is to say, bowed to the ground, and knowing that bears are charmed by honey and doctors by Latin, he said, keeping his body still bent respectfully, Tres faciunt capitulum. Then with head inclined, for modesty disarms, he sat down on the form. Each of the three doctors had before him a bundle of papers, of which he was turning the leaves. Minos began. You speak in public? Yes, replied Ursus. By what right? I am a philosopher. That gives no right. I am also a mountebank, said Ursus. That is a different thing. Ursus breathed again, but with humility. Minos resumed. As a mountebank you may speak, as a philosopher you must keep silence. I will try, said Ursus, and he thought to himself, I may speak, but I must be silent. How complicated! He was much alarmed. The same overseer continued, You say things which do not sound right. You insult religion. You deny the most evident truths. You propagate revolting errors. For instance, you have said that the fact of virginity excludes the possibility of maternity. Ursus lifted his eyes meekly. I did not say that. I said that the fact of maternity excludes the possibility of virginity. 
Minus was thoughtful and mumbled, True, that is the contrary. It was really the same thing. But Ursus had parried the first blow. Minos, meditating on the answer just given by Ursus, sank into the depths of his own imbecility and kept silent. The overseer of history, or, as Ursus called him, Radamanthus, covered the retreat of Minos by this interpolation, accused, your audacity and your errors are of two sorts. You have denied that the battle of Parsalia would have been lost because Brutus and Cassius had met a negro. I said, murmured Ursus, that there was something in the fact that Caesar was the better captain. The man of history passed without transition to mythology. You have excused the infamous acts of Actaeon. I think, said Ursus insinuatingly, that a man is not dishonoured by having seen a naked woman. Then you are wrong, said the judge severely. Radamanthus returned to history. A propos of the accidents which happened to the cavalry of Mithridates, you have contested the virtues of herbs and plants. You have denied that a herb like the secular duca could make the shoes of horses fall off. Pardon me, replied Ursus. I said that the power existed only in the herb Sphera Cavallo. I never denied the virtue of any herb. And he added in a low voice, nor of any woman. By this extraneous addition to his answer, Ursus proved to himself that, anxious as he was, he was not disheartened. Ursus was a compound of terror and presence of mind. To continue, resumed Radamanthus, you have declared that it was folly in Scipio, when he wished to open the gates of Carthage, to use as a key the herb Ethiopis, because the herb Ethiopis has not the property of breaking locks. I merely said that he would have done better to have used the herb Lunaria. That is a matter of opinion, murmured Radamanthus, touched in his turn, and the man of history was silent. The theologian, Minus, having returned to consciousness, questioned Ursus anew. He had had time to consult his notes. You have classed orpiment amongst the products of arsenic, and you have said that it is a poison. The Bible denies this. The Bible denies, but arsenic affirms it, sighed Ursus. The man whom Ursus called Aeacus, and who was the envy of medicine, had not yet spoken, but now, looking down on Ursus with proudly half-closed eyes, he said, The answer is not without some show of reason. Ursus thanked him with his most cringing smile. Minos frowned frightfully. I resume, said Minos. You have said that it is false that the basilisk is the king of serpents under the name of cockatrice. Very reverend sir, said Ursus, so little did I desire to insult the basilisk that I have given out as certain that it has a man's head. Be it so, replied Minos severely, but you added that Poerius had seen one with the head of a falcon. Can you prove it? Not easily, said Ursus. Here he had lost a little ground. Minos, seizing the advantage, pushed it. You have said that a converted Jew has not a nice smell. Yes, but I added that a Christian who becomes a Jew has a nasty one. Minos lost his eyes over the accusing documents. You have affirmed and propagated things which are impossible. You have said that Elian has seen an elephant write sentences. Nay, very reverend gentlemen, I simply said that Opian had heard a hippopotamus discuss a philosophical problem. You have declared that it is not true that a dish made of beechwood will become covered of itself with all the viands that one can desire. I said that if it has this virtue, it must be that you received it from the devil. But I received it? No, most reverend sir, I, nobody, everybody. Aside, Ursus thought, I don't know what I'm saying. But his outward confusion, though extreme, was not distinctly visible. Ursus struggled with it. All this, Minus began again, implies a certain belief in the devil. Ursus held his own. Very reverend, sir, I am not an unbeliever with regard to the devil. Belief in the devil is the reverse side of faith in God. The one proves the other. He who does not believe a little in the devil does not believe much in God. He who believes in the sun must believe in the shadow. The devil is the night of God. What is night? The proof of day. 
Ursus here extemporized a fathomless combination of philosophy and religion. Minos remained pensive and relapsed into silence. Ursus breathed afresh. A sharp onslaught now took place. Aeacus, the medical delegate, who had disdainfully protected Ursus against the theologian, now turned suddenly from auxiliary into assailant. He placed his closed fist on his bundle of papers, which was large and heavy. Ursus received this apostrophe full in the breast. It is proved that crystal is sublimated ice, and that the diamond is sublimated crystal. It is averred that ice becomes crystal in a thousand years, and crystal diamond in a thousand ages. You have denied this. Nay, replied Ursus with sadness, I only say that in a thousand years ice had time to melt, and that a thousand ages were difficult to count. The examination went on. Questions and answers clashed like swords. You have denied that plants can talk. Not at all, but to do so they must grow under a gibbet. Do you own that the Madragora cries? No, but it sings. You have denied that the fourth finger of the left hand has a cordial virtue. I only said that to sneeze to the left was a bad sign. You have spoken rashly and disrespectfully of the phoenix. Learned judge, I merely said that when he wrote that the brain of the phoenix was a delicate morsel, but that it produced a headache, Plutarch was a little out of his reckoning inasmuch as the phoenix never existed. A detestable speech, the cinnamorca which makes its nest with sticks of cinnamon, the rindicus that parasitus use in the manufacture of his poisons, the manucodiasus, which is the bird of paradise, and the semenda, which has a threefold beak, have been mistaken for the phoenix, but the phoenix has existed. I do not deny it. You are a stupid ass. I desire to be thought no better. You have confessed that the elder tree cures the quinsy, but you added that it was not because it has in its root a fairy excrescence. I said it was because Judas hung himself on an elder tree. A plausible opinion, growled the theologian, glad to strike his little blow at Aeacus. Arrogance repulsed soon turns to anger. Aeacus was enraged. Wandering mountebank, you wander as much in mind as with your feet. Your tendencies are out of the way and suspicious. You approach the bounds of sorcery. You have dealings with unknown animals. You speak to the populace of things that exist but for you alone, and the nature of which is unknown, such as the hemorrhous. The hemorrhous is a viper which was seen by Tremelius. This repartee produced a certain disorder in the irritated science of Dr. Aeacus. Ursus added, The existence of the hemorrhous is quite as true as that of the odoriferous hyena, and of the civet described by Castellus. Aeacus got out of the difficulty by charging home. Here are your own words, and very diabolical words they are. Listen. With his eyes on his notes, Aeacus read, Two plants, the thalassigal and the aglaphotis, are luminous in the evening, flowers by day, stars by night. And looking steadily at Ursus, what have you to say to that? Ursus answered, Every plant is a lamp, its perfume is its light. Aeacus turned over other pages. You have denied that the vesicles of the otter are equivalent to castorium. I merely said that perhaps it may be necessary to receive the teaching of Aetius on this point with some reserve. Aeacus became furious. You practice medicine? I practice medicine, sighed Ursus timidly. On living things? Rather than on dead ones, said Ursus. Ursus defended himself stoutly but dully, an admirable mixture in which meekness predominated. He spoke with such gentleness that Dr. Aeacus felt that he must insult him. "'What are you murmuring there?' said he rudely. Ursus was amazed, and restricted himself to saying, "'Murmurings are for the young, and moans for the aged. Alas, I moan!' Aeacus replied, "'Be assured of this. If you attend a sick person, and he dies, you will be punished by death.' Ursus hazarded a question. "'And if he gets well?' In that case, said the doctor, softening his voice, you will be punished by death. There is little difference, said Ursus. The doctor replied, 
If death ensues, we punish gross ignorance. If recovery, we punish presumption. The gibbet in either case. I was ignorant of the circumstances, murmured Ursus. I thank you for teaching me. One does not know all the beauties of the law. Take care of yourself. Religiously, said Ursus. We know what you are about. As for me, thought Ursus, that is more than I always know myself. We could send you to prison. I see that perfectly, gentlemen. You cannot deny your infractions nor your encroachments. My philosophy asks pardon. Great audacity has been attributed to you. That is quite a mistake. It is said that you have cured the sick. I am the victim of calumny. The three pairs of eyebrows which were so horribly fixed on Ursus contracted. The three wise faces drew near to each other and whispered. Ursus had the vision of a vague fool's cap sketched out above those three empowered heads. The low and requisite whispering of the trio was of some minutes' duration, during which time Ursus felt all the ice and all the scorch of agony. At length Minos, who was president, turned to him and said angrily, "'Go away!' Ursus felt something like Jonas when he was leaving the belly of the whale. Minos continued, "'You are discharged!' Ursus said to himself, "'They won't catch me at this again. Good-bye, medicine!' And he added in his innermost heart, "'From henceforth I will carefully allow them to die.' Bent double, he bowed everywhere, to the doctors, to the busts, the tables, the walls, and retiring backwards through the door, disappeared almost as a shadow, melting into air. He left the hall slowly, like an innocent man, and rushed from the street rapidly, like a guilty one. The officers of justice are so singular and obscure in their ways, that even when acquitted, one flies from them. As he fled, he mumbled, I am well out of it. I am the savant untamed, they the savant civilized. Doctors cavil at the learned, false science is the excrement of the true, and is employed to the destruction of philosophers. Philosophers, as they produce sophists, produce their own scourge. Of the dung of the thrush is born the mistletoe, with which is made bird lime, with which the thrush is captured. Turdus sibi malum cacat. We do not represent Ursus as a refined man. He was imprudent enough to use words which expressed his thoughts. He had no more taste than Voltaire. When Ursus returned to the green box, he told Master Nicholas that he had been delayed by following a pretty woman, and let not a word escape him concerning his adventure. Except in the evening, when he said in a low voice to Homo, See here. I have vanquished the three heads of Serbius. End of section sixty four. Recording by John Trevithick. Section sixty five of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo Part Two, Book the Third, Chapter Seven Why Should a Gold Piece Lower Itself by Mixing with a Heap of Pennies? An event happened. The Tadcaster Inn became more and more a furnace of joy and laughter. Never was there more resonant gaiety. The landlord and his boy were become insufficient to draw the ale, stout, and porter. In the evening in the lower room with its windows all aglow, there was not a vacant table. They sang, they shouted. The great old hearth, vaulted like an oven, with its iron bars piled with coals, shone out brightly. It was like a house of fire and noise. In the yard, that is to say in the theatre, the crowd was greater still. Crowds as great as the suburb of Southwick could supply so thronged the performances of Chaos Vanquished that directly the curtain was raised, that is to say, the platform of the green box was lowered, every place was filled. The windows were alive with spectators, the balcony was crammed. Not a single paving stone in the paved yard was to be seen. It seemed paved with faces. Only the compartment for the nobility remained empty. 
There was thus a space in the centre of the balcony, a black hole called in metaphorical slang an oven. No one there. Crowds everywhere except in that one spot. One evening it was occupied. It was on a Saturday, a day on which the English make all haste to amuse themselves before the ennui of Sunday. The hall was full. We say hall. Shakespeare for a long time had to use the yard of an inn for a theatre, and he called it hall. Just as the curtain rose on the prologue of Chaos Vanquished, with Ursus, Homo, and Gwynplaine on the stage, Ursus from Habit cast a look at the audience and felt a sensation. The compartment for the nobility was occupied. A lady was sitting alone in the middle of the box, on the Utrecht velvet armchair. She was alone, and she filled the box. Certain beings seemed to give out light. This lady, like Dea, had a light in herself, but a light of a different character. Dea was pale, this lady was pink. Dea was the twilight, this lady aurora. Dea was beautiful, this lady was superb. Dea was innocence, candor, fairness, alabaster. This woman was of the purple and one felt that she did not fear the blush. Her irradiation overflowed the box. She sat in the midst of it, immovable, in the spreading majesty of an idol. Amidst the sordid crowd she shone out grandly, as with the radiance of a carbuncle. She inundated it with so much light that she drowned it in a shadow, and all the mean faces in it underwent eclipse. Her splendor blotted out all else. Every eye was turned towards her. Tom Jim Jack was in the crowd. He was lost like the rest in the nimbus of this dazzling creature. The lady at first absorbed the whole attention of the public, who had crowded to the performance, thus somewhat diminishing the opening effects of Chaos Vanquished. Whatever might be the air of Dreamland about her, for those who were near, she was a woman, perchance too much a woman. She was tall and amply formed, and showed as much as possible of her magnificent person. She wore heavy earrings of pearls, with which were mixed those whimsical jewels called Keys of England. Her upper dress was of Indian muslin, embroidered all over with gold, a great luxury, because those muslin dresses then cost six hundred crowns. A large diamond brooch closed her chemise the which she wore so as to display her shoulders and bosom in the immodest fashion of the time. The chemisette was made of that lawn of which Anne of Austria had sheets so fine that they could be passed through a ring. She wore what seemed like a cuirass of rubies, some uncut but polished, and precious stones were sewn all over the body of her dress. Then her eyebrows were blackened with Indian ink and her arms, elbows, shoulders, chin, and nostrils, with the top of her eyelids, the lobes of her ears, the palms of her hands, the tips of her fingers, were tinted with a glowing and provoking touch of colour. Above all, she wore an expression of implacable determination to be beautiful. This reached the point of ferocity. She was like a panther with the power of turning cat at will and caressing. One of her eyes was blue the other black. Gwynplaine, as well as Ursus, contemplated her. The green box somewhat resembled a phantasmagoria in its representations. Chaos Vanquished was rather a dream than a piece. It generally produced on the audience the effect of a vision. Now this effect was reflected on the actors. The house took the performers by surprise, and they were thunderstruck in their turn. It was a rebound of fascination. The woman watched them, and they watched her. At the distance at which they were placed, and in that luminous mist which is the half-light of a theatre, details were lost, and it was like a hallucination. Of course it was a woman, but was it not a shimmerer as well? The penetration of her light into their obscurity stupefied them. It was like the appearance of an unknown planet. It came from a world of the happy. Her irradiation amplified her figure. The lady was covered with nocturnal glitterings like a milky way. Her precious stones were stars. The diamond brooch was perhaps a pleiad. The splendid beauty of her bosom seemed supernatural. 
They felt, as they looked upon the star-like creature, the momentary but thrilling approach of the regions of felicity. It was out of the heights of a paradise that she leaned towards their mean-looking green box, and revealed to the gaze of its wretched audience her expression of inexorable serenity. As she satisfied her unbounded curiosity, she fed at the same time the curiosity of the public. It was the zenith permitting the abyss to look at it. Ursus, Gwynplaine, Venus, Phoebe, the crowd, every one had succumbed to her dazzling beauty, except Dea, ignorant in her darkness. An apparition was indeed before them, but none of the ideas usually evoked by the word were realized in the lady's appearance. There was nothing about her diaphanous, nothing undecided, nothing floating, no mist. She was an apparition, rose-coloured and fresh, and full of health. Yet, under the optical condition in which Ursus and Gwynplaine were placed, she looked like a vision. There are fleshy phantoms called vampires. Such a queen as she, though a spirit to the crowd, consumes twelve hundred thousand a year to keep her health. Behind the lady in the shadow her page was to be perceived, El Mozo, a little childlike man, fair and pretty, with a serious face. A very young and very grave servant was the fashion at that period. This page was dressed from top to toe in scarlet velvet, and had on his skull-cap, which was embroidered with gold, a bunch of curled feathers. This was the sign of a high class of service, and indicated attendance on a very great lady. The lackey is part of the lord, and it was impossible not to remark in the shadow of his mistress the train-bearing page. Memory often takes notes unconsciously, and, without Gwynplaine suspecting it, the round cheeks, the serious mien, the embroidered and plumed cap of the lady's page left some trace on his mind. The page, however, did nothing to call attention to himself. To do so was to be wanting in respect. He held himself aloof and passive at the back of the box, retiring as far as the closed door permitted. Notwithstanding the presence of her train-bearer, the lady was not the less alone in the compartment, since a valet counts for nothing. However powerful a diversion had been produced by this person, who produced the effect of a personage, the denouement of Chaos Vanquished was more powerful still. The impression which it made was, as usual, irresistible. Perhaps even there occurred in the hall, on account of the radiant spectator, for sometimes the spectator is part of the spectacle, an increase of electricity. The contagion of Gwynplaine's laugh was more triumphant than ever. The whole audience fell into an indescribable epilepsy of hilarity, through which could be distinguished the sonorous and magisterial HA-HA of Tom Jim Jack. Only the unknown lady looked at the performance with the immobility of a statue, and with her eyes, like those of a phantom, she laughed not. A spectre, but sun-born. The performance over, the platform drawn up, and the family reassembled in the green box, Ursus opened and emptied on the supper-table the bag of receipts. From a heap of pennies there slid suddenly forth a Spanish gold onza. Hers! cried Ursus. The onza, amidst the pence covered with verdigris, was a type of the lady amidst the crowd. She has paid an onza for her seat, cried Ursus with enthusiasm. Just then the hotel-keeper entered the green box, and, passing his arm out of the window at the back of it, opened the loophole in the wall of which we have already spoken, which gave a view over the field, and which was level with the window. Then he made a silent sign to Ursus to look out. A carriage, swarming with plumed footmen carrying torches and magnificently appointed, was driving off at a fast trot. Ursus took the piece of gold between his forefinger and thumb respectfully, and showing it to Master Nicholas, said, She is a goddess. Then his eyes falling on the carriage which was about to turn the corner of the field, and on the imperial, of which the footmen's torches lighted up a gold coronet with eight strawberry leaves, he exclaimed, She is more. She is a duchess. The carriage disappeared. The rumbling of its wheels died away in the distance. 
Ursus remained some moments in an ecstasy, holding the gold piece between his finger and thumb as in a monstrance, elevating it as the priest elevates the host. Then he placed it on the table, and, as he contemplated it, began to talk of madam. The innkeeper replied, She was a duchess. Yes, they knew her title. But her name? Of that they were ignorant. Master Nicholas had been close to the carriage, and seen the coat of arms and the footmen covered with lace. The coachman had a wig on which might have belonged to a Lord Chancellor. The carriage was of that rare design called in Spain Coche Tumbone, a splendid build with a top like a tomb, which makes a magnificent support for a coronet. The page was a man in miniature, so small that he could sit on the step of the carriage outside the door. The duty of those pretty creatures was to bear the train of their mistresses. They also bore their messages. And did you remark the plumed cap of the page? How grand it was! You pay a fine if you wear those plumes without the right of doing so. Master Nicholas had seen the lady, too, quite close, a kind of queen. Such wealth gives beauty. The skin is whiter, the eye more proud, the gait more noble, and grace more insolent. Nothing can equal the elegant impertinence of hands which never work. Master Nicholas told the story of all the magnificence of the white skin with the blue veins, the neck, the shoulders, the arms, the touch of paint everywhere, the pearl earrings, the headdress powdered with gold, the profusion of stones, the rubies, the diamonds. Less brilliant than her eyes, murmured Ursus. Gwynplaine said nothing. Dea listened. And do you know, said the tavern-keeper, the most wonderful thing of all? What, said Ursus? I saw her get into her carriage. What then? She did not get in alone. Nonsense. Someone got in with her. Who? Guess. The king, said Ursus. In the first place, said Master Nicholas, there is no king at present. We are not living under a king. Guess who got into the carriage with the duchess? Jupiter, said Ursus. The hotel keeper replied, Tom Jim Jack. Gwynplaine, who had not said a word, broke silence. Tom Jim Jack, he cried. There was a pause of astonishment, during which the low voice of Dia was heard to say, Cannot this woman be prevented coming? End of section 65 Recording by John Trevithick Section 66 of The Man Who Loves by Victor Hugo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maxim Babich from Desnogorsk. The Man Who Loves by Victor Hugo. Part 2. Book the Third. The Beginning of the Fissure. Chapter 8. Symptoms of Poisoning. The apparition did not return. It did not reappear in the theatre, but it reappeared to the memory of Gwynplaine. Gwynplaine was, to a certain degree, troubled. It seemed to him that for the first time in his life he had seen a woman. He made that first stumble, a strange dream. We should beware of the nature of the reveries that fasten on us. A reverie has in it the mystery and subtlety of an odor. It is to thought what perfume is to the tuberose. It is at times the exudation of a venomous idea, and it penetrates like a vapor. You may poison yourself with reveries, as with flowers. An intoxicating suicide exquisite and malignant. The suicide of the soul is evil thought. In it is the poison. Reverie attracts, cajoles, lures, entwines, and then makes you its accomplice. It makes you bear your half in the trickeries which it plays on conscience. It charms, then it corrupts you. We may say of reverie as of play, one begins by being a dupe, and ends by being a cheat. Gwynplaine dreamed. He had never before seen a woman. 
he had seen the shadow in the women of the populace, and he had seen the soul in Dia. He had just seen the reality, a warm and living skin, under which one felt the circulation of passionate blood, an outline with the precision of marble, and the undulation of the wave, a high and impassive mien, mingling refusal with attraction, and summing itself up in its own glory, hair of the color of the reflection from a furnace, a gallantry of adornment producing in herself and in others a tremor of voluptuousness, the half-revealed nudity betraying a disdainful desire to be coveted at a distance by the crowd, an ineradicable coquetry, the charm of impenetrability, temptation seasoned by the glimpse of perdition, a promise to the senses and a menace to the mind, a double anxiety, the one desire, the other fear. He had just seen these things. He had just seen woman. He had seen more and less than a woman. He had seen a female, and at the same time an Olympian, the female of a god. The mystery of sex had just been revealed to him. And where? On inaccessible heights, at an infinite distance. O oh, mocking destiny! The soul, that celestial essence, he possessed. He held it in his hand. It was dear. Sex, that terrestrial embodiment, he perceived in the heights of heaven. It was that woman, a duchess, more than a goddess, Ursus had said. What a precipice! Even dreams dissolved before such a perpendicular height to escalade. Was he going to commit the folly of dreaming about the unknown beauty? He debated with himself. He recalled all that Ursus had said of high stations which are almost royal. The philosopher's disquisitions which had hitherto seemed so useless, now became landmarks for his thoughts. A very thin layer of forgetfulness often lies over our memory, through which at times we catch a glimpse of all beneath it. His fancy ran on that august world, the peerage, to which the lady belonged, and which was so inexorably placed above the inferior world, the common people, of which he was one. And was he even one of the people? Was not he, the mountebank, below the lowest of the low? For the first time since he had arrived at the age of reflection, he felt his heart vaguely contracted by a sense of his baseness, and of that which we nowadays call abasement. The paintings and the catalogues of Ursus, his lyrical inventories, his dithyrambics of castles, parks, fountains, and colonnades, his catalogues of riches and of power, revived in the memory of Gwynplaine, in the relief of reality mingled with mist. He was possessed with the image of this zenith. That a man should be a lord, it seemed chimerical. It was so, however. Incredible thing! There were lords! But were they of flesh and blood like ourselves? It seemed doubtful. He felt that he lay at the bottom of all darkness, encompassed by a wall, while he could just perceive in the far distance above his head, through the mouth of the pit, a dazzling confusion of azure, of figures, and of rays, which was Olympus. In the midst of this glory, the Duchess shone out resplendent. He felt for this woman a strange, inexpressible longing, combined with a conviction of the impossibility of attainment. This poignant contradiction returned to his mind again and again, notwithstanding every effort. He saw near to him, even within his reach, in close and tangible reality, the soul, and in the unattainable, in the depths of the ideal, the flesh. None of these thoughts attained to certain shape. They were as a vapor within him, changing every instant its form and floating away. But the darkness which the vapor caused was intense. He did not form even in his dreams any hope of reaching the heights where the Duchess dwelt. Luckily for him, the vibration of such ladders of fancy 
if ever we put out foot upon them, may render our brains dizzy forever. Intending to scale Olympus, we reach Bedlam. Any distinct feeling of actual desire would have terrified him. He entertained none of that nature. Besides, was he likely ever to see the lady again? Most probably not. To fall in love with a passing light on the horizon. Madness cannot reach to that pitch. To make loving eyes at a star, even, is not incomprehensible. It is seen again, it reappears, it is fixed in the sky. But can anyone be enamored of a flash of lightning? Dreams flowed and ebbed within him. The majestic and gallant idol at the back of the box had cast a light over his diffused ideas, then faded away. He thought, yet thought not of it, turned to other things, returned to it. It rocked about in his brain, nothing more. It broke his sleep for several nights. Sleeplessness is as full of dreams as sleep. It is almost impossible to express in their exact limits the abstract evolutions of the brain. The inconvenience of words is that they are more marked in form than ideas. All ideas have indistinct boundary lines. Words have not. A certain diffused phase of the soul ever escapes words. Expression has its frontiers. Thought has none. The depths of our secret souls are so vast that Gwynplaine's dream scarcely touched Dea. Dea reigned sacred in the center of his soul. Nothing could approach her. Still, for such contradictions make up the soul of man, there was a conflict within him. Was he conscious of it? Scarcely. In his heart of hearts he felt a collision of desires. We all have our weak points. Its nature would have been clear to Ursus, but to Gwynplaine it was not. Two instincts, one the ideal, the other sexual, were struggling within him. Such contests occur between the angels of light and darkness on the edge of the abyss. At length the angel of darkness was overthrown. One day Gwynplaine suddenly thought no more of the unknown woman. The struggle between two principles, the duel between his earthly and his heavenly nature, had taken place within his soul, and at such a depth that he had understood it but dimly. One thing was certain, that he had never for one moment ceased to adore Dea. He had been attacked by a violent disorder, his blood had been fevered, but it was over. Dea alone remained. Gwynplaine would have been much astonished had any one told him that Dea had ever been, even for a moment, in danger. And in a week or two, the phantom which had threatened the hearts of both their souls faded away. Within Gwynplaine nothing remained but the heart, which was the hearth, and the love, which was its fire. Besides, we have just said that the Duchess did not return. Ursus thought it all very natural. The lady with the gold piece is a phenomenon. She enters, pays, and vanishes. It would be too much joy were she to return. As to Dea, she made no allusion to the woman who had come and passed away. She listened, perhaps, and was sufficiently enlightened by the sighs of Ursus, and now and then by some significant exclamation, such as, one does not get ounces of gold every day. She spoke no more of the woman. This showed deep instinct. The soul takes obscure precautions, in the secrets of which it is not always admitted itself. To keep silence about any one seems to keep them afar off. One fears that questions may call them back. We put silence between us, as if we were shutting a door. So the incident fell into oblivion. Was it ever anything? Had it ever occurred? Could it be said that a shadow had floated between Gwynplaine and Dea? Dea did not know of it, nor Gwynplaine either. No, nothing had occurred. The Duchess herself was blurred in the distant perspective, like an illusion. It had been but a momentary dream, passing over Gwynplaine 
out of which he had awakened. When it fades away, a reverie, like a mist, leaves no trace behind. And when the cloud has passed on, love shines out as brightly in the heart as the sun in the sky. End of section 66《Section 67 of The Man Who Laughs》by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo, Part 2, Book the Fourth, Chapter 9. Abyssus Abyssum Vocat. Another face disappeared. Tom Jim Jacks. Suddenly he ceased to frequent the Tadcaster Inn. Persons so situated as to be able to observe other phases of fashionable life in London might have seen that about this time the weekly gazette, between two extracts from parish registers, announced the departure of Lord David Didemois, by order of Her Majesty, to take command of his frigate in the White Squadron then cruising off the coast of Holland. Ursus, perceiving that Tom Jim Jack did not return, was troubled by his absence, he had not seen Tom Jim Jack since the day on which he had driven off in the same carriage with the Lady of the Gold Peace. It was indeed an enigma who this Tom Jim Jack could be, who carried off duchesses under his arm. What an interesting investigation! What questions to propound! What things to be said! Therefore Ursus said not a word. Ursus, who had had experience, knew the smart caused by rash curiosity. Curiosity ought always to be proportioned to the curious. By listening we risk our ear, by watching we risk our eye. Prudent people neither see nor hear. Tom Jim Jack had got into a princely carriage. The tavern-keeper had seen him. It appeared so extraordinary that the sailor should sit by the lady, that it made Ursus circumspect. The caprices of those in high life ought to be sacred to the lower orders. The reptiles called the poor had best squat in their holes when they see anything out of the way. Quiescence is a power. Shut your eyes if you have not the good luck to be blind. Stop up your ears if you have not the good fortune to be deaf. Paralyze your tongue if you have not the perfection of being mute. The great do what they like, the little what they can. Let the unknown pass unnoticed. Do not importune mythology. Do not interrogate appearances. Have a profound respect for idols. Do not let us direct our gossiping towards the lessenings or increasings which take place in superior regions, of the motives of which we are ignorant. Such things are mostly optical delusions to us inferior creatures. Metamorphoses are the business of the gods. The transformations and the contingent disorders of great persons who float above us are clouds impossible to comprehend and perilous to study. Too much attention irritates the Olympians, engaged in their gyrations of amusement or fancy, and a thunderbolt may teach you that the bull you are too curiously examining is Jupiter. Do not lift the folds of the stone-coloured mantles of those terrible powers. Indifference is intelligence. Do not stir, and you will be safe. Feign death, and they will not kill you. Therein lies the wisdom of the insect. Ursus practised it. The tavern-keeper, who was puzzled as well, questioned Ursus one day. Do you observe that Tom Jim Jack never comes here now? Indeed, said Ursus, I have not remarked it. Master Nicholas made an observation in an undertone, no doubt touching the intimacy between the ducal carriage and Tom Jim Jack, a remark which, as it might have been irreverent and dangerous, Ursus took care not to hear. Still, Ursus was too much of an artist not to regret Tom Jim Jack. He felt some disappointment. He told his feelings to Homo, of whose discretion alone he felt certain. He whispered into the ear of the wolf, Since Tom Jim Jack ceased to come, I feel a blank as a man and a chill as a poet. This pouring out of his heart to a friend relieved Ursus. His lips were sealed before Gwynplaine, who, however, made no allusion to Tom Jim Jack. 
The fact was that Tom Jim Jack's presence or absence mattered not to Gwynplaine, absorbed as he was in Dea. Forgetfulness fell more and more on Gwynplaine. As for Dea, she had not even suspected the existence of a vague trouble. At the same time, no more cabals or complaints against the laughing man were spoken of. Hate seemed to have let go its hold. All was tranquil in and around the green box. No more opposition from strollers, merry andrews, nor priests. No more grumbling outside. Their success was unclouded. Destiny allows of such sudden serenity. The brilliant happiness of Gwynplaine and Dea was for the present absolutely cloudless. Little by little it had risen to a degree which admitted of no increase. There is one word which expresses the situation. Apogee. Happiness like the sea has its high tide. The worst thing for the perfectly happy is that it recedes. There are two ways of being inaccessible, being too high and being too low. At least as much perhaps as the first is the second to be desired. More surely than the eagle escapes the arrow, the animalcule escapes being crushed. This security of insignificance, if it had ever existed on earth, was enjoyed by Gwynplaine and Dea, and never before had it been so complete. They lived on daily more and more ecstatically wrapped in each other. The heart saturates itself with love as with a divine salt that preserves it, and from this arises the incorruptible constancy of those who have loved each other from the dawn of their lives, and the affection which keeps its freshness in old age. There is such a thing as the embalmment of the heart. It is of Daphnis and Chloe that Philemon and Baucis are made. The old age of which we speak, evening resembling morning, was evidently reserved for Gwynplaine and Dea. In the meantime they were young. Ursus looked on this love as a doctor examines his case. He had what was in those days termed a hypocritical expression of face. He fixed his sagacious eyes on Dea, fragile and pale, and growled out, It is lucky that she is happy. At other times he said, She is lucky for her health's sake. He shook his head and, at times, read attentively a portion treating of heart disease in Avicenna, translated by Vosiscus Fortunatus, Louvain, 1650, an old worm-eaten book of his. Dea, when fatigued, suffered from perspirations and drowsiness, and took a daily siesta, as we have already seen. One day, while she was lying asleep on the bearskin, Gwynplaine was out, and Ursus bent down softly and applied his ear to Dea's heart. He seemed to listen for a few minutes, and then stood up, murmuring, She must not have any shock. It would find out the weak place. The crowd continued to flock to the performance of Chaos Vanquished. The success of the laughing man seemed inexhaustible. Every one rushed to see him, no longer from Southwick only, but even from other parts of London. The general public began to mingle with the usual audience, which no longer consisted of sailors and drivers only. In the opinion of Master Nicholas, who was well acquainted with crowds, there were in the crowd gentlemen and baronets disguised as common people. Disguise is one of the pleasures of pride, and was much in fashion at that period. This mixing of the aristocratic element with the mob was a good sign, and showed that their popularity was extending to London. The fame of Gwynplaine has decidedly penetrated into the great world. Such was the fact. Nothing was talked of but the laughing man. He was talked about even at the Mohawk Club, frequented by noblemen. In the green box they had no idea of all this. They were content to be happy. It was intoxication to Dea to feel, as she did every evening, the crisp and tawny head of Gwynplaine. In love there is nothing like habit. The whole of life is concentrated in it. The reappearance of the stars is the custom of the universe. Creation is nothing but a mistress, and the sun is a lover. Light is a dazzling caryatid supporting the world. Each day, for a sublime minute, the earth, covered by night, rests on the rising sun. Dea, blind, 
felt a like return of warmth and hope within her when she placed her hand on the head of Gwynplaine. To adore each other in the shadows, to love in the plenitude of silence, who could not become reconciled to such an eternity? One evening Gwynplaine, feeling within him that overflow of felicity which, like the intoxication of perfumes, causes a sort of delicious faintness, was strolling, as he usually did after the performance, in the meadow some hundred paces from the green box. Sometimes, in those high tides of feeling in our souls, we feel that we would fain pour out the sensations of the overflowing heart. The night was dark but clear, the stars were shining, the whole fairground was deserted, sleep and forgetfulness reigned in the caravans, which were scattered over Terenzo Field. One light alone was unextinguished. It was the lamp of the Tadcaster Inn, the door of which was left ajar to admit Gwynplaine on his return. Midnight had just struck in the five parishes of Southwick, with the breaks and differences of tone of their various bells. Gwynplaine was dreaming of Dea. Of whom else should he dream? But that evening, feeling singularly troubled and full of a charm, which was at the same time a pang, he thought of Dea as a man thinks of a woman. He reproached himself for this. It seemed to be failing in respect to her. The husband's attack was forming dimly within him, sweet and imperious impatience. He was crossing the invisible frontier, on this side of which is the virgin, on the other the wife. He questioned himself anxiously. A blush, as it were, overspread his mind. The Gwynplaine of long ago had been transformed by degrees unconsciously in a mysterious growth. His old modesty was becoming misty and uneasy. We have an ear of light into which speaks the spirit, and an ear of darkness into which speaks the instinct. Into the latter strange voices were making their proposals. However pure-minded may be the youth who dreams of love, a certain grossness of the flesh eventually comes between his dream and him. Intentions lose their transparency. The unavowed desire implanted by nature enters into his conscience. Gwynplaine felt an indescribable yearning of the flesh, which abounds in all temptation, and Dea was scarcely flesh. In this fever, which he knew to be unhealthy, he transfigured Dea into a more material aspect, and tried to exaggerate her seraphic form into feminine loveliness. It is thou, O woman, that we require. Love comes not to permit too much of paradise. It requires the fevered skin, the troubled life, the unbound hair, the kiss electrical and irreparable, the clasp of desire. The sidereal is embarrassing, the ethereal is heavy. Too much of the heavenly in love is like too much fuel on a fire. The flame suffers from it. Gwynplaine fell into an exquisite nightmare, Dea to be clasped in his arms, Dea clasped in them. He heard nature in his heart crying out for a woman, like a Pygmalion in a dream modelling a Galatea out of the azure. In the depths of his soul he worked at the chaste contour of Dea, a contour with too much of heaven, too little of Eden. For Eden is Eve, and Eve was a female, a carnal mother, a terrestrial nurse. The sacred womb of generations, the breast of unfailing milk, the rocker of the cradle of the new-born world, and wings are incompatible with the bosom of woman. Virginity is but the hope of maternity. Still, in Gwynplaine's dreams, Dea until now had been enthroned above flesh. Now, however, he made wild efforts in thought to draw her downwards by that thread sex which ties every girl to earth. Not one of those birds is free. Dea, like all the rest, was within this law, and Gwynplaine, though he scarcely acknowledged it, felt a vague desire that she should submit to it. This desire possessed him in spite of himself, and with an ever-recurring relapse. He pictured Dea as woman. He came to the point of regarding her under a hitherto unheard-of form, as a creature no longer of ecstasy only, but of voluptuousness, as Dea with her head resting on the pillow. He was ashamed of this visionary desecration. 
It was like an attempt at profanation. He resisted its assault. He turned from it, but it returned again. He felt as if he were committing a criminal assault. To him Dea was encompassed by a cloud. Cleaving that cloud, he shuddered, as though he were raising her chemise. It was in April. The spine has its dreams. He rambled at random with the uncertain step caused by solitude. To have no one by is a provocation to wander. Whither flew his thoughts? He would not have dared to own it to himself. To heaven? No. To a bed. You are looking down upon him, O oh, ye stars. Why talk of a man in love? Rather say a man possessed. To be possessed by the devil is the exception. To be possessed by a woman, the rule. Every man has to bear this alienation of himself. What a sorceress is a pretty woman. The true name of love is captivity. Man is made prisoner by the soul of a woman, by her flesh as well, and sometimes even more by the flesh than by the soul. The soul is the true love, the flesh the mistress. We slander the devil. It was not he who tempted Eve. It was Eve who tempted him. The woman began. Lucifer was passing by quietly. He perceived the woman and became Satan. The flesh is the cover of the unknown. It is provocative, which is strange, by its modesty. Nothing could be more distracting. It is full of shame, the hussy. It was the terrible love of the surface which was then agitating Gwynplaine and holding him in its power. Fearful the moment in which man covets the nakedness of woman. What dark things lurk beneath the fairness of Venus! Something within him was calling Dea aloud, Dea the maiden, Dea the other half of a man, Dea flesh and blood, Dea with uncovered bosom. That cry was almost driving away the angel. Mysterious crisis through which all love must pass, and in which the ideal is in danger. Therein is the predestination of creation. Moment of heavenly corruption. Gwynplaine's love of Dea was becoming nuptial. Virgin love is but a transition. The moment was come. Gwynplaine coveted the woman. He coveted a woman. Precipice of which one sees but the first gentle slope. The indistinct summons of nature is inexorable. The whole of woman, what an abyss! Luckily there was no woman for Gwynplaine but Dea, the only one he desired, the only one who could desire him. Gwynplaine felt that vague and mighty shudder which is the vital claim of infinity. Besides there was the aggravation of the spring. He was breathing the nameless odours of the starry darkness. He walked forward in a wild feeling of delight. The wandering perfumes of the rising sap, the heady irradiations which float in shadow, the distant opening of nocturnal flowers, the complicity of little hidden nests, the murmurs of waters and of leaves, soft sighs rising from all things, the freshness, the warmth, and the mysterious awakening of April and May, is the vast diffusion of sex murmuring in whispers their proposals of voluptuousness, until the soul stammers in answer to the giddy provocation. The ideal no longer knows what it is saying. Anyone observing Gwynplaine walk would have said, See, a drunken man. He almost staggered under the weight of his own heart, of spring and of the night. The solitude in the bowling green was so peaceful that at times he spoke aloud. The consciousness that there is no listener induces speech. He walked with slow steps, his head bent down, his hands behind him, the left hand in the right, the fingers open. Suddenly... He felt something slipped between his fingers. He turned round quickly. In his hand was a paper, and in front of him a man. It was the man who, coming behind him with the stealth of a cat, had placed the paper in his fingers. The paper was a letter. The man, as he appeared pretty clearly in the starlight, was small, chubby-cheeked, young, sedate, and dressed in a scarlet livery exposed from top to toe through the opening of a long grey cloak, then called a capanoche, a Spanish word contracted. 
In French it was Cap de Noue. His head was covered by a crimson cap like the skull cap of a cardinal, on which servitude was indicated by a strip of lace. On this cap was a plume of tisserae feathers. He stood motionless before Gwynplaine like a dark outline in a dream. Gwynplaine recognized the Duchess's page. Before Gwynplaine could utter an exclamation of surprise, he heard the thin voice of the page, at once childlike and feminine in its tone, saying to him, At this hour to-morrow, be at the corner of London Bridge. I will be there to conduct you. Whither? demanded Gwynplaine. Where you are expected. Gwynplaine dropped his eyes on the letter, which he was holding mechanically in his hand. When he looked up, the page was no longer with him. He perceived a vague form lessening rapidly in the distance. It was the little valet. He turned the corner of the street, and solitude reigned again. Gwynplaine saw the page vanish, then looked at the letter. There are moments in our lives when what happens seems not to happen. Stupor keeps us for a moment at a distance from the fact. Gwynplaine raised the letter to his eyes as if to read it, but soon perceived that he could not do so for two reasons, first because he had not broken the seal, and secondly because it was too dark. It was some minutes before he remembered that there was a lamp at the inn. He took a few steps sideways, as if he knew not whither he was going. A somnambulist to whom a phantom had given a letter might walk as he did. At last he made up his mind. He ran rather than walked towards the inn, stood in the light which broke through the half-open door, and by it again examined the closed letter. There was no design on the seal, and on the envelope was written, To Gwynplaine. He broke the seal, tore the envelope, unfolded the letter, put it directly under the light, and read as follows. You are hideous. I am beautiful. You are a player. I am a duchess. I am the highest. You are the lowest. I desire you. I love you. Come. End of section 67. Recording by John Trevithick. Section 68 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Part 2. Book the Fourth. Chapter 1. The Temptation of St. Gwynplaine. One jet of flame hardly makes a prick in the darkness. Another sets fire to a volcano. Some sparks are gigantic. Gwynplaine read the letter, then he read it over again. Yes, the words were there, I love you. Terrors chased each other through his mind. The first was that he believed himself to be mad. He was mad, that was certain. He had just seen what had no existence. The twilight spectres were making game of him, poor wretch. The little man in scarlet was the will-o'-the-wisp of a dream. Sometimes at night nothings, condensed into flame, come and laugh at us. Having had his laugh out, the visionary being had disappeared, and left Gwynplaine behind him mad. Such are the freaks of darkness. The second terror was to find out that he was in his right senses. A vision? Certainly not. How could that be? Had he not a letter in his hand? Did he not see an envelope, a seal, paper, and writing? Did he not know from whom that came? It was all clear enough. Someone took a pen and ink and wrote. Someone lighted a taper and sealed it with wax. Was not his name written on the letter to Gwynplaine? The paper was scented. All was clear. Gwynplaine knew the little man. The dwarf was a page, the gleam was a livery. The page had given him a rendezvous for the same hour on the morrow, at the corner of London Bridge. Was London Bridge an illusion? No, no, all was clear. There was no delirium, all was reality. Gwynplaine was perfectly clear in his intellect. 
It was not a phantasmagoria suddenly dissolving above his head and fading into nothingness. It was something which had really happened to him. No, Gwynplaine was not mad, nor was he dreaming. Again he read the letter. Well, yes, but then? That, then, was terror-striking. There was a woman who desired him. If so, let no one ever again pronounce the word incredible. A woman desire him? A woman who had seen his face? A woman who was not blind? And who was this woman? An ugly one? No. A beauty? A gypsy? No. A duchess? What was it all about, and what could it all mean? What peril in such a triumph? And how was he to help plunging into it headlong? What, that woman, the siren, the apparition, the lady in the visionary box, the light in the darkness? It was she, yes, it was she. The crackling of the fire burst out in every part of his frame. It was the strange, unknown lady, she who had previously so troubled his thoughts, and his first tumultuous feelings about this woman returned, heated by the evil fire. Forgetfulness is nothing but a palimpsest. An incident happens unexpectedly, and all that was effaced revives in the blanks of wondering memory. Gwynplaine thought that he had dismissed that image from his remembrance, and he found that it was still there and she had put her mark in his brain, unconsciously guilty of a dream. Without his suspecting it, the lines of the engraving had been bitten deep by reverie. And now a certain amount of evil had been done, and this train of thought, thenceforth, perhaps irreparable, he took up again eagerly. What? She desired him? What? The princess descend from her throne, the idol from its shrine, the statue from its pedestal, the phantom from its cloud. What from the depths of the impossible had the shimmer come? This deity of the sky, this irradiation, this nereid, all glistening with jewels, this proud and unattainable beauty from the height of her radiant throne was bending down to Gwynplaine. What? Had she drawn up her chariot of the dawn with its yoke of turtle doves and dragons before Gwynplaine, and said to him, Come, what? This terrible glory of being the object of such abasement from the Empyrean for Gwynplaine. This woman, if he could give that name to a form so star-like and majestic, this woman proposed herself, gave herself, delivered herself up to him. Wonder of wonders! a goddess prostituting herself for him, the arms of a courtesan opening in a cloud to clasp him to the bosom of a goddess, and that without degradation. Such majestic creatures cannot be sullied. The gods bathe themselves pure in light, and this goddess who came to him knew what she was doing. She was not ignorant of the incarnate hideousness of Gwynplaine. She had seen the mask which was his face and that mask had not caused her to draw back. Gwynplaine was loved notwithstanding it. Here was a thing surpassing all the extravagance of dreams. He was loved in consequence of his mask. Far from repulsing the goddess, the mask attracted her. Gwynplaine was not only loved, he was desired. He was more than accepted, he was chosen. He! Chosen! What? There where this woman dwelt in the regal region of irresponsible splendor, and in the power of full free will. Where there were princes, and she could take a prince. Nobles, and she could take a noble. Where there were men handsome, charming, magnificent, and she could take an Adonis. Whom did she take? Naphron. She could choose from the midst of meteors and thunders the mighty six-winged seraphim and she chose the lava crawling in the slime. On one side were highnesses and peers, all grandeur, all opulence, all glory. On the other, a mountebank. The mountebank carried it. What kind of scales could there be in the heart of this woman? By what measure did she weigh her love? She took off her ducal coronet and flung it on the platform of a clown. She took from her brow the Olympian aureola, and placed it on the bristly head of a gnome. The world had turned topsy-turvy. 
the insects swarmed on high, the stars were scattered below, whilst the wonder-stricken Gwynplaine, overwhelmed by a falling ruin of light, and lying in the dust, was enshrined in a glory. One all-powerful, revolting against beauty and splendour, gave herself to the damned of night, preferred Gwynplaine to Antinous. Excited by curiosity, she entered the shadows, and descending within them, and from this abdication of goddess-ship, was rising, crowned and prodigious, the royalty of the wretched. You are hideous, I love you. These words touched Gwynplaine in the ugly spot of pride. Pride is the heel in which all heroes are vulnerable. Gwynplaine was flattered in his vanity as a monster. He was loved for his deformity. He, too, was the exception, as much and perhaps more than the Jupiters and the Apollos. He felt superhuman, and so much a monster as to be a god. Fearful bewilderment. Now, who was this woman? What did he know about her? Everything and nothing. She was a duchess, that he knew. He knew also that she was beautiful and rich, that she had liveries, lackeys, pages, and footmen running with torches by the side of her coroneted carriage. He knew that she was in love with him, at least she said so. Of everything else he was ignorant. He knew her title, but not her name. He knew her thought. He knew not her life. Was she married widow maiden? Was she free? Of what family was she? Were there snares, traps, dangers about her? Of the gallantry existing on the idle heights of society, the caves on those summits in which savage charmers dream amidst the scattered skeletons of the loves which they have already preyed on, of the extent of tragic cynicism to which the experiments of a woman may attain who believes herself to be beyond the reach of man, of things such as these Gwynplaine had no idea. Nor had he even in his mind materials out of which to build up a conjecture, information concerning such things being very scanty in the social depths in which he lived. Still he detected a shadow. He felt that a mist hung over all this brightness. Did he understand it? No. Could he guess at it? Still less. What was there behind that letter? One pair of folding doors opening before him, another closing on him, and causing him a vague anxiety. On the one side an avowal, on the other an enigma, a vowel and enigma which, like two mouths, one tempting, the other threatening, pronounce the same word, dare. Never had perfidious chance taken its measures better, nor timed more fitly the moment of temptation. Gwynplaine, stirred by spring and by the sap rising in all things, was prompt to dream the dream of the flesh. The old man who was not to be stamped out, and over whom none of us can triumph, was awaking in that backward youth, still a boy at twenty-four. It was just then, at the most stormy moment of the crisis, that the offer was made him, and the naked bosom of the sphinx appeared before his dazzled eyes. Youth is an inclined plane. Gwynplaine was stooping, and something pushed him forward. What? The season and the night. Who? The woman. Were there no month of April, man would be a great deal more virtuous. The budding plants are a set of accomplices. Love is the thief, spring the receiver. Gwynplaine was shaken. There is a kind of smoke of evil preceding sin in which the conscience cannot breathe. The obscure nausea of hell comes over virtue and temptation. The yawning abyss discharges an exhalation which warns the strong and turns the weak giddy. Gwynplaine was suffering its mysterious attack. Dilemmas, transient and at the same time stubborn, were floating before him. Sin, presenting itself obstinately again and again to his mind, was taking form. The morrow, midnight, London Bridge, the page, should he go? Yes, cried the flesh, no, cried the soul. Nevertheless, we must remark that, strange as it may appear at first sight, he never once put himself the question, should he go, quite distinctly. Reprehensible actions are like over-strong brandies. You cannot swallow them at a draught. 
You put down your glass. You will see to it presently. There is a strange taste even about that first drop. One thing is certain, he felt something behind him pushing him forward towards the unknown, and he trembled. He could catch a glimpse of a crumbling precipice, and he drew back stricken by the terror encircling him. He closed his eyes. He tried hard to deny to himself that the adventure had ever occurred, and to persuade himself into doubting his reason. This was evidently his best plan. The wisest thing he could do was to believe himself mad. Fatal Fever Every man, surprised by the unexpected, has at times felt the throb of such tragic pulsations. The observer ever listens with anxiety to the echoes resounding from the dull strokes of the battering ram of destiny striking against a conscience. Alas, Squinplain put himself questions. Where duty is clear, to put oneself questions is to suffer defeat. There are invasions which the mind may have to suffer. There are the vandals of the soul, evil thoughts coming to devastate our virtue. A thousand contrary ideas rushed into Gwynplaine's brain, now following each other singly, now crowding together. Then silence reigned again, and he would lean his head on his hands in a kind of mournful attention, as of one who contemplates a landscape by night. Suddenly he felt that he was no longer thinking. His reverie had reached that point of utter darkness in which all things disappear. He remembered, too, that he had not entered the inn. It might be about two o'clock in the morning. He placed the letter which the page had brought him in his side pocket, but perceiving that it was next to his heart, he drew it out again, crumpled it up, and placed it in a pocket of his hose. He then directed his steps towards the inn, which he entered stealthily, and without awakening little Govicum, who while waiting up for him had fallen asleep on the table with his arms for a pillow. He closed the door, lighted a candle at the lamp, fastened the bolt, turned the key in the lock, taking mechanically all the precautions usual to a man returning home late, ascended the staircase of the green box, slipped into the old hovel which he used as a bedroom, looked at Ursus, who was asleep, blew out his candle, and did not go to bed. Thus an hour passed away. Weary at length, and fancying that bed and sleep were one, he laid his head upon the pillow without undressing, making darkness the concession of closing his eyes. But the storm of emotions which assailed him had not waned for an instant. Sleeplessness is a cruelty which night inflicts on man. Gwynplaine suffered greatly. For the first time in his life he was not pleased with himself. Ache of heart mingled with gratified vanity. What was he to do? Day broke at last. He heard Ursus get up, but did not raise his eyelids. No truce for him, however. The letter was ever in his mind. Every word of it came back to him in a kind of chaos. In certain violent storms within the soul, thought becomes a liquid. It is convulsed. It heaves, and something rises from it like the dull roaring of the waves. Flood and flow, sudden shocks and whirls, the hesitation of the wave before the rock. Hail and rain, clouds with the light shining through their breaks. The petty flights of useless foam. Wild swell broken in an instant. Great efforts lost. Wreck appearing all around. Darkness and universal dispersion. As these things are of the sea, so are they of man. Gwynplaine was a prey to such a storm. At the acme of his agony, his eyes still closed, he heard an exquisite voice saying, Are you asleep, Gwynplaine? He opened his eyes with a start and sat up. Dea was standing in the half-open doorway. Her ineffable smile was in her eyes and on her lips. She was standing there, charming in the unconscious serenity of her radiance. Then came, as it were, a sacred moment. Gwynplaine watched her, startled, dazzled, awakened. Awakened from what? From sleep? No, from sleeplessness. It was she, it was Dea. And suddenly he felt in the depths of his being the indescribable wane of the storm and the sublime descent of good over evil. The miracle of the look from on high was accomplished. The blind girl, 
the sweet light-bearer, with no effort beyond her mere presence, dissipated all the darkness within him. The curtain of cloud was dispersed from the soul, as if drawn by an invisible hand, and a sky of azure, as though by celestial enchantment, again spread over Gwynplaine's conscience. In a moment he became by the virtue of that angel the great and good de Gwynplaine, the innocent man. Such mysterious confrontations occur to the soul as they do to creation. Both were silent. She who was the light, he who was the abyss. She who was divine, he who was appeased. And over Gwynplaine's stormy heart, Dea shone with the indescribable effect of a star shining on the sea. End of section 68. Recording by John Trevithick. Section 69 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo, Part 2, Book the Fourth, Chapter 2. From Gay to Grave. How simple is a miracle! It was breakfast hour in the green box, and Dea had merely come to see why Gwynplaine had not joined their little breakfast table. It is you, exclaimed Gwynplaine, and he had said everything. There was no other horizon, no vision for him now, but the heavens where Dea was. His mind was appeased, appeased in such a manner as he alone can understand who has seen the smile spread swiftly over the sea when the hurricane had passed away. Over nothing does the calm come so quickly as over the whirlpool. This results from its power of absorption, and so it is with the human heart. Not always, however. Dea had but to show herself, and all the light that was in Gwynplaine left him and went to her, and behind the dazzled Gwynplaine there was but a flight of phantoms. What a peacemaker is adoration! A few minutes afterwards they were sitting opposite each other, Ursus between them, Homo at their feet. The teapot, hung over a little lamp, was on the table. Phoebe and Venus were outside waiting. They breakfasted as they supped in the centre compartment. From the position in which the narrow table was placed, Dea's back was turned towards the aperture in the partition which was opposite the entrance door of the green box. Their knees were touching. Gwynplaine was pouring out tea for Dea. Dea blew gracefully on her cup. Suddenly she sneezed. Just at that moment a thin smoke rose above the flame of the lamp, and something like a piece of paper fell into ashes. It was the smoke which had caused Dea to sneeze. "'What was that?' she asked. "'Nothing,' replied Gwynplaine, and he smiled. He had just burnt the Duchess's letter. The conscience of the man who loves is the guardian angel of the woman whom he loves. Unburdened of the letter, his relief was wondrous and Gwynplaine felt his integrity as the eagle feels its wings. It seemed to him as if his temptation had evaporated with the smoke, and as if the Duchess had crumbled into ashes with the paper. Taking up their cups at random, and drinking one after the other from the same one, they talked. A babble of lovers, a chattering of sparrows. Child's talk, worthy of Mother Goose or of Homer, with two loving hearts, go no further for poetry. With two kisses for dialogue, go no further for music. Do you know something? No. Gwynplaine, I dreamt that we were animals and had wings. Wings, that means birds, murmured Gwynplaine. Fools, it means angels, growled Ursus. And their talk went on. If you did not exist, Gwynplaine, what then? It could only be because there was no God. The tea is too hot. You will burn yourself, dear. Blow on my cup. How beautiful you are this morning. Do you know that I have a great many things to say to you? Say them. I love you. I adore you. And Ursa set aside, by heaven, they are polite. Exquisite to lovers are their moments of silence. 
In them they gather, as it were, masses of love, which afterwards explode into sweet fragments. Do you know, in the evening when we are playing our parts, at the moment when my hand touches your forehead, oh, what a noble head is yours, Gwynplaine, at the moment when I feel your hair under my fingers, I shiver, a heavenly joy comes over me, and I say to myself, in all this world of darkness which encompasses me, in this universe of solitude, in this great obscurity of ruin in which I am, in this quaking fear of myself and of everything, I have one prop, and he is there. It is he. It is you. Oh, you love me, said Gwynplaine. I, too, have but you on earth. You are all in all to me. Dea, what would you have me do? What do you desire? What do you want? Dea answered, I do not know. I am happy. Oh, replied Gwynplaine, we are happy. Ursus raised his voice severely. Oh, you are happy, are you? That's a crime. I have warned you already. You are happy. Then take care you aren't seen. Take up as little room as you can. Happiness ought to stuff itself into a hole. Make yourselves still less than you are, if that can be. God measures the greatness of happiness by the littleness of the happy. The happy should conceal themselves like malefactors. Oh, only shine out like the wretched glowworms that you are, and you'll be trodden on, and quite right too. What do you mean by all that love-making nonsense? I'm no duenna whose business it is to watch lovers billing and cooing. I'm tired of it all, I tell you, and you may both go to the devil. And, feeling that his harsh tones were melting into tenderness, he drowned his emotion in a loud grumble. Father, said Dea, how roughly you scold. It's because I don't like to see people too happy. Here Homo re-echoed Ursus. His growl was heard from beneath the lover's feet. Ursus stooped down and placed his hand on Homo's head. That's right, you're in a bad humour too. You growl. The bristles are all on end on your wolf's pate. You don't like all this love-making. That's because you are wise. Hold your tongue all the same. You have had your say and given your opinion. Be it so. Now be silent. The wolf growled again. Ursus looked under the table at him. Be still, homo. Come, don't dwell on it, you philosopher. But the wolf sat up and looked towards the door, showing his teeth. What's wrong with you now, said Ursus, and he caught hold of Homo by the skin of the neck. Heedless of the wolf's growls, and wholly wrapped up in her own thoughts, and in the sound of Gwynplaine's voice, which left its aftertaste within her, Dea was silent, and absorbed by that kind of ecstasy peculiar to the blind, which seems at times to give them a song to listen to in their souls, and to make up to them for the light which they lack, by some strain of ideal music. Blindness is a cavern to which reaches the deep harmony of the eternal. While Ursus, addressing Homo, was looking down, Gwynplaine had raised his eyes. He was about to drink a cup of tea, but did not drink it. He placed it on the table with the slow movement of a spring drawn back. His fingers remained open, his eyes fixed. He scarcely breathed. A man was standing in the doorway behind Dea. He was clad in black with a hood. He wore a wig down to his eyebrows, and held in his hand an iron staff with a crown at each end. His staff was short and massive. He was like Medusa thrusting her head between two branches in paradise. Ursus, who had heard someone enter and raised his head without loosing his hold of Homo, recognized the terrible personage. He shook from head to foot, and whispered to Gwynplaine, It's the Wapentake. Gwynplaine recollected. An exclamation of surprise was about to escape him, but he restrained it. The iron staff with the crown at each end was called the iron weapon. It was from this iron weapon upon which the city officers of justice took the oath when they entered on their duties, that the old weapon-takers of the English police derive their qualification. Behind the man in the wig, the frightened landlord could just be perceived in the shadow. Without saying a word, 
a personification of the muta themis of the old charters, the man stretched his right arm over the radiant dea, and touched Gwynplaine on the shoulder with the iron staff, at the same time pointing with his left thumb to the door of the green box behind him. These gestures, all the more imperious for their silence, meant, Follow me. Prosignio exiunde sursum trahe, says the old Norman record, he who was touched by the iron weapon had no right but the right of obedience. To that mute order there was no reply. The harsh penalties of the English law threatened the refractory. Gwynplaine felt a shock under the rigid touch of the law, then he sat as though petrified. If, instead of having been merely grazed on the shoulder, he had been struck a violent blow on the head with the iron staff, he could not have been more stunned. He knew that the police officer summoned him to follow, but why? That he could not understand. On his part Ursus too was thrown into the most painful agitation, but he saw through matters pretty distinctly. His thoughts ran on the jugglers and preachers, his competitors on informations laid against the green box, on that delinquent the wolf, on his own affair with the three bishops' gate commissioners, and who knows, perhaps but that would be too fearful, Gwynplaine's unbecoming and factious speeches touching the royal authority. He trembled violently. Dea was smiling. Neither Gwynplaine nor Ursus pronounced a word. They had both the same thought, not to frighten Dea. It may have struck the wolf as well, for he ceased growling. True, Ursus did not loose him. Homo, however, was a prudent wolf when occasion required. Who is there who has not remarked a kind of intelligent anxiety in animals? It may be that to the extent to which a wolf can understand mankind, he felt that he was an outlaw. Gwynplaine rose. Resistance was impracticable, as Gwynplaine knew. He remembered Ursus's words, and there was no question possible. He remained standing in front of the wapentake. The latter raised the iron staff from Gwynplaine's shoulder, and, drawing it back, held it out straight in an attitude of command, a constable's attitude which was well understood in those days by the whole people, and which expressed the following order, Let this man and no other follow me, the rest remain where they are, silence. No curious followers were allowed. In all times the police have had a taste for arrests of the kind. This description of seizure was termed sequestration of the person. The wapentake turned round in one motion like a piece of mechanism revolving on its own pivot, and with grave and magisterial step proceeded towards the door of the green box. Gwynplaine looked at Ursus. The latter went through a pantomime composed as follows, he shrugged his shoulders, placed both elbows close to his hips, with his hands out, and knitted his brows into chevrons, all which signifies, we must submit to the unknown. Gwynplaine looked at Thea. She was in her dream. She was still smiling. He put the ends of his fingers to his lips, and sent her an unutterable kiss. Ursus, relieved of some portion of his terror, now that the wapentake's back was turned, seized the moment to whisper in Gwynplaine's ear, On your life do not speak until you are questioned. Gwynplaine, with the same care to make no noise as he would have taken in a sick room, took his hat and cloak from the hook on the partition, wrapped himself up to the eyes in the cloak, and pushed his hat over his forehead. Not having been to bed, he had his working clothes still on, and his leather esclavin around his neck. Once more he looked at Dea. Having reached the door, the wapentake raised his staff and began to descend the steps. Then Gwynplaine set out as if the man was dragging him by an invisible chain. Ursus watched Gwynplaine leave the green box. At that moment the wolf gave a low growl, but Ursus silenced him and whispered, he is coming back. In the yard, Master Nicholas was stemming with servile and imperious gestures the cries of terror raised by Venus and Phoebe, as in great distress they watched Gwynplaine led away, 
and the morning-coloured garb and the iron staff of the wapentake. The two girls were like petrifactions. They were in the attitude of stalactites. Govicum, stunned, was looking open-mouthed out of a window. The wapentake preceded Gwynplaine by a few steps, never turning round or looking at him, in that icy ease which is given by the knowledge that one is the law. In death-like silence they both crossed the yard, went through the dark tap-room, and reached the street. A few passers-by had collected about the inn-door, and the justice of the quorum was there at the head of a squad of police. The idlers, stupefied and without breathing a word, opened out and stood aside with English discipline at the sight of the constable's staff. The wapentake moved off in the direction of the narrow street then called the Little Strand, running by the Thames, and Gwynplaine, with the justice of the quorum's men in ranks on each side, like a double hedge, pale without a motion except that of his steps, wrapped in his cloak as in a shroud, was leaving the inn farther and farther behind him, as he followed the silent man, like a statue following a spectre. End of section 69. Recording by John Trevithick. Section 70 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Part 2. Book the Fourth. Chapter 3. Lex, Rex, Fex. Unexplained arrest, which would greatly astonish an Englishman nowadays, was then a very usual proceeding of the police. Recourse was had to it, notwithstanding the Habeas Corpus Act, up to George the Second's time, especially in such delicate cases as were provided for by Le Tres de Cachet in France, and one of the accusations against which Walpole had to defend himself was that he had caused or allowed Newhoff to be arrested in that manner. The accusation was probably without foundation for Newhoff, King of Corsica, was put in prison by his creditors. These silent captures of the person very usual with the holy vahem in germany were admitted by german custom which rules one half of the old english laws and recommended in certain cases by norman custom which rules the other half justinian's chief of the palace police was called silentiarius imperialis the English magistrates who practiced the captures in question relied upon numerous Norman texts. Canes Latron, Sergente Silent, Sergente Aguere, Id Est Tassere. They quoted Landolphus Sagax, paragraph 16, Facit Imperator Silentium. They quoted the charter of King Philip in 1307, Multos tenabimus bastonarios qui a mutacentes sergentare valiant. They quoted the statutes of Henry I of England, Capitulo 53, Surge signo justus, taciturnior esto hoc est esse in captione regis. They took advantage especially of the following description, held to form part of the ancient feudal franchises of England. Sus les viscontes sont les sergents de l'espèce. Les quels doivent justiciere virtus mont à l'espèce tout ce so Qui swint mal vesis companies, 
gens diffames d'arcons crimes, et gens fuites et furbanas, et les devant si vigorousement et discretement apprehender, que la bonne gent qui sont passibles soyet gardé passiblement et que les malfectures soyet espoantes. To be thus arrested was to be seized a l'eglive de l'espée. Vitas consuetudo normani, manuscript part one, section one, chapter eleven. The juris consults referred besides in Charta Ludovici Hutum pro normanis chapter servientes spethe servientes spethe in the gradual approach of base latin to our idioms became sergentes spede these silent arrests were the contrary of the clamois de haro and gave warning that it was advisable to hold one's tongue until such time as light should be thrown upon certain matters still in the dark. They signified questions reserved, and showed in the operation of the police a certain amount of raison d'état. The legal term private was applied to arrests of this description. It was thus that Edward the Third, according to some chroniclers, caused Mortimer to be seized in the bed of his mother, Isabella of France. This, again, we may take leave to doubt, for Mortimer sustained a siege in his town before being captured. Warwick, the kingmaker, delighted in practicing this mode of attaching people. Cromwell made use of it, especially in Connaught, and it was with this precaution of silence that Traley Arclo, a relation of the Earl of Ormont, was arrested at Kilmaca. These captures of the body by the mere motion of justice represented rather the mandat de comparution than the warrant of arrest. Sometimes they were but processes of inquiry and even argued by the silence imposed upon all a certain consideration for the person seized for the mass of the people little versed as they were in the estimate of such shades of difference they had peculiar terrors it must not be forgotten that in seventeen o five and even much later england was far from being what she is today. The general features of its constitution were confused and at times very oppressive. Daniel Defoe, who had himself had a taste of the pillory, characterizes the social order of England somewhere in his writings as the iron hands of the law. There was not only the law, there was its arbitrary administration. We have but to recall Steele, ejected from Parliament, Locke, driven from his chair, Hobbes and Gibbon, compelled to flight, Charles Churchill, Hume and Priestley, persecuted, John Wilkes, sent to the Tower. The task would be a long one were we to count over the victims of the statute against seditious libel. The Inquisition had, to some extent, spread its arrangements throughout Europe, and its police practice was taken as a guide. A monstrous attempt against all rights was possible in England. We have only to recall the Gazettier Curiace. In the midst of the eighteenth century, Louis the fifteenth had writers whose works displeased him arrested in Piccadilly. It is true that George the second laid his hands on the pretender in France, right in the middle of the hall at the opera. Those were two long arms. 
that of the king of france reaching london that of the king of england paris such was the liberty of the period end of section seventy recording by bill mosley bernardo texas u s a section seventy one of the man who laughs by victor hugo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by clay beecham the man who laughs by victor hugo part two book the fourth chapter four Ursus spies the police. As we have already said, according to the very severe laws of the police of those days, the summons to follow the wapentek, addressed to an individual, implied to all other persons present the command not to stir. Some curious idlers, however, were stubborn, and followed from afar off the cortege which had taken Gwynplaine into custody. Ursus was one of them. He had been nearly as petrified as any one has a right to be, but Ursus, so often assailed by the surprises incident to a wandering life, and by the malice of chance, was, like a ship of war, prepared for action, and could call to the post of danger the whole crew, that is to say, the aid of all his intelligence. He flung off his stupor and began to think. He strove not to give way to emotion, but to stand face to face with circumstances. To look fortune in the face is the duty of every one not an idiot. To seek, not to understand, but to act. Presently he asked himself, what could he do? Gwynplaine being taken, Ursus was placed between two terrors, a fear for Gwynplaine, which instigated him to follow, and a fear for himself, which urged him to remain where he was. Ursus had the intrepidity of a fly, and the impassibility of a sensitive plant. His agitation was not to be described. However, he took his resolution heroically, and decided to brave the law, and follow the wapentake, so anxious was he concerning the fate of Gwynplaine. His terror must have been great to prompt so much courage. To what valiant acts will not fear drive a hare? The chamois in despair jumps a precipice. To be terrified into imprudence is one of the forms of fear. Gwynplaine had been carried off rather than arrested. The operation of the police had been executed so rapidly that the fair field, generally little frequented at that hour in the morning, had scarcely taken cognizance of the circumstance. Scarcely any one in the caravans had any idea that the wapentake had come to take Gwynplaine. Hence the smallness of the crowd. Gwynplaine thanks to his cloak and his hat, which nearly concealed his face, could not be recognized by the passers-by. Before he went out to follow Gwynplaine, Ursus took a precaution. He spoke to Master Nicholas, to the boy Govicum, and to Phoebe and Venus, and insisted on their keeping absolute silence before Dea, who was ignorant of everything, that they should not utter a syllable that could make her suspect what had occurred that they should make her understand that the cares of the management of the green box necessitated the absence of Gwynplaine and Ursus, that, besides, it would soon be the time of her daily siesta, and that before she awoke he and Gwynplaine would have returned, that all that had taken place had arisen from a mistake, that it would be very easy for Gwynplaine and himself to clear themselves before the magistrate and police, that a touch of the finger would put the matter straight, after which they should both return. Above all, that no one should say a word on the subject to Dea. Having given these directions, he departed. Ursus was able to follow Gwynplaine without being remarked. Though he kept at the greatest possible distance, he so managed as not to lose sight of him. Boldness and ambuscade is the bravery of the timid. After all, notwithstanding the solemnity of the attendant circumstances, Gwynplaine might have been summoned before the magistrate for some unimportant infraction of the law. Ursus assured himself that the question would be decided at once. 
the solution of the mystery would be made under his very eyes by the direction taken by the cortege, which took Gwynplaine from Terenzo Field, when it reached the entrance of the lanes of the Little Strand. If it turned to the left, it would conduct Gwynplaine to the Justice Hall in Southwark. In that case there would be little to fear, some trifling municipal offence, an admonition from the magistrate, two or three shillings to pay, and Gwynplaine would be set at liberty and the representation of chaos vanquished would take place in the evening as usual. In that case no one would know that anything unusual had happened. If the cortege turned to the right, matters would be more serious. There were frightful places in that direction. When the wapentake, leading the file of soldiers between whom Gwynplaine walked, arrived at the small streets, Ursus watched them breathlessly. There are moments in which a man's whole being passes into his eyes. Which way were they going to turn? They turned to the right. Ursus, staggering with terror, leaned against a wall that he might not fall. There is no hypocrisy so great as the words which we say to ourselves, I wish to know the worst. At heart we do not wish it at all. We have a dreadful fear of knowing it. Agony is mingled with a dim effort not to see the end. We do not own it to ourselves, but we would draw back if we dared. And when we have advanced, we reproach ourselves for having done so. Thus did Ursus. He shuddered at the thought. Here are things going wrong. I should have found it out soon enough. What business had I to follow Gwynplaine? Having made this reflection, Man being but self-contradiction, he increased his pace, and, mastering his anxiety, hastened to get nearer to the cortege, so as not to break, in the maze of small streets, the thread between Gwynplaine and himself. The cortege of police could not move quickly, on account of its solemnity. The wapentake led it. The justice of the quorum closed it. This order compelled a certain deliberation of movement. All the majesty possible than an official shown in the justice of the quorum. His costume held a middle place between the splendid robe of a doctor of music of Oxford and the sober black habiliments of a doctor of divinity in Cambridge. He wore the dress of a gentleman under a long go bear, which is a mantle trimmed with the fur of the Norwegian hare. He was half Gothic and half modern wearing a wig like La Mognon, and sleeves like Tristan Lermite. His great round eye watched Gwynplaine with the fixedness of an owl's. He walked with a cadence. Never did honest man look fiercer. Ursus, for a moment thrown out of his way in the tangled skein of streets, overtook, close to St. Mary Overy, the cortege, which had fortunately been retarded in the churchyard by a fight between children and dogs. A common incident in the streets in those days. Dogs and boys, say the old registers of police, placing the dogs before the boys. A man being taken before a magistrate by the police was, after all, an everyday affair, and each one having his own business to attend to, the few who had followed soon dispersed. There remained but Ursus on the track of Gwynplaine. They passed before two chapels opposite each other, belonging the one to the recreative religionists, the other to the Hallelujah League, sects which flourished then, and which exist to the present day. Then the cortege wound from street to street, making a zigzag, choosing by preference lanes not yet built on, roads where the grass grew, and deserted alleys. At length it stopped. It was in a little lane, with no houses except two or three hovels. This narrow alley was composed of two walls, one on the left, low, the other on the right, high. The high wall was black, and built in the Saxon style with narrow holes, scorpions, and large square gratings over narrow loopholes. There was no window on it, but here and there slits, old embrasures of pierrier and arch gaze. At the foot of this high wall was seen, like the hole in the bottom of a rat-trap, a little wicket gate, very elliptical in its arch. This small door, encased in a full, heavy girding of stone, had a grated peephole, a heavy knocker, 
a large lock, hinges thick and knotted, a bristling of nails, an armor of plates and hinges, so that altogether it was more of iron than of wood. There was no one in the lane, no shops, no passengers, but in it there was heard a continual noise, as if the lane ran parallel to a torrent. There was a tumult of voices and carriages. It seemed as if on the other side of the black edifice there must be a great street, doubtless the principal street of Southwark, one end of which ran into the Canterbury Road, and the other on to London Bridge. All the length of the lane, except the cortege which surrounded Gwynplaine, a watcher would have seen no other human face than the pale profile of Ursus, hazarding a hall advance from the shadow of the corner of the wall, looking, yet fearing to see. He had posted himself behind the wall, at a turn of the lane. The constables grouped themselves before the wicket. Gwynplaine was in the centre, the wapentake and his baton of iron being now behind him. The justice of the quorum raised the knocker, and struck the door three times. The loophole opened. The justice of the quorum said, By order of Her Majesty. The heavy door of oak and iron turned on its hinges, making a chilly opening, like the mouth of a cavern. A hideous depth yawned in the shadow. Ursus saw Gwynplaine disappear within it. End of section 71《Section 72 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Section 72, Part 2, Book the Fourth, Chapter 5. A FEARFUL PLACE The Wapentake entered behind Gwynplaine, then the Justice of the Quorum, then the Constables. The wicket was closed. The heavy door swung to, closing hermetically on the stone sills, without anyone seeing who had opened or shut it. It seemed as if the bolts re-entered their sockets of their own act. Some of these mechanisms, the invention of ancient intimidation, still exist in old prisons doors of which you saw no doorkeeper. With them, the entrance to a prison becomes like the entrance to a tomb. This wicket was the lower door of Southwark Jail. There was nothing in the harsh and worm-eaten aspect of this prison to soften its appropriate air of rigor. Originally a pagan temple, built by the Cantioclans for the Mogans, ancient English gods, it became a palace for Ethelwolf and a fortress for Edward the Confessor. Then it was elevated to the dignity of a prison in 1199 by John Lackland. Such was Southwark Jail. This jail, at first intersected by a street like Chenonceau by a river, had been for a century or two a gate, that is to say, the gate of the suburb. The passage had then been walled up. There remain in England some prisons of this nature. In London, Newgate at Canterbury, Westgate at Edinburgh, Cannon Gate. In France, the Bastille was originally a gate. Almost all the jails of England present the same appearance, a high wall without and a hive of cells within. Nothing could be more funereal than the appearance of those prisons, where spiders and justice spread their webs, and where John Howard, that ray of light, had not yet penetrated. Like the old Gehana of Brussels, they might well have been designated Turenburg, the House of Tears. Men felt before such buildings, at once so savage and inhospitable, the same distress that the ancient navigator suffered before the hell of slaves mentioned by Plautus, islands of creaking change, Ferrecrepidite insulae, when they passed near enough to hear the clank of the fetters. Southwark Jail, an old place of exorcisms and torture, was originally used solely for the imprisonment of sorcerers, as was proved by two verses engraved on a defaced stone at the foot of the wicket. 
Sunt erapetitii vexati demoni multo, est energumenus quem demon possidet unus. Lines which draw a subtle, delicate distinction between the demoniac and man possessed by a devil. At the bottom of this inscription, nailed flat against the wall, was a stone ladder, which had been originally of wood, but which had been changed into stone by being buried in earth of petrifying quality, at a place called Apsley Gowis, near Woburn Abbey. The prison of Southwark, now demolished, opened on two streets, between which, as a gate, it formerly served as means of communication. It had two doors, in the large street, a door, apparently used by the authorities, and in the lane, the door of punishment, used by the rest of the living and by the dead also, because when a prisoner in the jail died, it was by that issue that his corpse was carried out. A liberation not to be despised. Death is release into infinity. It was by the gate of punishment that Gwynplaine had been taken into prison. The lane, as we have said, was nothing but a little passage, paved with flints, confined between two opposite walls. There was one of the same kind at Brussels called Rue d'un Personnet. The walls were unequal in height. The high one was the prison, the low one the cemetery. The enclosure for the mortuary, remains of the jail, was not higher than the ordinary stature of a man. In it was a gate almost opposite the prison wicket. The dead had only to cross the street. The cemetery was but twenty paces from the jail. On the high wall was affixed a gallows. On the low one was sculptured a death's head. Neither of these walls made its opposite neighbor more cheerful. End of section 72 Recording by William Tomko Section 73 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Nissenson The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo Part 2 Book the Fourth Chapter 6 The Kind of Magistracy Under the Wigs of Former Days Anyone observing at that moment the other side of the prison, its façade, would have perceived the high street of Southwark, and might have remarked, stationed before the monumental and official entrance to the jail, a traveling carriage, recognized as such by its imperial. A few idlers surrounded the carriage. On it was a coat of arms, and a personage had been seen to descend from it and enter the prison. Probably a magistrate, conjectured the crowd. Many of the English magistrates were noble, and almost all had the right of bearing arms. In France, blazon and robe were almost contradictory terms. The Duke St. Simon says, in speaking of magistrates, people of that class. In England, a gentleman was not despised for being a judge. There are traveling magistrates in England. They are called judges of circuit, and nothing was easier than to recognize the carriage as the vehicle of a judge on circuit. That which was less comprehensible was that the supposed magistrate got down, not from the carriage itself, but from the box, a place which is not habitually occupied by the owner. Another unusual thing. People traveled at that period in England in two ways, by coach at the rate of a shilling for five miles, and by post, paying three half-pence per mile and two pence to the postillion after each stage. A private carriage, whose owner desired to travel by relays, paid as many shillings per horse per mile as the horseman paid pence. The carriage drawn up before the jail in Southwark had four horses and two postillions, which displayed princely state. Finally, that which excited and disconcerted conjectures to the utmost 
was the circumstance that the carriage was sedulously shut up the blinds of the windows were closed up the glasses in front were darkened by blinds every opening by which the eye might have penetrated was masked from without nothing within could be seen and most likely from within nothing could be seen outside however it did not seem probable that there was any one in the carriage southwark being in surrey the prison was within the jurisdiction of the sheriff of the county such distinct jurisdictions were very frequent in england thus for example the tower of london was not supposed to be situated in any county that is to say that legally it was considered to be in air the tower recognized no authority of jurisdiction except in its own constable who was qualified as custos tourists the tower had its jurisdiction its church its court of justice and its government apart the authority of its custos or constable extended beyond london over twenty-one hamlets as in great britain legal singularities engraft one upon another the office of the master gunner of england was derived from the tower of london other legal customs seem still more whimsical thus the english court of admiralty consults and applies the laws of rhodes and of oleron a french island which was once english the sheriff of a county was a person of high consideration he was always an esquire and sometimes a knight he was called spectabilis in the old deeds a man to be looked at kind of intermediate title between illustrious and clarissimus less than the first more than the second long ago the sheriffs of the counties were chosen by the people but edward the second and after him henry the sixth having claimed their nomination for the crown the office of sheriff became a royal emanation they all received their commissions from majesty except the sheriff of westmoreland whose office was hereditary and the sheriffs of london and middlesex who were elected by the livery in the common hall sheriffs of wales and chester possessed certain fiscal prerogatives these appointments are all still in existence in england but subjected little by little to the friction of manners and ideas they have lost their old aspects it was the duty of the sheriff of the county to escort and protect the judges on circuit as we have two arms he had two officers his right arm the under sheriff his left arm the justice of the quorum the justice of the quorum assisted by the bailiff of the hundred termed the wapentake apprehended examined and under the responsibility of the sheriff imprisoned for trial by the judges of circuit thieves murderers rebels vagabonds and all sorts of felons the shade of difference between the under sheriff and the justice of the quorum in their hierarchical service towards the sheriff was that the under sheriff accompanied and the justice of the quorum assisted the sheriff held two courts one fixed and central the county court and a movable court the sheriff's turn he thus represented both unity and ubiquity he might as judge be aided and informed on legal questions by the sergeant of the coif called surgeon's quifa who is a sergeant at law and who wears under his black skull-cap a fillet of white cambrai lawn the sheriff delivered the jails when he arrived at a town in his province he had the right of summary trial of the prisoners of which he might cause either their release or the execution this was called a jail delivery the sheriff presented bills of indictment to the twenty-four members of the grand jury if they approved they wrote above villa vera if the contrary they wrote ignoramus in the latter case the accusation was annulled and the sheriff had the privilege of tearing up the bill if during the deliberation a juror died this legally acquitted the prisoner and made him innocent and the sheriff who had the privilege of arresting the accused had also that of setting him at liberty that which made the sheriff singularly feared and respected 
was that he had the charge of executing all the orders of her majesty a fearful latitude an arbitrary power lodges in such commissions the officers termed vergers the coroners making part of the sheriff's cortege and the clerks of the market as escort with gentlemen on horseback and their servants in livery made a handsome suite the sheriff says chamberlain is the life of justice of law and of the country in england an insensible demolition constantly pulverizes and dissevers laws and customs you must understand in our day that neither the sheriff the wapentake nor the justice of the quorum could exercise their functions as they did then there was in the england of the past a certain confusion of powers whose ill-defined attributes resulted in their overstepping their real bounds at times a thing which would be impossible in the present day the usurpation of power by police and justices has ceased we believe that even the word wapentake has changed its meaning it implied a magisterial function now it signifies a territorial division it specified the centurion it now specifies the hundred centum moreover in those days the sheriff of the county combined with something more and something less and condensed in his own authority which was at once royal and municipal the two magistrates formerly called in france the civil lieutenant of paris and the lieutenant of police the civil lieutenant of paris monsieur is pretty well described in an old police note the civil lieutenant has no dislike to domestic quarrels because he always has the pickings twenty second july seventeen o four as to the lieutenant of police he was a redoubtable person multiple and vague the best personification of him was rene de argenson who as was said by saint simon displayed in his face the three judges of hell united the three judges of hell sat as has already been seen at bishopsgate london End of section three chapter seventy four of the man who laughs by victor hugo this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by william tomko the man who laughs by victor hugo section seventy four part two book the fourth chapter seven shuddering when gwynplaine heard the wicket shut creaking in all its bolts he trembled it seemed to him that the door which had just closed was the communication between light and darkness opening on one side on the living human crowd and on the other on a dead world and now that everything illumined by the sun was behind him that he had stepped over the boundary of life and was standing without it his heart contracted what were they going to do with him what did it all mean where was he he saw nothing around him he found himself in perfect darkness the shutting of the door had momentarily blinded him the window in the door had been closed as well no loophole no lamp such were the precautions of old times it was forbidden to light the entrance to the jails so that newcomers should take no observations gwynplaine extended his arms and touched the wall on the right side and on the left he was in a passage little by little a cavernous daylight exuded no one knows whence and which floats about dark places and to which the dilation of the pupil adjusts itself slowly enabled him to distinguish a feature here and there and the corridor was vaguely sketched out before him gwynplaine who had never had a glimpse of penal severities save in the exaggerations of ursus felt as though seized by a sort of vague gigantic hand to be caught in the mysterious toils of the law is frightful he who is brave in all other dangers is disconcerted in the presence of justice why is it that the justice of man works in twilight and the judge gropes his way gwynplaine remembered what ursus had told him of the necessity for silence he wished to see dea again he felt some discretionary instinct which urged him not to irritate 
Sometimes to wish to be enlightened is to make matters worse. On the other hand, however, the weight of the adventure was so overwhelming that he gave way at length and could not restrain a question. Gentlemen, said he, whither are you taking me? They made no answer. It was a law of silent capture, and Norman text is formal. A silentiarius ostio prepositis introducti sunt. This silence froze Gwynplaine. Up to that moment he had believed himself to be firm. He was self-sufficing. To be self-sufficing is to be powerful. He had lived isolated from the world, and imagined that being alone he was unassailable. And now, all at once, he felt himself under the pressure of a hideous collective force. How was he to combat that horrible anonyma, the law? He felt faint under the perplexity. A fear of an unknown character had found a fissure in his armor. Besides, he had not slept. He had not eaten. He had scarcely moistened his lips with a cup of tea. The whole night had been passed in a kind of delirium, and the fever was still on him. He was thirsty, perhaps hungry. The craving of the stomach disorders everything. Since the previous evening, all kinds of incidents had assailed him. The emotions which had tormented had sustained him. Without the storm, a sail would be a rag. But his was the excessive feebleness of the rag, which the wind inflates till it tears it. He felt himself sinking. Was he about to fall without consciousness on the pavement? To faint is the resource of a woman, and the humiliation of a man. He hardened himself, but he trembled. He felt as one losing his footing. End of section 74 Recording by William Tomko Section 75 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Part 2. Book the Fourth. Chapter 8. Lamentation. They began to move forward. They advanced through the passage. There was no preliminary registry, no place of record. The prisons in those times were not overburdened with documents. They were content to close round you without knowing why. To be a prison and to hold prisoners sufficed. The procession was obliged to lengthen itself out, taking the form of the corridor. They walked almost in single file. First the weapon take, then Gwynplaine, then the justice of the quorum, then the constables, advancing in a group, and blocking up the passage behind Gwynplaine, as with a bung. The passage narrowed. Now Gwynplaine touched the walls with both his elbows. In the roof, which was made of flints dashed with cement, was a succession of granite arches jutting out, and still more contracting the passage. He had to stoop to pass under them. No speed was possible in that corridor. Any one trying to escape through it would have been compelled to move slowly. The passage twisted. All entrails are tortuous, those of a prison as well as those of a man. Here and there, sometimes to the right and sometimes to the left, spaces in the wall, square and closed by large iron gratings, gave glimpses of flights of stairs, some descending and some ascending. They reached a closed door. It opened. They passed through, and it closed again. Then they came to a second door, which admitted them, then to a third, which also turned on its hinges. These doors seemed to open and shut of themselves. No one was to be seen. While the corridor contracted, the roof grew lower, until at length it was impossible to stand upright. Moisture exuded from the wall. Drops of water fell from the vault. The slabs that paved the corridor were clammy as an intestine. The diffused pallor that served as light became more and more a pall. Air was deficient, and what was singularly ominous, the passage was a descent. Close observation was necessary to perceive that there was such a descent. In darkness a gentle declivity is portentous. 
nothing is more fearful than the vague evils to which we are led by imperceptible degrees. It is awful to descend into unknown depths. How long had they proceeded thus? Gwynplaine could not tell. Moments passed under such crushing agony seem immeasurably prolonged. Suddenly they halted. The darkness was intense. The corridor widened somewhat. Gwynplaine heard close to him a noise of which only a Chinese gong could give an idea. Something like a blow struck against the diaphragm of the abyss. It was the wapentake striking his wand against a sheet of iron. That sheet of iron was a door. Not a door on hinges, but a door which was raised and let down. Something like a portcullis. There was a sound of creaking in a groove, and Gwynplaine was suddenly face to face with a bit of square light. The sheet of metal had just been raised into a slit in the vault like the door of a mousetrap. An opening had appeared. The light was not daylight, but glimmer, but on the dilated eyeballs of Gwynplaine the pale and sudden ray struck like a flash of lightning. It was some time before he could see anything. To see with dazzled eyes is as difficult as to see in darkness. At length, by degrees, the pupil of his eye became proportioned to the light, just as it had been proportioned to the darkness, and he was able to distinguish objects. The light, which at first had seemed too bright, settled into its proper hue and became livid. He cast a glance into the yawning space before him, and what he saw was terrible. At his feet were about twenty steps, steep, narrow, worn, almost perpendicular, without balustrade on either side, a sort of stone ridge cut out from the side of a wall into stairs entering and leading into a very deep cell. They reached to the bottom. The cell was round, roofed by an ogee vault with a low arch from the fault of level in the top stone of the frieze, a displacement common to cells under heavy edifices. The kind of hole acting as a door, which the sheet of iron had just revealed, and on which the stairs abutted, was formed in the vault so that the eye looked down from it as into a well. The cell was large, and if it was the bottom of a well it must have been a cyclopean one. The idea that the old word coup de basphos awakens in the mind can only be applied to it if it were the lair of wild beasts. The cell was neither flagged nor paved. The bottom was of that cold, moist earth peculiar to deep places. In the midst of the cell, four low and disproportioned columns sustained a porch heavily ogival, of which the four mouldings united in the interior of the porch something like the inside of a mitre. This porch, similar to the pinnacles under which sarcophagi were formerly placed, rose nearly to the top of the vault and made a sort of central chamber in the cavern, if that could be called a chamber which had only pillars in place of walls. From the key of the arch hung a brass lamp, round and barred like the window of a prison. This lamp threw around it, on the pillars, on the vault, on the circular wall which was seen dimly behind the pillars, a wan light cut by bars of shadow. This was the light which had at first dazzled Gwynplaine, now it threw out only a confused redness. There was no other light in the cell, neither window nor door nor loophole. Between the four pillars, exactly below the lamp, in the spot where there was most light, a pale and terrible form lay on the ground. It was lying on its back. A head was visible, of which the eyes were shut, a body of which the chest was a shapeless mass. Four limbs belonging to the body, in the position of the cross of St. Andrew, were drawn towards the four pillars by four chains, fastened to each foot and each hand. These chains were fastened to an iron ring at the base of each column. The form was held immovable, in the horrible position of being quartered, and had the icy look of a livid corpse. It was naked. It was a man. Gwynplaine, as if petrified, stood at the top of the stairs looking down. Suddenly he heard a rattle in the throat. The corpse was alive. Close to the spectre, 
in one of the ogives of which the door at each side of a great seat which stood on a large flat stone stood two men swathed in long black cloaks and on the seat an old man was sitting dressed in a red robe wan motionless and ominous holding a bunch of roses in his hand the bunch of roses would have enlightened any one less ignorant than gwynplaine the right of judging with a nosegay in his hand implied the holder to be a magistrate at once royal and municipal the lord mayor of london still keeps up the custom to assist the deliberations of the judges was the function of the earliest roses of the season the old man seated on the bench was the sheriff of the county of surrey he was the majestic rigidity of a roman dignitary the bench was the only seat in the cell by the side of it was a table covered with papers and books on which lay the long white wand of the sheriff the men standing by the side of the sheriff were two doctors one of medicine the other of law the latter recognizable by the sergeant's coif over his wig both wore black robes one of the shape worn by judges the other by doctors men of these kinds wear mourning for the deaths of which they are the cause behind the sheriff at the edge of the flat stone under the seat was crouched with a writing-table near to him a bundle of papers on his knees and a sheet of parchment on the bundle a secretary in a round wig with a pen in his hand in the attitude of a man ready to write this secretary was of the class called keeper of the bag as was shown by a bag at his feet these bags in former times employed in law processes were termed bags of justice with folded arms leaning against a pillar was a man entirely dressed in leather the hangman's assistant these men seemed as if they had been fixed by enchantment in their funereal postures round the chained man none of them spoke or moved there brooded over all a fearful calm what gwynplaine saw was a torture chamber there were many such in england the crypt of beecham tower long served this purpose as did also the cell in the lollards prison a place of this nature is still to be seen in london called the vaults of lady place in this last mentioned chamber there is a grate for the purpose of heating the irons all the prisons of king john's time and southwick jail was one had their chambers of torture the scene which is about to follow was in those days a frequent one in england and might even by criminal process be carried out to-day since the same laws are still unrepealed england offers the curious sight of a barbarous code living on the best terms with liberty we confess that they make an excellent family party some distrust however might not be undesirable in the case of a crisis a return to the penal code would not be impossible english legislation is a tamed tiger with a velvet paw but the claws are still there cut the claws of the law and you will do well law almost ignores right on one side is penalty on the other humanity philosophers protest but it will take some time yet before the justice of man is assimilated to the justice of god respect for the law that is the english phrase in england they venerate so many laws that they never repeal any they save themselves from the consequences of their veneration by never putting them into execution an old law falls into disuse like an old woman and they never think of killing either one or the other they cease to make use of them that is all both are at liberty to consider themselves still young and beautiful they may fancy that they are as they were this politeness is called respect norman custom is very wrinkled that does not prevent many an english judge casting sheep's eyes at her they stick amorously to an antiquated atrocity so long as it is norman what can be more savage than the gibbet in eighteen sixty seven a man was sentenced to be cut into four quarters and offered to a woman the queen footnote the fenian burke End footnote. still torture was never practised in england history asserts this as a fact the assurance of history is wonderful 
Matthew of Westminster mentions that the Saxon law, very clement and kind, did not punish criminals by death, and adds that it limited itself to cutting off the nose and scooping out the eyes. That was all. Gwynplaine, scared and haggard, stood at the top of the steps, trembling in every limb. He shuddered from head to foot. He tried to remember what crime he had committed. To the silence of the weapon take had succeeded the vision of torture to be endured. It was a step indeed forward, but a tragic one. He saw the dark enigma of the law under the power of which he felt himself increasing in obscurity. The human form lying on the earth rattled in its throat again. Gwynplaine felt someone touching him gently on his shoulder. It was the weapon take. Gwynplaine knew that meant that he was to descend. He obeyed. He descended the stairs step by step. They were very narrow, each eight or nine inches in height. There was no handrail. The descent required caution. Two steps behind Gwynplaine followed the weapon take, holding up his iron weapon, and at the same interval behind the weapon take, the justice of the quorum. As he descended the steps, Gwynplaine felt an indescribable extinction of hope. There was death in every step. In each one that he descended, there died a ray of the light within him. Growing paler and paler, he reached the bottom of the stairs. The lava lying chained to the four pillars still rattled in its throat. A voice in the shadow said, Approach! It was the sheriff addressing Gwynplaine. Gwynplaine took a step forward. Closer, said the sheriff. The justice of the quorum murmured in the ear of Gwynplaine so gravely that there was solemnity in the whisper, You are before the sheriff of the county of Surrey. Gwynplaine advanced towards the victim extended in the centre of the cell. The weapon take and the justice of the quorum remained where they were, allowing Gwynplaine to advance alone. When Gwynplaine reached the spot under the porch, close to that miserable thing which he had hitherto perceived only from a distance, but which was a living man, his fear rose to terror. The man who was chained there was quite naked, except for that rag so hideously modest which might be called the vine-leaf of punishment, the sicinulum of the Romans and the Christipanos of the Goths, of which the old Gaelic jargon made Kripagni, Christ wore but that shred on the cross. The terror-stricken sufferer whom Gwynplaine now saw seemed a man of about fifty or sixty years of age. He was bald, grisly hairs of beard bristled on his chin, his eyes were closed, his mouth open, every tooth was to be seen, his thin and bony face was like a death's head, his arms and legs were fastened by chains to the four stone pillars in the shape of the letter X. He had on his breast and belly a plate of iron, and on this iron five or six large stones were laid. His rattle was at times a sigh, at times a roar. The sheriff, still holding his bunch of roses, took from the table with the hand which was free his white wand, and standing up said, Obedience to Her Majesty. Then he replaced the wand upon the table. Then in words long drawn as a knell, without a gesture and immovable as the sufferer, the sheriff, raising his voice, said, Man who liest here bound in chains, listen for the last time to the voice of justice. You have been taken from your dungeon and brought to this jail, legally summoned in the usual forms, formalius verbus pressus not regarding to lectures and communications which have been made and which will now be repeated to you. Inspired by a bad and perverse spirit of tenacity, you have preserved silence and refused to answer the judge. This is a detestable license which constitutes among deeds punishable by cashlet the crime and misdemeanour of overseness. The sergeant of the coif on the right of the sheriff interrupted him, and said with an indifference indescribably lugubrious in its effect, Over her Nessa, Laws of Alfred and of Godrun, Chapter the Sixth. 
the sheriff resumed. The law is respected by all except by scoundrels who infest the woods where the hinds bear young. Like one clock striking after another, the sergeant said, Qui faciunt vestum in foresta ubi damoi solent fontanari. He who refuses to answer the magistrate, said the sheriff, is suspected of every vice. He is reputed capable of every evil. The sergeant interposed, Prodigius, devorator, profusus, salax, rufianus, ebriosis, luxuriosis, simulator, consumptor, patrimoni, elio, ambro, et gluto. Every vice, said the sheriff, means every crime. He who confesses nothing confesses everything. He who holds his peace before the questions of the judge is in fact a liar and a parricide. Mendax et parricida, said the sergeant. The sheriff said, Man, it is not permitted to absent oneself by silence. To pretend contumaciousness is a wound given to the law. It is like Diomede wounding a goddess. Taciturnity before a judge is a form of rebellion. Treason to justice is high treason. Nothing is more hateful or rash. He who resists interrogation steals truth. The law has provided for this. For such cases the English have always enjoyed the right of the foss, the fork, and chains. Anglica Charter, year 1088, said the sergeant. Then with the same mechanical gravity he added, Ferum et fossum et furcus cum alius libertatibus. The sheriff continued, Man, forasmuch as you have not chosen to break silence, though of sound mind and having full knowledge in respect of the subject concerning which justice demands an answer, and for as much as you are diabolically refractory, you have necessarily been put to torture, and you have been, by the terms of the criminal statutes, tried by the piene forte et dure. This is what has been done to you, for the law requires that I should fully inform you. You have been brought to this dungeon, you have been stripped of your clothes, you have been laid on your back naked on the ground, your limbs have been stretched and tied to the four pillars of the law, a sheet of iron has been placed on your chest, and as many stones as you can bear have been heaped on your belly. And more, says the law. Plusque, affirmed the sergeant. The sheriff continued, In this situation, and before prolonging the torture, a second summons to answer and to speak has been made you by me, Sheriff of the County of Surrey, and you have satanically kept silent, though under torture, chains, shackles, fetters, and irons. Attachiamenta legalia, said the sergeant. On your refusal and contumacy, said the sheriff, it being right that the obstinacy of the law should equal the obstinacy of the criminal, the proof has been continued according to the edicts and texts. The first day you were given nothing to eat or drink. Hoc est super jejunari, said the sergeant. There was silence. The awful hiss of the man's breathing was heard from under the heap of stones. The sergeant at law completed his quotation. Ade augmentum abstinentiae ciborum diminutione consuentudo britannica art five o four the two men the sheriff and the sergeant alternated nothing could be more dreary than their imperturbable monotony the mournful voice responded to the ominous voice it might be said that the priest and the deacon of punishment were celebrating the savage mass of the law the sheriff resumed. On the first day you were given nothing to eat or drink. On the second day you were given food but nothing to drink. Between your teeth were thrust three mouthfuls of barley bread. 
On the third day they gave you to drink, but nothing to eat. They poured into your mouth at three different times and in three different glasses a pint of water taken from the common sewer of the prison. The fourth day is come. It is to-day. Now, if you do not answer, you will be left here till you die. Justice wills it. The sergeant, ready with his reply, appeared. Mors re homagium espone legi. And while you feel yourself dying miserably, resumed the sheriff, no one will attend to you, even when the blood rushes from your throat, your chin, and your armpits, and every pore from the mouth to the loins. Athro tabola, said the sergeant, et pabu et subhircus et e grugno usque ad cruponum. The sheriff continued, Man, attend to me, because the consequences concern you. If you renounce your execrable silence, and if you confess, you will only be hanged, and you will have a right to the mel de fio, which is a sum of money. Damnum confitian, said the sergeant, habiet le mel de fio, liges ne chapter the twentieth. Which sum, insisted the sheriff, shall be paid in Deutkins, Suskins, and Galahalpins, the only case in which this money is to pass, according to the terms of the statute of abolition, in the third of Henry V, and you will have the right and enjoyment of scortum ante mortem, and then be hanged on the gibbet. Such are the advantages of confession. Does it please you to answer to justice? The sheriff ceased and waited. The prisoner lay motionless. The sheriff resumed, Man, silence is a refuge in which there is more risk than safety. The obstinate man is damnable and vicious. He who is silent before justice is a felon to the crown. Do not persist in this unfilial disobedience. Think of her majesty. Do not oppose our gracious queen. When I speak to you, answer her. Be a loyal subject. The patient rattled in the throat. The sheriff continued. So, after the seventy-two hours of the proof, here we are at the fourth day. Man, this is the decisive day. The fourth day has been fixed by the law for the confrontation. Quarta die frontem ad frontem aduce, growled the sergeant. The wisdom of the law, continued the sheriff, has chosen this last hour to hold what our ancestors called judgment by mortal cold, seeing that it is the moment when men are believed on their yes or their no. The sergeant on the right confirmed his words. Judicium pro fraud mortel quod homines credenti sint per suum ya et per suum no. Charter of King Adelstan, Volume the First, page one hundred and sixty-three. There was a moment's pause. Then the sheriff bent his stern face towards the prisoner. Man who art lying there on the ground. He paused. Man, he cried, do you hear me? The man did not move. In the name of the law, said the sheriff, open your eyes. The man's lids remained closed. The sheriff turned to the doctor, who was standing on his left. Doctor, give your diagnostic. Probe de diagnosticum, said the sergeant. The doctor came down with magisterial stiffness, approached the man, leant over him, put his ear close to the mouth of the sufferer, felt the pulse of the wrist, the armpit, and the thigh, then rose again. Well, said the sheriff. He can still hear, said the doctor. Can he see, inquired the sheriff. The doctor answered, he can see. On a sign from the sheriff, the justice of the quorum and the wapentake advanced. The wapentake placed himself near the head of the patient. The justice of the quorum stood behind Gwynplaine. The doctor retired a step behind the pillars. Then the sheriff, raising the bunch of roses as a priest about to sprinkle holy water, 
called to the prisoner in a loud voice, and became awful. O oh, wretched man, speak! The law supplicates before she exterminates you. You who feign to be mute, remember how mute is the tomb. You who appear deaf, remember that damnation is more deaf. Think of the death which is worse than your present state. Repent! You are about to be left alone in this cell. Listen! You who are my likeness, for I am a man. Listen, my brother, because I am a Christian. Listen, my son, because I am an old man. Look at me, for I am the master of your sufferings, and I am about to become terrible. The terrors of the law make up the majesty of the judge. Believe that I myself tremble before myself. My own power alarms me. Do not drive me to extremities. I am filled by the holy malice of chastisement. Feel, then, wretched man, the salutary and honest fear of justice, and obey me. The hour of confrontation is come, and you must answer. Do not harden yourself in resistance. Do not that which will be irrevocable. Think that your end belongs to me. Half man, half corpse, listen. At least let it not be your determination to expire here, exhausted for hours, days, and weeks, by frightful agonies of hunger and foulness, under the weight of those stones, alone in the cell, deserted, forgotten, annihilated, left as food for the rats and the weasels, gnawed by creatures of darkness while the world comes and goes, buys and sells, whilst carriages roll in the streets above your head. Unless you would continue to draw painful breath without remission in the depths of this despair, grinding your teeth, weeping, blaspheming, without a doctor to appease the anguish of your wounds, without a priest to offer a divine draught of water to your soul. Oh, if only that you may not feel the frightful froth of the sepulchre ooze slowly from your lips, I adjure and conjure you to hear me. I call you to your own aid. Have pity on yourself. Do what is asked of you. Give way to justice. Open your eyes and see if you recognize this man. The prisoner neither turned his head nor lifted his eyelids. The sheriff cast a glance first at the justice of the quorum and then at the wapentake. The justice of the quorum, taking Gwynplaine's hat and mantle, put his hands on his shoulders and placed him in the light by the side of the chained man. The face of Gwynplaine stood out clearly from the surrounding shadow in its strange relief. At the same time, the wapentake bent down, took the man's temples between his hands, turned the inert head towards Gwynplaine, and with his thumbs and his first fingers lifted the closed eyelids. The prisoner saw Gwynplaine. Then, raising his head voluntarily and opening his eyes wide, he looked at him. He quivered as much as a man can quiver with a mountain on his breast, and then cried out, "'Tis he! Yes, tis he!' And he burst into a horrible laugh. "'Tis he!' he repeated. Then his head fell back on the ground, and he closed his eyes again. "'Registrar, take that down,' said the justice. Gwynplaine, though terrified, had, up to that moment, preserved a calm exterior. The cry of the prisoner, "'Tis he!' overwhelmed him completely. The words, "'Registrar, take that down,' froze him. It seemed to him that a scoundrel had dragged him to his fate without his being able to guess why, and that the man's unintelligible confession was closing round him like the clasp of an iron collar. He fancied himself side by side with him in the posts of the same pillory. Gwynplaine lost his footing in his terror and protested. He began to stammer incoherent words in the deep distress of an innocent man, and quivering, terrified, lost, uttered the first random outcries that rose to his mind, and words of agony like aimless projectiles. 
it is not true it was not me i do not know the man he cannot know me since i do not know him i have my part to play this evening what do you want of me i demand my liberty nor is that all why have i been brought to this dungeon are there laws no longer you may as well say at once that there are no laws my lord judge i repeat that it is not i i am innocent of all that can be said i know i am i wish to go away this is not justice there is nothing between this man and me you can find out my life is not hidden up they came and took me away like a thief why did they come like that how could i know the man i am a travelling mountebank who plays farces at fairs and markets i am the laughing man plenty of people have seen me we are staying in Terenzo field i have been earning an honest livelihood these fifteen years i am five-and-twenty i lodge at the tadcaster inn i am called gwynplaine my lord let me out you should not take advantage of the low estate of the unfortunate have compassion on a man who has done no harm who is without protection and without defence you have before you a poor mountebank i have before me said the sheriff lord fermain clancharlie baron clancharlie and hunkerville marquis of corleone in sicily and a peer of england rising and offering his chair to gwynplaine the sheriff added my lord will your lordship deign to seat yourself end of section seventy five recording by john trevithick Section 76 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. K. Neely. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Part 2, Book 5, Chapter 1. THE DURABILITY OF FRAGILE THINGS Destiny sometimes proffers us a glass of madness to drink. A hand is thrust out of the mist, and suddenly hands us the mysterious cup in which is contained the latent intoxication. Gwynplaine did not understand. He looked behind him to see who it was who had been addressed. A sound may be too sharp to be perceptible to the ear, an emotion too acute conveys no meaning to the mind. There is a limit to comprehension as well as to hearing. The wapentake and the justice of the quorum approached Gwynplaine and took him by the arms. He felt himself placed in the chair which the sheriff had just vacated. He let it be done, without seeking an explanation. When Gwynplaine was seated, the justice of the quorum and the wapentake retired a few steps, and stood upright and motionless behind the seat. Then the sheriff placed his bunch of roses on the stone table, put on spectacles which the secretary gave him, drew from the bundles of papers which covered the table a sheet of parchment, yellow, green, torn, and jagged in places, which seemed to have been folded in very small folds, and of which one side was covered with writing. Standing under the light of the lamp, he held the sheet close to his eyes, and in his most solemn tone read as follows, In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, this present day, the twenty-ninth of January, one thousand six hundred and ninetieth year of our Lord, has been wickedly deserted on the desert coast of Portland, with the intention of allowing him to perish, of hunger, of cold, and of solitude, a child, ten years old. That child was sold at the age of two years, by order of His Most Gracious Majesty, King James the Second. That child is Lord Fermain Clancharlie, the only legitimate son of Lord Linnaeus Clancharlie, Baron Clancharlie and Hunkerville, Marquis of Corleone in Sicily, a peer of England, and of Anne Bradshaw his wife, both deceased. That child is the inheritor of the estates and titles of his father. For this reason he was sold, mutilated, disfigured, 
and put out of the way by desire of his most gracious majesty. That child was brought up and trained to be a mountbank at markets and fairs. He was sold at the age of two, after the death of the peer his father, and ten pounds sterling were given to the king as his purchase money, as well as for diverse concessions, tolerations, and immunities. Lord Fermain Clan Charlie, at the age of two years, was bought by me, the undersigned, who write these lines, and mutilated and disfigured by a Fleming of Flanders, called Hard Quinone, who alone is acquainted with the secrets and modes of treatment of Dr. Conquest. The child was destined by us to be a laughing mask, Mascaridens. With this intention, Hardquinone performed on him the operation Bucafissa usque ad aures, which stamps an everlasting laugh upon the face. The child, by means known only to Hardquinone, was put to sleep and made insensible during its performance, knowing nothing of the operation which he underwent. He does not know that he is Lord Clancharlie. He answers to the name of Gwynplaine. This fact is the result of his youth, and the slight powers of memory he could have had when he was bought and sold, being then barely two years old. Hard Quinone is the only person who knows how to perform the operation Book of Fisa, and the said child is the only living subject upon which it has been essayed. The operation is so unique and singular that though after long years this child should have come to be an old man instead of a child, and his black locks should have turned white, he would be immediately recognized by Hardquinone. At the time that I am writing this, Hardquinone, who has perfect knowledge of all the facts, and participated as principal therein, is detained in the prisons of His Highness the Prince of Orange, commonly called King William the Third. Hardquinone was apprehended and seized as being one of the band of Comprachicos, or Chelas. He is imprisoned in the dungeon of Chatham. It was in Switzerland, near the lake of Geneva, between Lausanne and Vevey, in the very house in which his father and mother died, that the child was, in obedience with the orders of the king, sold and given up by the last servant of the deceased Lord Linnaeus, which servant died soon after his master, so that this secret and delicate matter is now unknown to any one on earth, excepting Hardquinone, who is in the dungeon of Chatham, and ourselves, now about to perish. We, the undersigned, brought up and kept for eight years, for professional purposes, the little lord bought by us of the king. Today, flying from England to avoid Hardquinone's ill fortune, our fear of the penal indictments, prohibitions, and fulminations of Parliament has induced us to desert, at nightfall, on the coast of Portland, the said child Gwynplaine, who is Lord Fermain Clan Charlie. Now, we have sworn secrecy to the king, but not to God. Tonight, at sea, overtaken by a violent tempest by the will of Providence, full of despair and distress, kneeling before him who could save our lives, and may, perhaps, be willing to save our souls, having nothing more to hope from men, but everything to fear from God, having for only anchor and resource repentance of our bad actions, resigned to death, and content if divine justice be satisfied, humble, penitent, and beating our breasts, we make this declaration, and confide and deliver it to the furious ocean to use as it best may, according to the will of God. And may the Holy Virgin aid us. Amen. And we attach our signatures. The sheriff interrupted, saying, Here are the signatures, all in different handwritings. And he resumed, Dr. Gernardis Giestamund, Asuncion, a cross, and, at the side of it, Barbara Fermoy, from Tiriff Isle, in the Hebrides, Gaisdora, 
Captain, Jean Great, Jacques Courtours, alias Le Narbonnet, Luc Pierre Capgroup, from the galleys of Mahon. The sheriff, after a pause, resumed, A note written in the same hand as the text and the first signature, and he read, Of the three men comprising the crew, the skipper having been swept off by a wave, there remain but two, and we have signed. Galdaizun, Ave Maria, Thief. The sheriff, interspersing his reading with his own observations, continued, At the bottom of the sheet is written, At sea, on board of the Matatina, Biscay Hooker, from the Gulf des Passages. This sheaf, added the sheriff, is a legal document bearing the mark of King James the Second. On the margin of the declaration, and in the same handwriting, there is this note. The present declaration is written by us on the back of the royal order, which was given us as our receipt we bought the child. Turn the leaf, and the order will be seen. The sheriff turned the parchment, and raised it in his right hand, to expose it to the light. A blank page was seen, if the word blank can be applied to a thing so moldy, and in the middle of the page three words were written, two Latin words, Usu Regis, and a signature, Jeffreys. Usu Regis Jeffreys, said the sheriff, passing from a grave voice to a clear one. Gwynplaine was as a man on whose head a tile falls from the palace of dreams. He began to speak, like one who speaks unconsciously. Gernardus, yes, the doctor, an old, sad-looking man. I was afraid of him. Geistora, captain, that means chief. There were women, Asuncian, and the other. And in the Provençal, his name was Capgaroup. He used to drink out of a flat bottle on which there was a name written in red. Behold it, said the sheriff. He placed on the table something which the secretary had just taken out of the bag. It was a gourd, with handles like ears, covered with wicker. This bottle had evidently seen service, and had sojourned in the water. Shells and seaweed adhered to it. It was encrusted and damascened over with the rust of the ocean. There was a ring of tar round its neck, showing that it had been hermetically sealed. Now it was unsealed and open. They had, however, replaced in the flask a sort of bung made of tarred oakum, which had been used to cork it. It was in this bottle, said the sheriff, that the men about to perish placed the declaration which I have just read. This message addressed to justice has been faithfully delivered by the sea. The sheriff increased the majesty of his tones, and continued, In the same way that Harrow Hill produces excellent wheat, which is turned into fine flour for the royal table, so the sea renders every service in its power to England, and when a nobleman is lost, finds and restores him. Then he resumed, on this flask, as you say, there is a name written in red. He raised his voice, turning to the motionless prisoner. Your name, malefactor, is here. Such are the hidden channels by which truth, swallowed up in the gulf of human actions, floats to the surface. The sheriff took the gourd and turned to the light one of its sides, which had, no doubt, been cleaned for the ends of justice. Between the interstices of wicker was a narrow line of red reed, blackened here and there by the action of water and of time. The reed, notwithstanding some breakages, traced distinctly in the wicker these twelve letters, hard quinone. Then the sheriff, resuming that monotonous tone of voice which resembles nothing else, and which may be termed a judicial accent, turned toward the sufferer. Hard quinone, 
when by us the sheriff this bottle on which is your name was for the first time shown exhibited and presented to you you at once and willingly recognized it as having belonged to you then the parchment being read to you which was contained folded and enclosed within it you would say no more and in the hope doubtless that the lost child would never be recovered and that you would escape punishment you refused to answer as the result of your refusal you have had applied to you the piena forte et dure and the second reading of the said parchment on which is written the declaration and confession of your accomplices was made to you but in vain this is the fourth day and that which is legally set apart for the confrontation, and he who was deserted on the twenty-ninth of January, one thousand six hundred and ninety, having been brought into your presence, your devilish hope has vanished. You have broken silence and recognized your victim. The prisoner opened his eyes, lifted his head, and with a voice strangely resonant of agony, but which had still an indescribable calm mingled with its hoarseness, pronounced in excruciating accents from under the mass of stones, words to pronounce each of which he had to lift that which was like the slab of a tomb placed upon him. He spoke. I swore to keep the secret. I have kept it as long as I could. Men of dark lives are faithful, and hell has its honor. Now... Silence is useless, so be it. For this reason I speak. Well, yes, tis he. We did it between us, the king and I, the king by his will, I by my art. And, looking at Gwynplaine, now laugh for ever. And he himself began to laugh. This second laugh, wilder yet than the first, might have been taken for a sob. The laugh ceased, and the man lay back, his eyelids closed. The sheriff, who had allowed the prisoner to speak, resumed. All of which is placed on record. He gave the secretary time to write, and then said, Hard quinone, by the terms of the law, after confrontation followed by identification, after the third reading of the declarations of your accomplices, since confirmed by your recognition and confession, and after your renewed avowal, you are about to be relieved from these irons, and placed at the good pleasure of Her Majesty, to be hung as plagiary. Plagiary, said the sergeant of the coif, that is to say, a buyer and seller of children, Law of the Visigoths, Seventh Book, Third Chapter Qui puerus windis, plagiarius est tibi nomen. The sheriff placed the parchment on the table, laid down his spectacles, took up the nosegay, and said, End of la piene forte adore. Hardquinon, thank her majesty. By a sign, the justice of the quorum set in motion the man dressed in leather. This man, who was the executioner's assistant, groom of the gibbet, the old charters call him, went to the prisoner, took off the stones, one by one, from his chest, and lifted the plate of iron up, exposing the wretch's crushed sides. Then he freed his wrists and ankle bones from the four chains that fastened him to the pillars. The prisoner, released alike from stones and chains, lay flat on the ground, his eyes closed, his arms and legs apart, like a crucified man taken down from a cross. Hard quinone, said the sheriff, arise. The prisoner did not move. The groom of the gibbet took up a hand and let it go. The hand fell back. The other hand, being raised, fell back likewise. The groom of the gibbet seized one foot and then the other, and the heels fell back on the ground. The fingers remained inert and the toes motionless. 
the naked feet of an extended corpse seem, as it were, to bristle. The doctor approached, and drawing from the pocket of his robe a little mirror of steel, put it to the open mouth of Hardquinone. Then with his fingers he opened the eyelids. They did not close again. The glassy eyeballs remained fixed. The doctor rose up and said, He is dead. And he added, He laughed. That killed him. "'Tis of little consequence,' said the sheriff. "'After confession, life or death is a mere formality.' Then, pointing to Hardquinone by a gesture with the nosegay of roses, the sheriff gave the order to the wapentake, "'A corpse to be carried away to-night.' The wapentake acquiesced by a nod. And the sheriff added, "'The cemetery of the jail is opposite.' The wapentake nodded again. The sheriff, holding in his left hand the nosegay, and in his right the white wand, placed himself opposite Gwynplaine, who was still seated, and made him a low bow. Then assuming another solemn attitude, he turned his head over his shoulder, and looking Gwynplaine in the face, said, To you here present, we, Philip Dinzo Parsons, Knight, Sheriff of the County of Surrey, assisted by Aubrey Dominic Esquire, our clerk and registrar, and by our usual officers, duly provided by the direct and special commands of Her Majesty, in virtue of our commission, and the rights and duties of our charge, and with authority from the Lord Chancellor of England, the affidavits had been drawn up and recorded, regard being had to the documents communicated by the admiralty after verification of attestations and signatures after declarations read and heard after confrontation made all the statements and legal information having been completed exhausted and brought to a good and just issue we signify and declare to you in order that right may be done that you are for Maine Clan Charlie, Baron Clan Charlie and Hunkerville, Marquis de Corleone in Sicily, and a peer of England, and God keep your lordship. And he bowed to him. The sergeant on the right, the doctor, the justice of the quorum, the wapentake, the secretary, all the attendants except the executioner, repeated his salutation still more respectfully, and bowed to the ground before Gwynplaine. Ah, said Gwynplaine, awake me. And he stood up, pale as death. I come to awake you indeed, said a voice which had not yet been heard. A man came out from behind the pillars, as no one had entered the cell since the sheet of iron had given passage to the cortege of police, it was clear that this man had been there in the shadow before Gwynplaine had entered, that he had a regular right of attendance, and had been presented by appointment and mission. The man was fat and pursy, and wore a court wig and a travelling cloak. He was rather old and young, and very precise. He saluted Gwynplaine with ease and respect, with the ease of a gentleman in waiting, and without the awkwardness of a judge. Yes, he said, I have come to awaken you. For twenty-five years you have slept. You have been dreaming. It is time to awake. You believe yourself to be Gwynplaine. You are Clan Charlie. You believe yourself to be one of the people. You belong to the peerage. You believe yourself to be one of the lowest rank. You are of the highest. You believe yourself a player. You are a senator. You believe yourself poor. You are wealthy. You believe yourself to be of no account. You are important. Awake, my lord. Gwynplaine, in a low voice, in which a tremor of fear was to be distinguished, murmured, What does it all mean? It means, my lord, said the fat man, 
that I am called Barclfajo, that I am an officer of the Admiralty, that this waif, the flask of hard quinone, was found on the beach, and was brought to be unsealed by me, according to the duty and prerogative of my office, that I opened it in the presence of two sworn jurors of the Jetsam office, both members of Parliament, William Brathwaite, from the city of Bath, and Thomas Jeroy, for Southampton, that the two jurors deciphered and attested the contents of the flask, and signed the necessary affidavit conjointly with me, that I made my report to Her Majesty, and by order of the Queen all necessary and legal formalities were carried out with the discretion necessary in a matter so delicate, that the last form, the confrontation, has just been carried out, that you have forty thousand pounds a year, that you are a peer of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, a legislator and a judge, a supreme judge, a sovereign legislator, dressed in purple and ermine, equal to princes, like unto emperors, that you have on your brow the coronet of a peer, and that you are about to wed a duchess, the daughter of a king. Under this transfiguration, overwhelming him like a series of thunderbolts, Gwynplaine fainted. End of section 76 Recording by J. K. Neely of Texas Section 77 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. K. Neely. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Part Two, Book Five, Chapter Two. The Waif Knows Its Own Course. All this had occurred owing to the circumstance of a soldier having found a bottle on the beach. We will relate the facts. In all facts, there are wheels within wheels. One day one of the four gunners composing the garrison of Castle Calshore picked up on the sand at low water a flask covered with wicker which had been cast up by the tide. This flask, covered with mould, was corked by a tarred bung. The soldier carried the waif to the colonel of the castle, and the colonel sent it to the High Admiral of England. The Admiral meant the Admiralty. With waifs, the Admiralty meant Barclfedro. Barclfedro, having uncorked and emptied the bottle, carried it to the queen. The queen immediately took the matter into consideration. Two weighty counsellors were instructed and consulted, namely the Lord Chancellor, who is by law the guardian of the king's conscience, and the Lord Marshal, who is referee in heraldry and in the pedigrees of the nobility. Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, a Catholic peer, who is hereditary Earl Marshal of England, had sent word by his deputy Earl Marshal, Henry Howard, Earl Bindon, that he would agree with the Lord Chancellor. The Lord Chancellor was William Cowper. We must not confound this Chancellor with his namesake and contemporary William Cowper, the anatomist and commentator on Bidloo, who published a treatise on muscles in England at the very time that Etienne Abiel published A History of Bones in France. A surgeon is a very different thing from a lord. Lord William Cowper is celebrated for having, with reference to the affair of Talbot Yelverton, Viscount Longueville, propounded this opinion, that in the English constitution the restoration of a peer is more important than the restoration of a king, the flask found at Calshore had awakened his interest in the highest degree. The author of a maxim delights in opportunities to which it may be applied. Here was a case of the restoration of a peer. Search was made. Gwynplaine, by the inscription over his door, was soon found. Neither was Hardquinone dead. A prison rots a man, but preserves him if to keep is to preserve. 
people placed in Bastille were rarely removed. There is little more chance in the dungeon than in the tomb. Hardquinone was still in prison at Chatham. They had only to put their hands on him. He was transferred from Chatham to London. In the meantime, information was sought in Switzerland. The facts were found to be correct. They obtained from the local archives at Vevey, at Lausanne, the certificate of Lord Linnaeus's marriage and exile, the certificate of his child's birth, the certificate of the decease of the father and mother, and they had duplicates, duly authenticated, made to answer all necessary requirements. All this was done with the most rigid secrecy, with what is called royal promptitude, and with that mole-like silence recommended and practiced by Bacon, and later on made law by Blackstone, for affairs connected with the chancellorship and the state, and in matters termed parliamentary. The Yusu Regis and the signature Jeffreys were authenticated. To those who have studied pathologically the cases of caprice called our good will and pleasure, this Yusu Regis is very simple. Why should James the Second, whose credit required the concealment of such acts, have allowed that to be written which endangered their success? The answer is cynicism, haughty indifference. Oh, you believe that effrontery is confined to abandoned women? The reason they taught is equally abandoned et sucupits ante videri, to commit a crime and emblazon it, there is the sum total of history, King tattoos himself like the convict. Often, when it would be to a man's greatest advantage to escape from the hands of the police or the records of history, he would seem to regret the escaped, so great is the love of notoriety. Look at my arm. Observe the design. I am Lacanaire. See, a temple of love and a burning heart pierced through with an arrow. Yusu Regis. It is I, James the Second. A man commits a bad action and places his mark upon it. To fill up the measure of crime by effrontery, to denounce himself, to cling to his misdeeds, is the insolent bravado of the criminal. Christina sees Monaldeschi, had him confessed and assassinated, and said, I am the Queen of Sweden, in the palace of the King of France. There is the tyrant who conceals himself, like Tiberius, and the tyrant who displays himself, like Philip the Second. One has the attributes of the scorpion, the other those rather of the leopard. James the Second was of this latter variety. He had, we know, a gay and open countenance, differing so far from Philip, Philip was sullen, James jovial. Both were equally ferocious. James the Second was an easy-minded tiger. Like Philip the Second, his crimes lay light upon his conscience. He was a monster by the grace of God. Therefore he had nothing to dissimulate nor to extenuate, and his assassinations were by divine right. He, too, would not have minded leaving behind him those archives of Simancas, with all his misdeeds dated, classified, labelled, and put in order, each in its compartment, like poisons in the cabinet of a chemist. To set the sign manual to crimes is right royal. Every deed done is a draft drawn on the great invisible paymaster. A bill had just come due with the ominous endorsement, Yusu Regis. Queen Anne, in one particular, unfeminine, seeing that she could keep a secret, demanded a confidential report of so grave a matter from the Lord Chancellor, one of the kind specified as report to the royal ear. Reports of this kind have been common in all monarchies. At Vienna there was a counselor of the ear, an aulic dignitary. It was an ancient Carlovingian office, the auricularius of the old palatine deeds, he who whispers to the emperor. William, Baron Cowper, Chancellor of England, whom the queen believed in because he was short-sighted like herself, or even more so, 
had committed to writing a memorandum commencing thus. Two birds were subject to Solomon, a lapwing, the hudbud, who could speak all languages, and an eagle, the Simarganka, who covered with the shadow of his wings a caravan of twenty thousand men. Thus, under another form, providence, etc. The Lord Chancellor proved the fact that the heir to a peerage had been carried off, mutilated, and then restored. He did not blame James the Second, who was, after all, the Queen's father. He even went so far as to justify him. First, there are ancient monarchical maxims. E senioratu eripimus, in retiragio cadat. Secondly, there is a royal right of mutilation. Chamberlain asserts the fact. Corpora et bona nostrorum subiectorum nostra sunt, said James I, of glorious and learned memory. The eyes of dukes of the blood royal have been plucked out for the good of the kingdom. Certain princes, too near to the throne, have been conveniently stifled between mattresses, the cause of death being given out as apoplexy. Now, to stifle is worse than to mutilate. The king of Tunis tore out the eyes of his father, Uli Asim, and his ambassadors have not been the less favorably received by the emperor. Hence the king may order the suppression of a limb like the suppression of a state, etc. It is legal. But one law does not destroy another. If a drowned man is cast up by the water, and is not dead, it is an act of God readjusting one of the king. If the heir be found, let the coronet be given back to him. Thus was it done for Lord Allah, king of Northumberland, who was also a mountbank. Thus should be done to Gwynplaine, who is also a king, seeing that he is a peer. The lowness of the occupation which has been obliged to follow, under constraint of superior power, does not tarnish the blazon. As in the case of Abdul Mumin, who was a king, although he had been a gardener, that of Joseph, who was a saint, although he had been a carpenter, that of Apollo, who was a god, although he had been a shepherd. In short, the learned chancellor concluded by advising the reinstatement, in all his estates and dignities, of Lord Fermain Clan Charlie, miscalled Gwynplaine, on the sole condition that he should be confronted with the criminal Hardquinone, and identified by the same. And on this point the Chancellor, as constitutional keeper of the royal conscience, based the royal decision. The Lord Chancellor added in a postscript that if Hardquinone refused to answer, he should be subjected to the Piena Forte at Dore, until the period called the Fraud Mortel, according to the statute of King Athelstain, which orders the confrontation to take place on the fourth day. In this there is a certain inconvenience, for if the prisoner dies on the second or third day, the confrontation becomes difficult. Still, the law must be obeyed. The inconvenience of the law makes part and parcel of it. In the mind of the Lord Chancellor, however, the recognition of Gwynplaine by Hard Quinone was indubitable. And, having been made aware of the deformity of Gwynplaine, and not wishing to wrong her sister, on whom had been bestowed the estates of Clan Charlie, graciously decided that the Duchess Josiana should be espoused by the new lord, that is to say, by Gwynplaine. The reinstatement of Lord Fermain Clan Charlie was, moreover, a very simple affair, the heir being legitimate, and in the direct line. In cases of doubtful descent, and of peerages in abeyance claimed by collaterals, the House of Lords must be consulted. This, to go no farther back, was done in 1782, in the case of the Barony of Sydney, claimed by Elizabeth Perry, in 1798, in that of the Barony of Beaumont, claimed by Thomas Stapleton, in 1803, in that of the Barony of Chandos, claimed by the Reverend Timewell Bridges, in 1813, in that of the Earldom of Banbury,
claimed by General Nollies, etc., etc. But the present was no similar case. Here there was no pretense for litigation. The legitimacy was undoubted, the right clear and certain. There was no point to submit to the House, and the Queen, assisted by the Lord Chancellor, had power to recognize and admit the new peer. Barclay managed everything. The affair, thanks to him, was kept so close, the secret was so hermetically sealed, that neither Josiana nor Lord David caught sight of the fearful abyss which was being dug under them. It was easy to deceive Josiana, entrenched as she was behind a rampart of pride. She was self-isolated. As to Lord David, they sent him to sea, off the coast of Flanders. He was going to lose his peerage, and had no suspicion of it. One circumstance is noteworthy. It happened that at six leagues from the anchorage of the naval station commanded by Lord David, a captain called Halliburton broke through the French fleet. The Earl of Pembroke, president of the council, proposed that this Captain Halliburton should be made vice-admiral, and struck out Halliburton's name, and put Lord David Dirimois in its place, that he might, when no longer appear, had the satisfaction of being a vice-admiral. Anne was well pleased. A hideous husband for her sister, and a fine step for Lord David. Mischief and kindness combined. Her Majesty was going to enjoy a comedy. Besides, she argued to herself, that she was repairing an abuse of power committed by her august father. She was reinstating a member of the peerage, she was acting like a great queen. She was protecting innocence according to the will of God, that providence in its holy and impenetrable ways, etc., etc. It is very sweet to do a just action which is disagreeable to those whom we do not like. To know that the future husband of her sister was deformed sufficed the queen. In what manner Gwynplaine was deformed, and by what kind of ugliness, Barclay had not communicated to the Queen, and Anne had not deigned to inquire. She was proudly and royally disdainful. Besides, what could it matter? The House of Lords could not but be grateful. The Lord Chancellor, its oracle, had approved. To restore a peer is to restore the peerage. Royalty on this occasion had shown itself a good and scrupulous guardian of the privileges of the peerage. Whatever might be the face of the new lord, a face cannot be urged in objection to a right. Anne said all this to herself, or something like it, and went straight to her object, an object at once grand, womanlike, and regal, namely, to give herself a pleasure. The queen was then at Windsor, a circumstance which placed a certain distance between the intrigues of the court and the public. Only such persons as were absolutely necessary to the plan were in the secret of what was taking place. As to Barclay he was joyful, a circumstance which gave a lugubrious expression to his face. If there be one thing in the world which can be more hideous than another, tis joy. He had had the delight of being the first to taste the contents of Hardquinone's flask. He seemed but little surprised astonishment is the attribute of a little mind. Besides, was it not all due to him, who had waited so long on duty at the gate of chance? Knowing how to wait, he had fairly won his reward. This nil admirari was an expression of face. At heart we may admit that he was very much astonished, any one who could have lifted the mask with which he covered his inmost heart, even before God, would have discovered this, that at the very time Barclay had begun to feel finally convinced that it would be impossible, even to him, the intimate and most infinitesimal enemy of Josiana, to find a vulnerable point in her lofty life. Hence an access of savage animosity lurked in his mind. He had reached the paroxysm which is called discouragement. He was all the more furious, because despairing. To gnaw one's chain, 
how tragic and appropriate the expression a villain gnawing at his own powerlessness barkilphedro was perhaps just on the point of renouncing not his desire to do evil to josiana but his hope of doing it not the rage but the effort but how degrading to be thus baffled to keep hate thenceforth in a case like a dagger in a museum how bitter the humiliation all at once to a certain goal chance immense and universal loves to bring such coincidences about the flask of hard quinone came driven from wave to wave into barkilphedro's hands there is in the unknown an indescribable fealty which seems to be at the beck and call of evil barkilphedro assisted by two chance witnesses disinterested jurors of the admiralty uncorked the flask found the parchment unfolded read it what words could express his devilish delight it is strange to think that the sea the wind space the ebb and flow of the tide storms calms breezes should have given themselves so much trouble to bestow happiness on a scoundrel that cooperation had continued for fifteen years mysterious efforts during fifteen years the ocean had never for an instant ceased from its labors the waves transmitted from one to another the floating bottle the shelving rocks had shunned the brittle glass no crack had yawned in the flask no friction had displaced the cork the seaweeds had not rotted the osier the shells had not eaten out the word hard quinone the water had not penetrated into the waif the mould had not rotted the parchment the wet had not effaced the writing what trouble the abyss must have taken thus that which gernardus had flung into darkness darkness had handed back to barkilphedro the message sent to god had reached the devil space had committed an abuse of confidence and a lurking sarcasm which mingles with events had so arranged that it had complicated the loyal triumph of the lost child's becoming lord clan charlie with a venomous victory in doing a good action it had mischievously placed justice at the service of iniquity to save the victim of james the second was to give a prey to barkilphedro to reinstate gwynplaine was to crush josiana barkilphedro had succeeded and it was for this that for so many years the waves, the surge, the squalls had buffeted, shaken, thrown, pushed, tormented, and respected this bubble of glass which bore within it so many commingled fates. It was for this that there had been a cordial cooperation between the winds, the tides, and the tempests, a vast agitation of all prodigies for the pleasure of a scoundrel the infinite cooperating with an earthworm destiny is subject to such grim caprices barkilphedro was struck by a flash of titanic pride he said to himself that it had all been done to fulfil his intentions he felt that he was the object and the instrument but he was wrong let us clear the character of chance such was not the real meaning of the remarkable circumstance of which the hatred of Barkilphedro was to profit. Ocean had made itself father and mother to an orphan, had sent the hurricane against his executioners, had wrecked the vessel which had repulsed the child, had swallowed up the clasped hands of the storm-beaten sailors, refusing their supplications and accepting only their repentance. The tempest received a deposit from the hands of death, the strong vessel containing the crime was replaced by the fragile file containing the reparation the sea changed its character and like a panther turning nurse began to rock the cradle not of the child but of his destiny whilst he grew up ignorant of all that the depths of the ocean were doing for him the waves to which this flask had been flung watching over that past which contained a future 
the whirlwind breathing kindly on it, the currents directing the frail waif across the fathomless wastes of water, the caution exercised by seaweed, the swells, the rocks, the vast froth of the abyss, taking under its protection an innocent child, the wave imperturbable as a conscience, chaos re-establishing order, the world-wide shadows ending in radiance, darkness employed to bring to light the star of truth, the exile consoled in his tomb, the heir given back to his inheritance, the crime of the king repaired, divine premeditation obeyed, the little, the weak, the deserted child, with infinity for a guardian. All this Barclay might have seen in the event on which he triumphed. This is what he did not see. He did not believe that it had all been done for Gwynplaine. He fancied that it had been effected for Barclay and that he was well worth the trouble. Thus it is ever with Satan. Moreover, ere we feel astonished that a waif so fragile should have floated for fifteen years undamaged, we should seek to understand the tender care of the ocean. Fifteen years is nothing. On the 4th of October, 1867, on the coast of Morbihan, between the Isle de Croix, the extremity of the peninsula de Gavres, and the Rocher de Arantes, the fishermen of Port Louis found a Roman amphora of the fourth century, covered with arabesques by the incrustations of the sea. That amphora had been floating fifteen hundred years. Whatever appearance of indifference Barclay tried to exhibit, his wonder had equaled his joy. Everything he could desire was there to his hand. All seemed ready-made. The fragments of the event which was to satisfy his hate were spread out within his reach. He had nothing to do but to pick them up and fit them together, a repair which it was an amusement to execute. He was the artificer. Gwynplaine. He knew the name. Mascaridens. Like everyone else, he had been to see the laughing man. He had read the sign nailed up against the Tadcaster Inn as one reads a playbill that attracts a crowd. He had noted it. He remembered it directly in its most minute details, and, in any case, it was easy to compare them with the original. That notice, and the electrical summons which arose in his memory, appeared in the depths of his mind, and placed itself by the side of the parchment signed by the shipwrecked crew, like an answer following a question, like the solution following an enema. And the lines, Here is to be seen Gwynplaine, deserted at the age of ten, on the twenty-ninth of January, 1690, on the coast at Portland, suddenly appeared to his eyes in the splendor of an apocalypse. His vision was the light of Mene Tekel Upharsin, outside a booth. Here was the destruction of the edifice which made the existence of Josiana. A sudden earthquake. The lost child was found. There was a Lord Clan Charlie. David Derrymois was nobody. Peerage, riches, power, rank, all these things left Lord David and entered Gwynplaine. All the castles, parks, forests, townhouses, palaces, domains, Josiana included, belonged to Gwynplaine. And what a climax for Josiana! What had she now before her? Illustrious and haughty, a player, beautiful, a monster. Who could have hoped for this? The truth was that the joy of Barclay had become enthusiastic. The most hateful combinations are surpassed by the infernal munificence of the unforeseen. When reality likes, it works masterpieces. Barclay found that all his dreams had been nonsense. Reality were better. The change he was about to work would not have seemed less desirable had it been detrimental to him. Insects exist which are so savagely disinterested that they sting, 
knowing that to sting is to die. Barcalfedro was like such vermin. But this time he had not the merit of being disinterested. Lord David Dirimois owed him nothing, and Lord Fermain Clan Charlie was about to owe him everything. From being a protégé, Barcalfedro was about to become a protector. Protector of whom? Of a peer of England. He was going to have a lord of his own, and a lord who would become his creature. Barcalfedro counted on giving him his first impressions. His peer would be the morganatic brother-in-law of the queen. His ugliness would please the queen in the same proportions as it displeased Josiana. Advancing by such favor, and assuming grave and modest airs, Barcalfedro might become a somebody. He had always been destined for the church. He had a vague longing to be a bishop. Meanwhile, he was happy. Oh, what a great success! And what a deal of useful work had chance accomplished for him! His vengeance, for he called it his vengeance, had been softly brought to him by the waves. He had not lain in ambush in vain. He was the rock, Josiana was the waif. Josiana was about to be dashed against Sparkle Phaedro, to his intense villainous ecstasy. He was clever in the art of suggestions, which consists in making, in the minds of others, a little incision into which you put an idea of your own. Holding himself aloof, and without appearing to mix himself up in the matter, it was he who arranged that Josiana should go to the green box and see Gwynplaine. It could do no harm. The appearance of the mountbank, in his low estate, would be a good ingredient in the combination. Later on it would season it. He had quietly prepared everything beforehand. What he most desired was something unspeakably abrupt. The work on which he was engaged could only be expressed in these strange words, the construction of a thunderbolt. All preliminaries being complete, he had watched till all the necessary legal formalities had been accomplished. The secret had not oozed out, silence being an element of law. The confrontation of Hardquinone with Gwynplaine had taken place. Barcalfedro had been present. We have seen the result. The same day, a post-chaise belonging to the royal household was suddenly sent by Her Majesty to fetch Lady Josiana from London to Windsor, where the Queen was at the time residing. Josiana, for reasons of her own, would have been very glad to disobey, or at least to delay obedience, and put off her departure till next day, but court life does not permit of these objections. She was obliged to set out at once, and to leave her residence in London, Hunkerville House, for her residence at Windsor, Corleone Lodge. The Duchess Josiana left London at the very moment that the wapentake appeared at the Tadcaster Inn to arrest Gwynplaine and take him to the torture cell of Southwark. When she arrived at Windsor, the usher of the Black Rod, who guards the door of the presence chamber, informed her that Her Majesty was in audience with the Lord Chancellor, and could not receive her until the next day, that, consequently, she was to remain at Corleone Lodge, at the orders of Her Majesty, and that she should receive the Queen's commands direct, when Her Majesty awoke the next morning. Josiana entered her house feeling very spiteful, supped in a bad humor, had the spleen, dismissed every one except her page, then dismissed him, and went to bed while it was yet daylight. When she arrived, she had learned that Lord David Dirimois was expected at Windsor the next day, owing to his having, whilst at sea, received orders to return immediately and receive Her Majesty's commands. End of section 77 Recording by J.K. Neely of Texas Section 78 of The Man Who Loves by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rim. The Man Who Loves by Victor Hugo. Part 2. Book the Fifth. Chapter 3. An Awakening. No man could pass suddenly from Siberia to Senegal without losing consciousness. Humboldt. The swoon of a man, even of one the most firm and energetic, under the sudden shock of an unexpected stroke of good fortune, is nothing wonderful. A man is knocked down by the unforeseen blow, like an ox by the pole axe. Francis d'Albescola, he who tore from the Turkish ports their iron chains, remained a whole day without consciousness when they made him pope. Now, the stride from a cardinal to a pope is less than that from a mountebank to a peer of England. No shock is so violent as a loss of equilibrium. When Gwynplaine came to himself and opened his eyes, it was night. He was in an armchair, in the midst of a large chamber, lined throughout with purple velvet, over walls, ceiling, and floor. The carpet was velvet. Standing near him, with uncovered head, was the fat man in the travelling cloak, who had emerged from behind the pillar in the cell at Southwark. Gwynplaine was alone in the chamber with him. From the chair, by extending his arms, he could reach two tables, each bearing a branch of six lighted wax candles. On one of these tables there were papers and a casket. On the other, refreshments, a cold fowl, wine, and brandy, served on a silver gilt silver. Through the panes of a high window, reaching from the ceiling to the floor, a semicircle of pillars was to be seen in the clear April night, encircling a courtyard with three gates, one very wide and the other two low. The carriage gate of great size was in the middle, on the right that for equestrian, smaller, on the left that for foot passengers, stillness. These gates were formed of iron railings with glittering points. A tall piece of sculpture surmounted the central one. The columns were probably in white marble, as well as the pavement of the course, thus producing an effect like snow. And framed in its sheet of flat flags was a mosaic, the pattern of which was vaguely marked in the shadow. This mosaic, when seen by daylight, would no doubt have disclosed to the sight, with much unblazonry and many colors, a gigantic coat of arms in the Florentine fashion. Zigzags of balustrades rose and fell, indicating stairs of terraces. Over the court frowned an immense pile of architecture, now shadowy and vague in the starlight. Intervals of sky, full of stars, marked out clearly the outline of the palace. An enormous roof could be seen with the gable ends bolted, garret windows, roofed over like visors, chimneys like towers, and antiblators covered with motionless gods and goddesses. Beyond the colonnade there played in the shadow one of those fairy fountains in which, as the water falls from basin to basin, it combines the beauty of rain with that of the cascade, and as if scattering the contents of a jewel box, flings to the wind its diamonds and its pearls, as though to divert the statues around. Long rows of windows ranged away, separated by panoplies in relievo, and by busts on small pedestals. On the pinnacles, trophies and morions, with plumes cut in stone alternated with statues of heathen deities. In the chamber where Gwynplaine was, on the side opposite the window, was a fireplace as high as the ceiling, and on another under a day, one of those old spacious feudal beds which were reached by a ladder, and where you might sleep lying across. 
The giant stool of the bed was at its side. A row of armchairs by the walls and a row of ordinary chairs in front of them completed the furniture. The ceiling was domed. A great wood fire in the French fashion blazed in the fireplace. By the richness of the flames, variegated of rose color and green, a judge of such things would have seen that the wood was ash, a great luxury. The room was so large that the branches of candles failed to light it up. Here and there, curtains of her doors, falling and swaying, indicated communications with other rooms. The style of the room was altogether that of the reign of James I, a style square and massive, antiquated and magnificent. Like the carpet and the lining of the chamber, the day, the baldaquin, the bed, the stool, the curtains, the mantelpiece, the coverings of the table, the sofas, the chairs, were all of purple velvet. There was no gilding except on the ceiling. Laid on it, at equal distance from the four angles, was a huge round shield of embossed metal, on which sparkled, in dazzling relief, various coats of arms. Amongst the devices, on two blazons, Side by side were to be distinguished the cap of a baron and the coronet of a marquis. Were they of brass or for a silver gilt? You could not tell. They seemed to be of gold. And in the center of this lordly ceiling, like a gloomy and magnificent sky, the gleaming escutcheon was as the dark splendor of a sun shining in the night. The savage, in whom is embodied the free man, is nearly as restless in a palace as in a prison. This magnificent chamber was depressing. So much splendor produces fear. Who could be the inhabitant of this stately palace? To what colossus did all this candor appertain? Of what lion is this the lair? Gwynplaine, as yet but half awake, was heavy at heart. Where am I? he said. The man who was standing before him answered, You are in your own house, my lord. End of section 78 Recording by Rim, Paris, France Section 79 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Section 79, Part 2, Book the Fifth, Chapter 4, Fascination. It takes time to rise to the surface and Gwynplaine had been thrown into an abyss of stupefaction. We do not gain our footing at once in unknown depths. There are routs of ideas as there are routs of armies. The rally is not immediate. We feel as it were scattered, as though some strange evaporation of self were taking place. God is the arm. Chance is the sling. Man is the pebble. How are you to resist once flung? Gwynplaine, if we may coin the expression, ricocheted from one surprise to another. After the love letter of the Duchess came the revelation in the Southwark dungeon. In destiny, when wonders begin, prepare yourself for blow upon blow. The gloomy portals once open, prodigies pour in. A breach once made in the wall, and events rush upon us pell-mell. The marvelous never comes singly. The marvelous is an obscurity. The shadow of this obscurity was over Gwynplaine. What was happening to him seemed unintelligible. He saw everything through the mist which a deep commotion leaves in the mind, like the dust caused by a falling ruin. The shock had been from top to bottom. Nothing was clear to him. However, light always returns by degrees. The dust settles. Moment by moment, the density of astonishment decreases. Gwynplaine was like a man with his eyes open and fixed in a dream, as if trying to see what may be within it. He dispersed the mist. Then he reshaped it. He had intermittences of wandering. 
he underwent that oscillation of the mind in the unforeseen which alternately pushes us in the direction in which we understand and then throws us back in that which is incomprehensible who has not at some time felt this pendulum in his brain by degrees his thoughts dilated in the darkness of the event as the pupil of his eye had done in the underground shadows at southwark the difficulty was to succeed in putting a certain space between accumulated sensations before that combustion of hazy ideas called comprehension can take place air must be admitted between the emotions there air was wanting the event so to speak could not be breathed in entering that terrible cell at southwark gwynplaine had expected the iron collar of a felon they had placed on his head the coronet of a peer how could this be there had not been space of time enough between what gwynplaine had feared and what had really occurred it had succeeded too quickly his terror changing into other feelings too abruptly for comprehension the contrasts were too tightly packed one against the other gwynplaine made an effort to withdraw his mind from the vice he was silent this is the instinct of great stupefaction which is more on the defensive than it is thought to be who says nothing is prepared for everything a word of yours allowed to drop may be seized in some unknown system of wheels and your utter destruction be compassed in its complex machinery the poor and weak live in terror of being crushed the crowd ever expect to be trodden down gwynplaine had long been one of the crowd a singular state of human uneasiness can be expressed by the words let us see what will happen gwynplaine was in this state you feel that you have not gained your equilibrium when an unexpected situation surges up under your feet you watch for something which must produce a result you are vaguely attentive we will see what happens what you do not know whom you watch the man with the paunch repeated you are in your own house my lord gwynplaine felt himself in surprises we first look to make sure that things exist then we feel ourselves to make sure that we exist ourselves it was certainly to him that the words were spoken but he himself was somebody else he no longer had his jacket on or his esclavine of leather he had a waistcoat of cloth of silver and a satin coat which he touched and found to be embroidered he felt a heavy purse in his waistcoat pocket a pair of velvet trunk hose covered his clown's tights he wore shoes with high red heels as they had brought him to this place so had they changed his dress the man resumed will your lordship begin to remember this i am called barkilfedro i am clerk to the admiralty it was I who opened Hard Quinone's flask and drew your destiny out of it. Thus, in the Arabian Nights, a fisherman releases a giant from a bottle. Gwynplaine fixed his eyes on the smiling face of the speaker. Barkilfedro continued, Besides this palace, my lord, Hunkerville House, which is larger, is yours. You own Clan Charlie Castle, from which you take your title, and which was a fortress in the time of Edward the Elder. You have nineteen bailiwicks belonging to you, with their villages and their inhabitants. This puts under your banner, as a landlord and a nobleman, about eighty thousand vassals and tenants. At Clan Charlie you are a judge, judge of all, both of goods and of persons, and you hold your baron's court. The king has no right which you have not, except the privilege of coining money. The king designated by the norman law as chief seigneur has justice court and coin coin is money so that you expecting in this last are as much a king in your lordship as he is in his kingdom you have the right as a baron to a gibbet with four pillars in england and as a marquis to a scaffold with seven posts in sicily that of the mere lord having two pillars that of a lord of the manor three and that of a duke eight you are styled prince in the ancient charters of Northumberland. You are related to the Viscounts Valentia in Ireland, whose name is Power, and to the Earls of Umfraville in Scotland, whose name is Angus. You are chief of a clan like Campbell, Ardmanac, and Macklemore. You have eight barons' courts, Reculver, Baston, Hellcurters, Humble, Moracam, Grundraith, Trenwardraith, and others. 
You have a right over the turf cutting of Pillinmore, and over the alabaster quarries near Trent. Moreover, you own all the country of Penneth Chase, and you have a mountain with an ancient town on it. The town is called Vine Conton. The mountain is called Moylanley, all which gives you an income of forty thousand pounds a year. That is to say, forty times the five and twenty thousand francs with which a Frenchman is satisfied. Whilst Barkilphedro spoke, Gwynplaine, in a crescendo of stupor, remembered the past. Memory is a gulf that a word can move to its lowest depths. Gwynplaine knew all the words pronounced by Barkilphedro. They were written in the last lines of the two scrolls which lined the van in which his childhood had been passed, and, from so often letting his eyes wander over them mechanically, he knew them by heart. On reaching a forsaken orphan, the travelling caravan at Weymouth, he had found the inventory of the inheritance which awaited him, and in the morning, when the poor little boy awoke, the first thing spelt by his careless and unconscious eyes was his own title and his possessions. It was a strange detail added to all his other surprises, that during fifteen years, rolling from highway to highway, the clown of a travelling theatre, earning his bread day by day, picking up farthings, and living on crumbs, he should have travelled with the inventory of his fortune placarded over his misery. Barkilphedro touched the casket on the table with his forefinger. My lord, this casket contains two thousand guineas, which Her Gracious Majesty the Queen has sent you for your present wants. Gwynplaine made a movement. That shall be for my father Ursus, he said. So be it, my lord, said Berkelphedro. Ursus, at the Tadcaster Inn, the sergeant of the coif, who accompanied us hither, and is about to return immediately, will carry them to him. Perhaps I may go to London myself. In that case I will take charge of it. I shall take them to him myself, said Gwynplaine. Barkilphedro smile disappeared, and he said, Impossible! There is an impressive inflection of voice which, as it were, underlines the words. Barkilphedro's tone was thus emphasized. He paused so as to put a full stop after the word he had just uttered. Then he continued, with the peculiar and respectful tone of a servant who feels that he is master. My lord, you are twenty-three miles from London, at Corleone Lodge, your court residence, contiguous to the royal castle of Windsor. You are here unknown to any one. You were brought here in a closed carriage, which was awaiting you at the gate of the jail at Southwark. The servants who introduced you into this palace are ignorant who you are, but they know me, and that is sufficient. You may possibly have been brought to these apartments by means of a private key, which is in my possession. There are people in the house asleep, and it is not an hour to awaken them. Hence we have time for an explanation, which, nevertheless, will be short. I have been commissioned by Her Majesty. As he spoke, Barkilphedro began to turn over the leaves of some bundles of paper which were lying near the casket. My lord, here is your patent of peerage. Here is that of your Sicilian Marquisate. These are the parchments and title deeds of your eight baronies, with the seals of eleven kings, from Baldret, king of Kent, to James, the sixth of Scotland, and first of England, and Scotland united. Here are your letters of precedence. Here are your rent rolls, and titles, and descriptions of your fiefs, freeholds, dependencies, lands, and domains. That which you see above your head in the emblazonment on the ceiling are your two coronets, the circlet with pearls for the baron, and the circlet with strawberry leaves for the marquis. Here, in the wardrobe, is your peer's robe of red velvet, bordered with ermine. Today, only a few hours since the Lord Chancellor and the Deputy Earl Marshal of England informed of the result of your confrontation with the Comprachico Hard Quanon, have taken Her Majesty's commands. Her Majesty has signed them, according to her royal will, which is the same as the law. All formalities have been complied with. Tomorrow, and no later than tomorrow, you will take your seat in the House of Lords, where they have for some days been deliberating on a bill presented by the Crown, having for its object the augmentation, by a hundred thousand pounds sterling yearly, of the annual allowance to the Duke of Cumberland, husband of the Queen. You will be able to take part in the debate." Barkilphedro paused, 
breathed slowly and resumed. However, nothing is yet settled. A man cannot be made a peer of England without his own consent. All can be annulled and disappear unless you acquiesce. An event nipped in the bud ere it ripens often occurs in state policy. My lord, up to this time silence has been preserved on what has occurred. The House of Lords will not be informed of the facts until to-morrow. Secrecy has been kept about the whole matter for reasons of state, which are of such importance that the influential persons who alone are at this moment cognizant of your existence and of your rights will forget them immediately should reasons of state command their being forgotten. That which is in darkness may remain in darkness. It is easy to wipe you out, the more so as you have a brother the natural son of your father, and of a woman who, afterwards, during the exile of your father, became mistress to King Charles the Second, which accounts for your brother's high position at court. For it is to this brother, bastard though he be, that your peerage would revert. Do you wish this? I cannot think so. Well, all depends on you. The queen must be obeyed. You will not quit the house till to-morrow in a royal carriage, and to go to the House of Lords. My lord, will you be a peer of England, yes or no? The Queen has designs for you. She destines you for an alliance almost royal. Lord Fermain Clancharlie, this is the decisive moment. Destiny never opens one door without shutting another. After a certain step in advance, to step back is impossible. Whoso enters into transfiguration leaves behind him evanescence. My lord, Gwynplaine is dead. Do you understand? Gwynplaine trembled from head to foot. Then he recovered himself. Yes, he said. Barkilphedro, smiling, bowed, placed the casket under his cloak, and left the room. End of section 79 Recording by William Tomko Section 80 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Part 2, Book the Fifth, Chapter 5. We Think We Remember, We Forget. Whence arise those strange visible changes which occur in the soul of man? Gwynplaine had been at the same moment raised to a summit and cast into an abyss. His head swam with double giddiness, the giddiness of ascent and descent, a fatal combination. He felt himself ascend, and felt not his fall. It is appalling to see a new horizon. A perspective affords suggestions but not always good ones. He had before him the fairy glade, a snare perhaps, seen through opening clouds and showing the blue depths of sky, so deep that they are obscure. He was on the mountain, whence he could see all the kingdoms of the earth, a mountain all the more terrible that it is a visionary one. Those who are on its apex are in a dream. Palaces, castles, power, opulence, all human happiness extending as far as I could reach, a map of enjoyments spread out to the horizon, a sort of radiant geography of which he was the center, a perilous mirage. Imagine what must have been the haze of such a vision, not led up to, not attained to as by the gradual steps of a ladder, but reached without transition and without previous warning. A man going to sleep in a mole's burrow, and awakening on the top of the Strasbourg steeple. Such was the state of Gwynplaine. Giddiness is a dangerous kind of glare, particularly that which bears you at once towards the day and towards the night, forming two whirlwinds, one opposed to the other. He saw too much and not enough. He saw all and nothing. His state was what the author of this book has somewhere expressed as the blind man dazzled. Gwynplaine, left by himself, began to walk with long strides. A bubbling precedes an explosion. Notwithstanding his agitation in this impossibility of keeping still, 
He meditated. His mind liquefied as it boiled. He began to recall things to his memory. It is surprising how we find that we have heard so clearly that to which we scarcely listened. The declaration of the shipwrecked men, read by the sheriff in the Southwark cell, came back to him clearly and intelligibly. He recalled every word. He saw under it his whole infancy. Suddenly he stopped, his hands clasped behind his back, looking up to the ceilings, the sky, no matter what, whatever was above him. Quits, he cried. He felt like one whose head rises out of the water. It seemed to him that he saw everything, the past, the future, the present, in the accession of a sudden flash of light. Oh, he cried, for there are cries in the depths of thought. Oh, it was so, was it? I was a lord, all is discovered. They stole, betrayed, destroyed, abandoned, disinherited, murdered me. The corpse of my destiny floated fifteen years on the sea. All at once it touched the earth, and it started up erect and living. I am reborn. I am born. I felt under my rags that the breast there palpitating was not that of a wretch, and when I looked on crowds of men, I felt that they were the flocks, and that I was not the dog, but the shepherd. Shepherds of the people, leaders of men, guides and masters, such were my fathers, and what they were, I am. I am a gentleman, and I have a sword. I am a baron, and I have a cask. I am a marquis, and I have a plume. I am a peer, and I have a coronet. Lo, they deprived me of all this. I dwelt in light, they flung me into darkness. Those who proscribed the father sold the son. When my father was dead, they took from beneath his head the stone of exile, which he had placed for his pillow, and tying it to my neck, they flung me into a sewer. Oh, those scoundrels who tortured my infancy! Yes, they rise and move in the depths of my memory. Yes, I see them again. I was that morsel of flesh pecked to pieces on a tomb by a flight of crows. I bled and cried under all those horrible shadows. Lo, it was there that they precipitated me under the crush of those who come and go, under the trampling feet of men, under the undermost of the human race, lower than the serf, baser than the serving man, lower than the felon, lower than the slave, at a spot where chaos becomes a sewer in which I was engulfed. It is from thence that I come. It is from this that I rise. It is from this that I am risen. And here I am now. Quits. He sat down. He rose, clasped his head with his hands, began to pace the room again, and his tempestuous monologue continued within him. Where am I? On the summit? Where is it that I have just alighted? On the highest peak? This pinnacle, this grandeur, this dome of the world, this great power is my home. This temple is in air. I am one of the gods. I live in inaccessible heights. This supremacy which I looked up to from below, and from whence emanated such rays of glory that I shut my eyes, this ineffaceable peerage, this impregnable fortress of the fortunate, I enter. I am in it. I am of it. Ah, what a decisive turn of the wheel. I was below, I am on high, on high for ever. Behold me, a lord. I shall have a scarlet robe. I shall have an earl's coronet on my head. I shall assist in the coronation of kings. They will take the oath from my hands. I shall judge princes and ministers. I shall exist. From the depths into which I was thrown, I have rebounded to the zenith. I have palaces in town and country, houses, gardens, chases, forests, carriages, millions. I will give fates, I will make laws, I shall have the choice of joys and pleasures. And the vagabond Gwynplaine, who had not the right to gather a flower in the grass, may pluck the stars from heaven. Melancholy overshadowing of a soul's brightness. Thus it was that in Gwynplaine, who had been a hero, and perhaps had not ceased to be one, 
moral greatness gave way to material splendor a lamentable transition virtue broken down by a troop of passing demons a surprise made on the weak side of man's fortress all the inferior circumstances called by men superior ambition the purblind desires of instinct passions covetousness driven far from gwynplaine by the wholesome restraints of misfortune took tumultuous possession of his generous heart and from what had this arisen from the discovery of a parchment in a waif drifted by the sea conscience may be violated by a chance attack gwynplaine drank in great draughts of pride and it dulled his soul such is the poison of that fatal wine giddiness invaded him he more than consented to its approach he welcomed it this was the effect of previous and long continued thirst are we an accomplice of the cup which deprives us of reason he had always vaguely desired this his eyes had always turned towards the great to watch is to wish the eaglet is not born in the airy for nothing now however at moments it seemed to him the simplest thing in the world that he should be a lord a few hours only had passed and yet the past of yesterday seemed so far off gwynplaine had fallen into the ambuscade of better who is the enemy of good unhappy is he of whom we say how lucky he is adversity is more easily resisted than prosperity we rise more perfect from ill fortune than from good there is a charybdis in poverty and a scylla in riches those who remain erect under the thunderbolt are prostrated by the flash thou who standest without shrinking on the verge of a precipice fear lest thou be carried up on the innumerable wings of mists and dreams the ascent which elevates will dwarf thee an apotheosis has a sinister power of degradation it is not easy to understand what is good luck chance is nothing but a disguise nothing deceives so much as the face of fortune is she providence is she fatality a brightness may not be a brightness because light is truth and a gleam may be a deceit you believe that it lights you but no it sets you on fire at night a candle made of mean tallow becomes a star if placed in an opening in the darkness the moth flies to it in what measure is the moth responsible the sight of the candle fascinates the moth as the eye of the serpent fascinates the bird is it possible that the bird and the moth should resist the attraction is it possible that the leaf should resist the wind is it possible that the stone should refuse obedience to the laws of gravitation? These are material questions, which are moral questions as well. After he had received the letter of the Duchess, Gwynplaine had recovered himself. The deep love in his nature had resisted it. But the storm, having wearied itself on one side of the horizon, burst out on the other, for in destiny as in nature there are successive convulsions the first shock loosens the second uproots alas how do the oaks fall thus he who when a child of ten stood alone on the shore of portland ready to give battle who had looked steadfastly at all the combatants whom he had to encounter the blast which bore away the vessel in which he had expected to embark the gulf which had swallowed up the plank, the yawning abyss of which the menace was its retrocession, the earth which refused him a shelter, the sky which refused him a star, solitude without pity, obscurity without notice, ocean, sky, all the violence of one infinite space, and all the mysterious enigmas of another, he who had neither trembled nor fainted before the mighty hostility of the unknown, he who still so young had held his own with right as hercules of old had held his own with death he who in the unequal struggle had thrown down this defiance that he a child adopted a child that he encumbered himself with the load when tired and exhausted 
thus rendering himself an easier prey to the attacks on his weakness and as it were himself unmuzzling the shadowy monsters in ambush around him he who a precocious warrior had immediately and from his first steps out of the cradle struggled breast to breast with destiny he whose disproportion with strife had not discouraged from striving he who perceiving in everything around him a frightful occultation of the human race had accepted that eclipse and proudly continued his journey he who had known how to endure cold thirst hunger valiantly he who a pygmy in stature had been a colossus in soul this gwynplaine who had conquered the great terror of the abyss under its double form tempest and misery staggered under a breath vanity thus when she has exhausted distress nakedness storms catastrophes agonies on an unflinching man fatality begins to smile and her victim suddenly intoxicated staggers the smile of fatality can anything more terrible be imagined it is the last resource of the pitiless trier of souls in his proof of man the tiger lurking in destiny caresses man with a velvet paw sinister preparation hideous gentleness in the monster every self-observer has detected within himself mental weakness coincident with aggrandizement a sudden growth disturbs the system and produces fever in gwynplaine's brain was the giddy whirlwind of a crowd of new circumstances all the light and shade of a metamorphosis inexpressibly strange confrontations the shock of the past against the future two gwynplaines himself doubled behind an infant in rags crawling through night wandering shivering hungry provoking laughter in front a brilliant nobleman luxurious proud dazzling all london he was casting off one form and amalgamating himself with the other he was casting the mountebank and becoming the peer change of skin is sometimes change of soul now and then the past seemed like a dream it was complex bad and good he thought of his father it was a poignant anguish never to have known his father he tried to picture him to himself he thought of his brother of whom he had just heard then he had a family he gwindling he lost himself in fantastic dreams he saw visions of magnificence unknown forms of solemn grandeur moved in mist before him he heard flourishes of trumpets and then he said i shall be eloquent he pictured to himself a splendid entrance into the house of lords he should arrive full to the brim with new facts and ideas what could he not tell them what subjects had he accumulated what an advantage to be in the midst of them a man who had seen touched undergone and suffered who could cry aloud to them i have been near to everything from which you are so far removed he would hurl reality in the face of those patricians crammed with illusions they should tremble for it would be the truth they would applaud for it would be grand he would arise amongst those powerful men more powerful than they i shall appear as a torch-bearer to show them truth and as a sword-bearer to show them justice what a triumph and building up these fantasies in his mind clear and confused at the same time he had attacks of delirium sinking on the first seat he came to sometimes drowsy sometimes starting up he came and went looked at the ceiling examined the coronets studied vaguely the hieroglyphics of the emblazonment felt the velvet of the walls moved the chairs turned over the parchments read the names spelt out the titles buxton humble grundraith hunkerville clancharlie compared the wax the impressions felt the twist of silk appended to the royal privy seal approached the window listened to the splash of the fountain contemplated the statues counted with the patience of a somnambulist the columns of marble and said it is real 
Then he touched his satin clothes and asked himself, Is it I? Yes. He was torn by an inward tempest. In this whirlwind, did he feel faintness and fatigue? Did he drink, eat, sleep? If he did so, he was unconscious of the fact. In certain violent situations, instinct satisfies itself, according to its requirements, unconsciously. Besides, his thoughts were less thoughts than mists. At the moment that the black flame of an eruption disgorges itself from depths full of boiling lava, has the crater any consciousness of the flocks which crop the grass at the foot of the mountain? The hours passed. The dawn appeared and brought the day. A bright ray penetrated the chamber, and at the same instant broke on the soul of Gwynplaine. And Dia said the light. End of section 80. Recording by Ecological Humanist. EcologicalHumanist.wordpress.com Section 81 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Part 2, Book the Sixth, Chapter 1. What the Misanthrope Said. After Ursus had seen Gwynplaine thrust within the gates of Southwick Jail, he remained haggard in the corner from which he was watching. For a long time his ears were haunted by the grinding of the bolts and bars, which was like a howl of joy that one wretch more should be enclosed within them. He waited. What for? He watched. What for? Such inexorable doors, once shut, do not reopen so soon. They are tongue-tied by their stagnation and darkness and move with difficulty, especially when they have to give up a prisoner. Entrance is permitted, exit is quite a different matter. Ursus knew this, but waiting is a thing which we have not the power to give up at our own will. We wait in our own despite. What we do disengages an acquired force, which maintains its action when its object has ceased, which keeps possession of us and holds us, and obliges us for some time longer to continue that which has already lost its motive. Hence the useless watch, the inert position that we have all held at times, the loss of time which every thoughtful man gives mechanically to that which has disappeared. None escapes this law. We become stubborn in a sort of vague fury. We know not why we are in the place, but we remain there. That which we have begun actively we continue passively, with an exhausting tenacity from which we emerge overwhelmed. Ursus, though differing from other men, was, as any other might have been, nailed to his post by that species of conscious reverie into which we are plunged by events all important to us, and in which we are impotent. He scrutinized by turns those two black walls, now the high one, then the low, sometimes the door near which the ladder to the gibbet stood then that surmounted by a death's head. It was as if he were caught in a vice, composed of a prison and a cemetery. This shunned and unpopular street was so deserted that he was unobserved. At length he left the arch under which he had taken shelter, a kind of chance sentry-box in which he had acted the watchman, and departed with slow steps. The day was declining, for his guard had been long. From time to time he turned his head and looked at the fearful wicket through which Gwynplaine had disappeared. His eyes were glassy and dull. He reached the end of the alley, entered another, then another, retracing almost unconsciously the road which he had taken some hours before. At intervals he turned, as if he could still see the door of the prison, though he was no longer in the street in which the jail was situated. Step by step he was approaching Terenzo Field. The lanes in the neighbourhood of the fairground were deserted pathways between enclosed gardens. He walked along, his head bent down, by the hedges and ditches. All at once he halted, and, drawing himself up, exclaimed, So much the better! 
At the same time he struck his fist twice on his head and twice on his thigh, thus proving himself to be a sensible fellow who saw things in their right light. And then he began to growl inwardly, yet now and then raising his voice. It is all right. Oh, the scoundrel, the thief, the vagabond, the worthless fellow, the seditious scamp. It is his speeches about the government that have sent him there. He is a rebel. I was harbouring a rebel. I am free of him, and lucky for me, he was compromising us. Thrust into prison? Oh, so much the better. What excellent laws! Ungrateful boy, I who brought him up, to give oneself so much trouble for this, why should he want to speak into reason? He mixed himself up in politics, the ass. As he handled pennies, he babbled about the taxes, about the poor, about the people, about what was no business of his. He permitted himself to make reflections on pennies. He commented wickedly and maliciously on the copper money of the kingdom. He insulted the farthings of Her Majesty. A farthing? Why, it is the same as the Queen. A sacred effigy. Devil take it, a sacred effigy. Have we a queen, yes or no? Then respect her verdigrees. Everything depends on the government. One ought to know that. I have experience, I have. I know something. They may say to me, but you give up politics, then. Politics, my friends, I care as much for them as for the rough hide of an ass. I received one day a blow from a baronet's cane. I said to myself, that is enough. I understand politics. The people have but a farthing, they give it. The queen takes it, the people thank her. Nothing can be more natural. It is for the peers to arrange the rest, their lordships, the lords spiritual and temporal. Oh, so Gwynplaine is locked up. So he is in prison. That is just as it should be. It is equitable, excellent, well-merited, and legitimate. It is his own fault. To criticize is forbidden. Are you a lord, you idiot? The constable has seized him, the justice of the quorum has carried him off, the sheriff has him in custody. At this moment he is probably being examined by a sergeant of the coif. They pluck out your crimes, those clever fellows. Imprisoned my wag, so much the worse for him, so much the better for me. Faith, I am satisfied, I own frankly that fortune favours me. Of what folly was I guilty when I picked up that little boy and girl? We were so quiet before, Homo and I. What had they to do in my caravan, the little blackguards? Didn't I brood over them when they were young? Didn't I draw them along with my harness? Pretty foundings indeed, he as ugly as sin, and she blind of both eyes. Where was the use of depriving myself of everything for their sakes? The beggars grow up forsooth and make love to each other. The flirtations of the deformed. It was to that we had come, the toad and the mole, quite an idol. That was what went on in my household, all which was sure to end by going before the justice. The toad talked politics. But now I am free of him. When the wapentake came, I was at first a fool. One always doubts one's own good luck. I believe that I did not see what I did see that it was impossible, that it was a nightmare, that a daydream was playing me a trick. But no, nothing could be truer. It is all clear. Gwynplaine is really in prison. It is a stroke of providence. Praise be to it. He was the monster who, with the row he made, drew attention to my establishment and denounced my poor wolf. Be off, Gwynplaine. And see, I am rid of both. Two birds killed with one stone because Dea will die now that she can no longer see Gwynplaine. For she sees him, the idiot. She will have no object in life. She will say, what am I to do in the world? Good-bye to the devil with both of them. I always hated the creatures. Die, Dea. Oh, I am quite comfortable. End of section 81. Recording by John Trevithick. Section 82 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo, Part Two, Book the Sixth, Chapter Two, What He Did. He returned to the Tadcaster Inn. It struck half past six. It was a little before twilight. Master Nicholas stood on his doorstep. He had not succeeded since the morning in extinguishing the terror which still showed on his scared face. He perceived Ursus from afar. Well, he cried. Well, what? Is Gwynplaine coming back? It is full time. The public will soon be coming. Shall we have the performance of the laughing man this evening? I am the laughing man, said Ursus. And he looked at the tavern-keeper with a loud chuckle. Then he went up to the first floor, opened the window next to the sign of the inn, leant over towards the placard about Gwynplaine, the laughing man, and the bill of chaos vanquished, and nailed the one, tore down the other, put both under his arm, and descended. Master Nicholas followed him with his eyes. Why do you unhook that? Ursus burst into a second fit of laughter. Why do you laugh? said the tavern-keeper. I am re-entering private life. Master Nicholas understood, and gave an order to his lieutenant, the boy Govicum, to announce to every one who should come that there would be no performance that evening. He took from the door the box made out of a cask where they received the entrance money, and rolled it into a corner of the lower sitting-room. A moment after Ursus entered the green box. He put the two signs away in a corner, and entered what he called the woman's wing. Dea was asleep. She was on her bed, dressed as usual, excepting that the body of her gown was loosened, as when she was taking her siesta. Near her Venus and Phoebe were sitting, one on a stool, the other on the ground, musing. Notwithstanding the lateness of the hour, they had not dressed themselves in their goddess's gauze, which was a sign of deep discouragement. They had remained in their drugget petticoats and their dress of coarse cloth. Ursus looked at Dea. She is rehearsing for a longer sleep, murmured he. Then, addressing Phoebe and Venus, You both know all. The music is over. You may put your trumpets into the drawer. You did well not to equip yourselves as deities. You look ugly enough as you are, but you were quite right. Keep on your petticoats. No performance to-night, nor to-morrow, nor the day after to-morrow. No Gwynplaine. Gwynplaine is clean gone. Then he looked at Dea again. What a blow to her this will be. It will be like blowing out a candle. He inflated his cheeks. Puff! Nothing more. Then, with a little dry laugh, Losing Gwynplaine, she loses all. It would be just as if I were to lose Homo. It would be worse. She will feel more lonely than any one else could. The blind wade through more sorrow than we do. He looked out of the window at the end of the room. How the days lengthen! It is not dark at seven o'clock. Nevertheless, we will light up. He struck the steel and lighted the lamp which hung from the ceiling of the green box. Then he leaned over Dea. She will catch cold. You have unlaced her bodice too low. There is a proverb, though April skies be bright, keep all your wrappers tight. Seeing a pin shining on the floor, he picked it up and pinned up her sleeve. Then he paced the green box, gesticulating. I am in full possession of my faculties. I am lucid, quite lucid. I consider this occurrence quite proper, and I approve of what has happened. When she awakes, I will explain everything to her clearly. The catastrophe will not be long in coming. No more Gwynplaine. Good night, Dea. How well all has been arranged. Gwynplaine in prison, Dea in the cemetery. They will be vis-à-vis. -vis. A dance of death. Two destinies going off the stage at once. Pack up the dresses, fasten the valise. For valise read coffin. It was just what was best for them both. Dea without eyes, Gwynplaine without a face. On high the Almighty will restore sight to Dea, and beauty to Gwynplaine. Death puts things to rights. All will be well. Phoebe, Venus, hang up your tambourines on the nail. Your talents for noise will go to rust, my beauties. No more playing, no more trumpeting. Chaos vanquished is vanquished. 
The laughing man is done for. Tara Tantara is dead. Dea sleeps on. She does well. If I were her, I would never wake. Oh, she will soon fall asleep again. A skylark like her takes very little killing. This comes of meddling with politics. What a lesson! Governments are right. Gwynplaine to the sheriff. Dea to the grave-digger. Parallel cases. Instructive symmetry. I hope the tavern-keeper has barred the door. We are going to die to-night quietly at home, between ourselves. Not I, nor Homo, but Dea. As for me, I shall continue to roll on in the caravan. I belong to the meanderings of vagabond life. I shall dismiss these two women. I shall not keep even one of them. I have a tendency to become an old scoundrel. A maid-servant in the house of a libertine is like a loaf of bread on the shelf. I decline the temptation. It is not becoming at my age. Terpe senilis amor. I will follow my way alone with Homo. How astonished Homo will be! Where is Gwynplaine? Where is Dea? Oh, comrade, here we are once more alone together. Plague, take it, I'm delighted. Their bucolics were an encumbrance. Oh, that scamp Gwynplaine, who is never coming back, he has left us stuck here. I say, all right, and now tis Dea's turn. That won't be long. I like things to be done with. I would not snap my fingers to stop her dying. Her dying, I tell you. See? She awakes. Dea opened her eyelids. Many blind persons shut them when they sleep. Her sweet, unwitting face wore all its usual radiance. She smiles, whispered Ursus, and I laugh. That is as it should be. Dea called. Phoebe, Venus, it must be the time for the performance. I think I have been asleep a long time. Come and dress me. Neither Phoebe nor Venus moved. Meanwhile, the ineffable blind look of Dea's eyes met those of Ursus. He started. Well, he cried, what are you about? Venus, Phoebe, did you not hear your mistress? Are you deaf? Quick! The play is going to begin. The two women looked at Ursus in stupefaction. Ursus shouted, Do you not hear the audience coming in? Phoebe, dress Dea. Venus, take your tambourine. Phoebe was obedient, Venus passive. Together they personified submission. Their master Ursus had always been to them an enigma. Never to be understood is a reason for being always obeyed. They simply thought he had gone mad, and did as they were told. Phoebe took down the costume, and Venus the tambourine. Phoebe began to dress Dea. Ursus let down the door-curtain of the women's room, and from behind the curtain continued, Look there, Gwynplaine, the court is already more than half full of people. They are in heaps in the passages. What a crowd! And you say that Phoebe and Venus look as if they did not see them. How stupid the gypsies are! What fools they are in Egypt! Yet don't lift the curtain from the door. Be decent. Dea is dressing. He paused, and suddenly they heard an exclamation. How beautiful Dea is! It was the voice of Gwynplaine. Phoebe and Venus started and turned round. It was the voice of Gwynplaine, but in the mouth of Ursus. Ursus, by a sign which he made through the door ajar, forbade the expression of any astonishment. Then again, taking the voice of Gwynplaine, Angel! Then he replied in his own voice, Dea an angel? You are a fool, Gwynplaine. No mammifer can fly except the bats. And he added, Look here, Gwynplaine, let Homo loose. That will be more to the purpose. And he descended the ladder of the green box very quickly, with the agile spring of Gwynplaine, imitating his step so that Dea could hear it. In the court he addressed the boy, whom the occurrences of the day had made idle and inquisitive. Spread out both your hands, said he in a loud voice, and he poured a handful of pence into them. Govacum was grateful for his munificence. Ursus whispered in his ear, Boy, go into the yard, jump, dance, knock, ball, whistle, coo, neigh, applaud, stamp your feet, burst out laughing, break something. 
Master Nicholas, saddened and humiliated at seeing the folks who had come to see the laughing man turned back and crowding towards other caravans, had shut the door of the inn. He had even given up the idea of selling any beer or spirits that evening, that he might have to answer no awkward questions, and, quite overcome by the sudden close of the performance, was looking with his candle in his hand into the court from the balcony above. Ursus, taking the precaution of putting his voice between parentheses fashioned by adjusting the palms of his hands to his mouth, cried out to him, Sir, do as your boy is doing. Yelp, bark, howl. He reascended the steps of the green box and said to the wolf, Talk as much as you can. Then raising his voice, What a crowd there is! We shall have a crammed performance. In the meantime, Venus played the tambourine. Ursus went on, they are is dressed. Now we can begin. I am sorry they have admitted so many spectators. How thickly packed they are! Look, Gwynplaine, what a mad mob it is! I will bet that to-day we shall make more money than we have ever done yet. Come, gypsies, play up, both of you. Come here. Phoebe, take your clarion. Good. Venus, drum on your tambourine. Fling it up and catch it again. Phoebe, put yourself into the attitude of fame. Young ladies, you have too much on. Take off those jackets. Replace stuff by gauze. The public like to see the female form exposed. Let the moralists thunder. A little indecency, devil take it. What of that? Look voluptuous and rush into wild melodies. Snort, blow, whistle, flourish. Play the tambourine. What a number of people, my poor Gwynplaine. He interrupted himself. Gwynplaine, help me. Let down the platform. He spread out his pocket-handkerchief. But first let me roar in my rag, and he blew his nose violently as a ventriloquist ought. Having returned his handkerchief to his pocket, he drew the pegs out of the pulleys, which creaked as usual as the platform was let down. Gwynplaine, do not draw the curtain until the performance begins. We are not alone. You two come out in front. Music, ladies, turn, turn, turn. A pretty audience we have, the dregs of the people. Good heavens! The two gypsies, stupidly obedient, placed themselves in their usual corners of the platform. Then Ursus became wonderful. It was no longer a man, but a crowd. Obliged to make abundance out of emptiness, he called to aid his prodigious powers of ventriloquism. The whole orchestra of human and animal voices which was within him, he called into tumult at once. He was legion. Anyone with his eyes closed would have imagined that he was in a public place on some day of rejoicing, or in some sudden popular riot. A whirlwind of clamour proceeded from Ursus. He sang, he shouted, he talked, he coughed, he spat, he sneezed, took snuff, talked and responded, put questions and gave answers all at once. The half-uttered syllables ran one into another. In the court, untenanted by a single spectator, were heard men, women and children. It was a clear confusion of tumult. Strange laughter wound vapour-like through the noise, the chirping of birds, the swearing of cats, the wailings of children at the breast. The indistinct tones of drunken men were to be heard, and the growls of dogs under the feet of people who stamped on them. The cries came from far and near, from top to bottom, from the upper boxes to the pit. The whole was an uproar, the detail was a cry. Ursus clapped his hands, stamped his feet, threw his voice to the end of the court, and then made it come from underground. It was both stormy and familiar. It passed from a murmur to a noise, from a noise to a tumult, from a tumult to a tempest. He was himself any every one else, alone and polyglot. As there are optical illusions, there are also auricular illusions. That which Proteus did to sight, Ursus did to hearing. Nothing could be more marvellous than his facsimile of multitude. From time to time he opened the door of the women's apartment and looked at Dea. Dea was listening. On his part the boy exerted himself to the utmost. Venus and Phoebe trumpeted conscientiously and took turns with the tambourine. Master Nicholas, the only spectator, quietly made himself the same explanation as they did, that Ursus was gone mad, which was, for that matter, but another sad item added to his misery. The good tavern-keeper growled out, What insanity! And he was serious as a man might well be who has the fear of the law before him. 
Govicum, delighted at being able to help in making a noise, exerted himself almost as much as Ursus. It amused him, and moreover, it earned him pence. Homo was pensive. In the midst of the tumult, Ursus now and then uttered such words as these. Just as usual, Gwynplaine, there is a cabal against us. Our rivals are undermining our success. Tumult is the seasoning of triumph. Besides, there are too many people. They are uncomfortable. The angles of their neighbours' elbows do not dispose them to good nature. I hope the benches will not give way. We shall be the victims of an incensed population. Oh, if our friend Tom Jim Jack were only here! But he never comes now. Look at those heads rising one above the other. Those who are forced to stand don't look very well pleased, though the great Galen pronounced it to be strengthening. We will shorten the entertainment. As only Chaos Vanquished was announced in the playbill, we will not play Ursus Rursus. There will be something gained in that. What an uproar! Oh, blind turbulence of the masses! They will do us some damage. However, they can't go on like this. We should not be able to play. No one can catch a word of the piece. I'm going to address them. Gwynplaine, draw the curtain a little aside. Gentlemen! Here Ursus addressed himself with a shrill and feeble voice. Down with that old fool! Then he answered in his own voice. It seems that the mob insult me. Cicero is right. Plebs, fex, urbis. Never mind, we will admonish the mob, though I shall have a great deal of trouble to make myself heard. I will speak, notwithstanding. Man, do your duty. Gwynplaine, look at that scold grinding her teeth down there. Ursus made a pause, in which he placed a gnashing of his teeth. Homo, provoked, added a second, and Govicum a third. Ursus went on. The women are worse than the men. The moment is unpropitious, but it doesn't matter. Let us try the power of a speech. An eloquent speech is never out of place. Listen, Gwynplaine, to my attractive exordium. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a bear. I take off my head to address you. I humbly appeal to you for silence. Ursus, lending a cry to the crowd, said, Grumble! Then he continued, I respect my audience. Grumple is an epiphonema as good as any other welcome. You growlers, that you are all of the dregs of the people I do not doubt. That in no way diminishes my esteem for you, a well-considered esteem. I have a profound respect for the bullies who honour me with their custom. There are deformed folks among you. They give me no offence. The lame and the humpbacked are works of nature. The camel is gibbous, the bison's back is humped. The badger's left legs are shorter than the right. That fact is decided by Aristotle in his treatise on the walking of animals. There are those amongst you who have but two shirts, one on his back and the other at the pawnbroker's. I know that to be true. Albuquerque pawned his moustache, and St. Denis his glory. The Jews advanced money on the glory. Great examples! To have debts is to have something. I revere your beggardom. Ursus cut short his speech, interrupting it in a deep bass voice by the shout, Triple ass! And he answered in his politest accent, I admit it. I am a learned man. I do my best to apologize for it. I scientifically despise science. Ignorance is a reality on which we feed. Science is a reality on which we starve. In general, one is obliged to choose between two things, to be learned and grow thin, or to browse and be an ass. Oh, gentlemen, browse. Science is not worth a mouthful of anything nice. I had rather eat a sirloin of beef than know what they call the psoas muscle. I have but one merit, a dry eye. Such as you see me, I have never wept. It must be owned that I have never been satisfied, never satisfied, not even with myself. I despise myself, but I submit this to the members of the opposition here present. If Ursus is only a learned man, Gwynplaine is an artist. He groaned again, Grumble! And resumed, Grumple again, it is an objection. All the same, I pass it over. Near Gwynplaine, ladies and gentlemen, is another artist, a valued and distinguished personage who accompanies us. 
his lordship Homo, formerly a wild dog, now a civilized wolf, and a faithful subject of her majesties. Homo is a mine of deep and superior talent. Be attentive and watch. You are going to set Homo play as well as Gwynplaine, and you must do honour to art. That is an attribute of great nations. Are you men of the woods? I admit the fact. In that case, Silvei sunt consuli digna. Two artists are well worth one consul. All right. Someone has flung a cabbage stalk at me, but did not hit me. That will not stop my speaking. On the contrary, a danger evaded makes folks garrulous. Garula pericula, says Juvenal. My hearers, there are amongst you drunken men and drunken women. Very well. The men are unwholesome. The women are hideous. You have all sorts of excellent reasons for stowing yourselves away here on the benches of the pothouse. Want of work, idleness, the spare time between two robberies, porter, ale, stout, malt, brandy, gin, and the attraction of one sex for the other. What could be better? A wit prone to irony would find this a fair field. But I abstain. Tis luxury, so be it, but even an orgy should be kept within bounds. You are gay but noisy. You imitate successfully the cries of beasts. But what would you say if, when you were making love to a lady, I passed my time in barking at you? It would disturb you, and so it disturbs us. I order you to hold your tongues. Art is as respectable as debauch. I speak to you civilly. He apostrophized himself. May the fever strangle you with your eyebrows like the beard of rye. And he replied, Honorable gentlemen, let the rye alone. It is impious to insult the vegetables by likening them neither to human creatures or animals. Besides, the fever does not strangle. Tis a false metaphor. For pity's sake, keep silence. Allow me to tell you that you are slightly wanting in the repose which characterizes the true English gentleman. I see that some amongst you, who have shoes out of which their toes are peeping, take advantage of the circumstance to rest their feet on the shoulders of those who are in front of them, causing the ladies to remark that the soles of shoes divide always at the part at which is the head of the metatarsal bones. Show more of your hands and less of your feet. I perceive scamps who plunge their ingenious fists into the pockets of their foolish neighbours. Dear pickpockets, have a little modesty. Fight those next to you if you like. Do not plunder them. You will vex them less by blackening an eye than by lightening their purses of a penny. Break their noses if you like. The shopkeeper thinks more of his money than of his beauty. Barring this, accept my sympathies, for I am not pedantic enough to blame thieves. Evil exists. Every one endures it. Every one inflicts it. No one is exempt from the vermin of his sins. That's what I keep saying. Have we not all our itch? I myself have made mistakes. Plaudite sives. Ursus uttered a long groan, which he overpowered by these concluding words. My lords and gentlemen, I see that my address has unluckily displeased you. I take leave of your hisses for a moment. I shall put on my head, and the performance is going to begin. He dropped his oratorical tone and resumed his usual voice. Close the curtains. Let me breathe. I have spoken like honey. I have spoken well. My words were like velvet, but they were useless. I called them my lords and gentlemen. What do you think of all this scum, Gwynplaine? How well may we estimate the ills which England has suffered for the last forty years through the ill temper of these irritable and malicious spirits? The ancient Britons were warlike. These are melancholy and learned. They glory in despising the law and condemning royal authority. I have done all that human eloquence can do. I have been prodigal of metonymics, as gracious as the blooming cheek of youth. Were they softened by them? I doubt it. What can affect a people who eat so extraordinarily, who stupefy themselves by tobacco so completely, that their literary men often write their works with a pipe in their mouths? Never mind, let us begin the play. The rings of the curtain were heard being drawn over the rod. The tambourines of the gypsies were still. Ursus took down his instrument, executed his prelude, and said in a low tone, 
Alas, Gwynplaine, how mysterious it is! And he flung himself down with the wolf. When he had taken down his instrument, he had also taken from the nail a rough wig which he had, and which he had thrown on the stage in a corner within his reach. The performance of Chaos Vanquished took place as usual, minus only the effect of the blue light and the brilliancy of the fairies. The wolf played his best. At the proper moment Dea made her appearance, and, in her voice so tremulous and heavenly, invoked Gwynplaine. She extended her arms, feeling for that head. Ursus rushed at the wig, ruffled it, put it on, advanced softly, and holding his breath, his head bristled thus under the hand of Dea. Then, calling all his art to his aid, and copying Gwynplaine's voice, he sang with ineffable love the response of the monster to the call of the spirit. The imitation was so perfect that again the gypsies looked for Gwynplaine, frightened at hearing without seeing him. Govicum, filled with astonishment, stamped, applauded, clapped his hands, producing an Olympian tumult, and himself laughed as if he had been a chorus of gods. This boy, it must be confessed, developed a rare talent for acting an audience. Phoebe and Venus, being automatons of which Ursus pulled the strings, rattled their instruments, composed of copper and ass's skin, the usual sign of the performance being over, and of the departure of the people. Ursus arose, covered with perspiration. He said in a low voice to Homo, You see, it was necessary to gain time. I think we have succeeded. I have not acquitted myself badly, I, who have as much reason as any one to go distracted. Gwynplaine may perhaps return to-morrow. It is useless to kill Dea directly. I can explain matters to you. He took off his wig and wiped his forehead. I am a ventriloquist of genius, murmured he. What talent I displayed! I have equalled Brabant, the engastrimist of Francis I of France. Dea is convinced that Gwynplaine is here. Ursus, said Dea, where is Gwynplaine? Ursus started and turned round. Dea was still standing at the back of the stage, alone under the lamp which hung from the ceiling. She was pale with the pallor of a ghost. She added, with an ineffable expression of despair, I know, he has left us, he is gone. I always knew that he had wings. And raising her sightless eyes on high, she added, When shall I follow? End of section 82 Recording by John Trevithick Section 83 of The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo. Part 2, Book the Sixth, Chapter 3, Complications. Ursus was stunned. He had not sustained the illusion. Was it the fault of ventriloquism? Certainly not. He had succeeded in deceiving Phoebe and Venus, who had eyes, although he had not deceived Dea, who was blind. It was because Phoebe and Venus saw with their eyes, while Dea saw with her heart. He could not utter a word. He thought to himself, Vos in lingua, the troubled man has an ox on his tongue. In his complex emotions, humiliation was the first which dawned on him. Ursus, driven out of his last resource, pondered. I lavish my onomatopies in vain. Then, like every dreamer, he reviled himself. What a frightful failure! I wore myself out in a pure loss of imitative harmony. But what is to be done next? He looked at Dea. She was silent, and grew paler every moment, as she stood perfectly motionless. Her sightless eyes remained fixed in depths of thought. Fortunately, something happened. Ursus saw Master Nicholas in the yard with a candle in his hand beckoning to him. Master Nicholas had not assisted at the end of the phantom comedy played by Ursus. Someone had happened to knock at the door of the inn. Master Nicholas had gone to open it. There had been two knocks, and twice Master Nicholas had disappeared. 
Ursus, absorbed by his hundred-voiced monologue, had not observed his absence. On the mute call of Master Nicholas, Ursus descended. He approached the tavern-keeper. Ursus put his finger on his lips. Master Nicholas put his finger on his lips. The two looked at each other thus. Each seemed to say to the other, We will talk, but we will hold our tongues. The tavern-keeper silently opened the door of the lower room of the tavern. Master Nicholas entered. Ursus entered. There was no one there except these two. On the side looking on the street both doors and window-shutters were closed. The tavern-keeper pushed the door behind him and shut it in the face of the inquisitive Govicum. Master Nicholas placed the candle on the table. A low whispering dialogue began. Master Ursus, Master Nicholas, I understand at last. Nonsense. You wish the poor blonde girl to think that all going on as usual. There's no law against my being a ventriloquist. You are a clever fellow. No. It is wonderful how you manage all that you wish to do. I tell you it is not. Now, I have something to tell you. Is it about politics? I don't know, because in that case I could not listen to you. Look here, whilst you were playing actors and audience by yourself, someone knocked at the door of the tavern. Someone knocked at the door? Yes. I don't like that. Nor I either. And then? And then I opened it. Who was it that knocked? Someone who spoke to me. What did he say? I listened to him. What did you answer? Nothing. I came back to see you play. And? Someone knocked a second time. Who, the same person? No, another. Someone else to speak to you? Someone who said nothing. I like that better. I do not. Explain yourself, Master Nicholas. Guess who called the first time? I have no leisure to be an Oedipus. It was the proprietor of the circus. Over the way? Over the way. Whence comes all that fearful noise? Well? Well, Master Ursus, he makes you a proposal. A proposal? A proposal. Why? Because... You have an advantage over me, Master Nicholas. Just now you solved my enigma, and now I cannot understand yours. The proprietor of the circus commissioned me to tell you that he had seen the cortege of police pass this morning, and that he, the proprietor of the circus, wishing to prove that he is your friend, offers to buy of you for fifty pounds, ready money, your caravan, the green box, your two horses, your trumpets with the women who blow them, your play with the blind girl who sings in it, your wolf, and yourself. Ursus smiled a haughty smile. Innkeeper, tell the proprietor of the circus that Gwynplaine is coming back. The innkeeper took something from a chair in the darkness, and turning towards Ursus with both arms raised, dangled from one hand a cloak, and from the other a leather esclavine, a felt hat, and a jacket. And Master Nicholas said, The man who knocked a second time was connected with the police. He came in and left without saying a word, and brought these things. Ursus recognized the esclavine, the jacket, the hat, and the cloak of Gwynplaine. End of section 83 Recording by John Trevithick.